let's get going, huh? Let us get going. Too bad they don't have actual music on here. The ring is uh waiting. Them clouds, though. I can't believe they didn't add any, like, music to this waiting screen. Hello, hello. It's so stupid that they didn't add any any music to this this waiting screen. I would add my own music, but uh, a little bit Monka DMCA, if you know what I mean. Yeah, they they have no they have no music for this waiting screen. Some of this stuff is really quiet. Why would he want us to retrieve something from Crusader space? Not uh, farmers and there should be because I'm seeing. Could have been a Hold, on. Hold on, let me check this real quick. Yeah, there is audio. Hello, hello. No. Yeah, the music is, uh, this part, this countdown has no, no music or whatever. But the other videos that they show are, some of them are really quiet and I, like the one earlier before this was really damn loud. So I had to put the, the audio down. I had to put the audio down because it was really goddamn loud. There we go. Just hurt myself. <laughs> I'm a Mr. Streamer. Mr. Streamer, you're muted. What is this? Fucking Summit 1G's chat? And then the random viewer has has his own Twitch muted? Check DMs. Give it Roger Dodger. Give me a sec. Only two second delay. Let's go. Easy, bro. Saber Ravens, okay.
Man, that character's beat the hell up. See, this is quite loud again compared to me. Watching your stream with chat and SC chat. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just put it on. I just put it on full screen. I kind of like the thing is, I wanted to leave chat open, but then this is not full screen, and uh, <laughs> who knows what the fuck they're gonna post in that in that chat? Wouldn't be the first time that they uh, you know had a big fuck off penis. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Like at at first, I did actually want to leave the chat up so I can see what chat is saying or how chat is responding to certain stuff, right? But I was like, people are gonna post like ASCII penises and you know it, like ASCII penises and tits and all that. Got no interest in showing that on stream. Hundred percent gonna happen. I'm honestly just surprised that this stuff doesn't have music. This is uh, intermission. Kind of expected them to have, you know, some sort of music going. But it does not. But yeah, anytime you uh, send something in DMs, uh, let me know prior. <laughs> Insert TOS here. <laughs> Yeah, but, but yeah, anytime you send something in DMs, let me know, because, well, I don't have Discord open all the time. I don't know, man. It's like some community-made stuff. Community-made animation. Interesting. Yes, he did. I'm not surprised, man. Anytime they have like something really cool reaction, just just let me know, man. I don't want to keep chat up uh, myself. I'm not, I'm not surprised that Twitch chat is uh, spamming that. I mean, it is cool that they feature all kinds of anime or like all kinds of community made stuff. But that's that's pretty cool. I like that. Should have made a, uh, what you call it? Should have made a, um, an organization trailer for this. Unbanned request? Who the hell? There's an unbanned request. It's from Commander Root. Isn't that the account that... Yeah, isn't that the account that, um... Um... That does all the Twitch stats thing? Got to stream on Andy F1 quality so I have to rewatch it? Dude. Fucking Verstappen, dude. Did another 360 in the same fucking corner like last year. I was going to have to drag CR off stage for talking for too long. Man, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, honestly, the best person to drag CR, like Chris Roberts, off, off stage for talking too long, that'd be Tony Z, right? Honestly. Yeah, Commander Root just put a unbanned request in my channel. Yeah, let me let me see what his request was. Commander Root put a put an unban request in. Hello, moderators of the channel, Robin Blitz. It's probably an automated message though that's sent to everyone. Hello, moderators of the channel, Robin Blitz. I'm mainly lurking with this account, which makes me believe that a chat ban isn't necessary. I would appreciate if you could unban me. Best regards, Commander Root. 
You know what? You know what? Welcome back, Bucko. I don't know if you said anything during that time when I was doing the unbanned stuff because Twitch uh, chat is gone then. Like your ma last message was at, at Twitch partner building software to make things work. I don't know if you said anything after that or not. Because I lost Twitch chat for that. Nonsense, okay good. Just making sure that I'm not missing out on any messages because I had to, had to reload Twitch chat. Like when I, uh, you know like... Uh, stream elements obs right that has like the chat on the right side of it if you click a to be a citizen. <laughs> if, if you click on uh like an unbanned request Forget about that it it, it removes the twitch chat and goes to the moderator window for some reason rampart shield jenny for only 25 triple nine you'll feel so safe you could go for a family vacation in the pyro system and who needs Imagine. jump points when you can get these Wave Tech XL1 Quantum Drives for only 49 triple nine. Yeah, go on a vacation to Pyro Depot. if you could get there. <laughs> these deals are so good. The Nine Tails will stop blockading stations and start some honest trading. <laughs> Sick of OBS, so really? Over to your nearest Dumpers Depot. I don't really mind it. It's too late. Before it's too late and it's cut out. <laughs> Really? I didn't. Re I don't really have much issues with it. Like I can find my way around. No, like do anything I need to do. You just explained an issue right there. Well, but but that's not OBS itself though. That is um, the chat integration. Because I, hold on, let me check. If I were to do this in normal Twitch chat, right? So I open my browser, go to settings, and then unban request. Yeah, see, it would, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't open a new window. It would, um, like send a new. Uh, it, it would just load a new page over the old one. Yeah. Although Stream Elements is way better than Streamlabs, though, so. This is Starship Gemini on a humanitarian mission. We've been engaged by Ninetales pirates. Assistance is needed. Red alert. Battle stations. Red alert, warriors. Power down, and we'll let you be with your lives. Give us what we want, and we'll leave you alone. Captain, we have support inbound. Hello, <laughs> Gemini. Looks like you could use a little help. We'll handle these pirates. Scum. I mean, this cinematic is pretty cool, though. Both IMR are fairly mediocre softwares. I'm surprised no one has made something that's functional, also nice to look at without the need for forks and plugins. It might exist, who knows? I just didn't really look further into it. Kind of makes me wonder how far uh, XSplit has come. I I actually have a lifelong I think I have a lifelong license for XSplit, but I haven't used it since 2014 maybe. Because XSplit was so so heavy on the machine to run, whereas OBS was really lightweight. Yeah, XSplit was great, but it was so heavy to run on on your machine. Whereas OBS is very lightweight, really, really nice. Let me turn off this chat real quick. Bam. All right, well, let's get going then, huh? Hello, everyone. So welcome uh, to Digital Citizen Con 2951. Uh, so it's really, really good to be back in front of the camera and talking to all of you out there. Uh, I wish it was in person. As you know, we have been doing Citizen Cons uh, for a long time and last year was the last year we didn't do it because of the pandemic uh, and we didn't want to go another year without having a citizen con but we felt like this year it was a bit too close to get back 
to do it in person with all the issues with travel and we're doing it virtually and digital this year. Uh, and I'm hoping next year we'll get to do it in person. So it's been very challenging for all of us. There's about 720 of us have all been working from home. I don't think they can actually uh, drag them off stage because I think it's all pre-recorded. That cloud, which is a lot more of you have had more time to play Star Citizen and give us feedback and get engaged. I mean, we compared to where we were in the last time we had a physical Citizen Con in 2019, the number of daily players that we have in Star Citizen is on average two to three times more than we had back in 2019, which is fantastic. 2020 was a big year of expansion for us. 21 is also being incredibly great. And we're hoping with some of the features that we're working on, like server meshing, we're working on a bunch of optimizations <laughs> <laughs> my third and maturing you know, some of the gameplay loops. True. We're starting to see happen. True. I mean, we've got some stuff coming up, like Death of a Stace Man. Uh, Stace Man. The first part of it, the medical gameplay is going to be there and also the beginning of physical inventory with the personal inventory. It's not fully finished yet. Those are two major game changes that are coming very shortly. In fact, they're coming with 3.15, and there's a lot of other things that are uh, just beyond that. We're gonna continue that momentum, and uh, you know, more and more people will be discovering Star Citizen, and more and more you will be spending more hours playing it and having fun, giving us great feedback, and we're inevitably inching towards the, the finish line of having something that we can say, yep, this is the definitive experience for you guys. And uh, so I'm really excited by that. Uh, but let's get back to today. And today it was actually is quite funny because one of the Evocati issues really great for 315 you. was actually First responding. Is going to be led off by Todd Pappy with Ian Leland and David Haddock. And I don't want to spoil hey, it. Hey, hello, really hello. Great stuff. It's going to use a combination of some features that are coming very soon and some features and content that is a little further down the road uh, but it's going to give you a taste of life yeah man i haven't been live in i've been doing youtube videos. a lot instead so of live streaming let me pass it to them but because it's citizen con i was like you know what because uh, it was uh, citizen con i was like you know what i'm gonna stream this give my live opinion on all the stuff and all that it's gonna be a, a long time though to stream this like seven hours Actually, have to move my webcam for this. Because some text falls off. Let me do this. And then. There. Might actually be better. I cannot move the other stuff, like, subs and all that. Because <laughs> that is in my browser. Oh, let's go, bro. Starting off with a gym point straight away, huh? Drake ships in Pyro? Imagine. Nah, Kyle, I have that stuff set up in the Stream Elements Overlay website. I would have to change my overlay on Stream Elements website to move that stuff. Pyro. Starting off with Pyro, huh? Straight away. Hi, I'm Todd Pappy, Star Citizen Live Game Director. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm the art director for Star Citizen. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm the narrative director at Star Citizen. So finally, we're saying goodbye to Stanton. It's quite, quite precious to us. We've been talking about it. We've been looking at it. We've been living there 
for quite a long time. Now it's time to, you know, move the conversation on, start to look at something new. Mm -hmm. Now it's changed slightly the jump point side from what we saw no um, a little while ago. One of the things that was quite important for Chris is he wanted that feeling of um, something that was quite wondrous, something that was quite amazing. You know, it's not dark, it's not mysterious, it's not hostile, but it's more, like I said, wondrous. So when we started looking at Pyro, and we had to start looking at how the jump points work when we're traveling from yeah, Stanton just, to Pyro, or I'll just hide it for now. And thinking about border security and with the infrastructure that's needed there. What's the Lord? I'll just hide it for now instead. On one side, it's it's very lawless versus the other side is is dealing with the UEE. So we needed to go through and really think about how this was working. And then also with the jump points, how smugglers would work in, with the secondary and tertiary routes that would lead into. Man, those jump, jump points point are going to be such fucking jump points, yeah, we man. Call it Internally, we kind of call Such it a switch team approach mm -hmm. of the, you know, the sort of Gonna the be nuts. entrance that you would go through on Stanton, which would be the sort of guarded, have the infrastructure that you had mentioned, uh, the security and stuff like that, but the possibility that there would be alternate ways to kind of get in yeah. to bypass that, so which would be, you know, beneficial knowledge for smugglers uh, or criminals who are trying to, you know, get in under the radar. Yeah. Well, so it was you know, a huge if, problem. If there's a lot of infrastructure around it. Or a business opportunity, if you know what that I mean. Infrastructure was responsible for the jump point. In reality, it's, it's a naturally. Or a business thing. opportunity for us, if you know what I mean. It's an interesting balance of like make it seem like this is a, a checkpoint, but at the same time, it's something that the the ships are creating, not the structures. So before we go too much further into the power system, uh, let's take a deep dive into the op process with Jake Dunlop, and he's going to be taking us through the authoring process for the Stanton and Pyro jump points. Bringing jump points to the verse that looks fucking cool though, honestly. Journey, as we've been designing a new element in our game, we've put a lot of time into creating two solid examples of different types of jump points you'll eventually see all around the verse. One in Stanton and one in Pyro. We've been continuing to use Houdini as the tool to create these gas clouds. The setup we have for them Man, that looks really damn nice, honestly. The parent is mainly used as an establishing shot when you arrive in your ship from quantum travel, while the child is used as the main gameplay environment and is placed inside the parent. The child also has a reasonable scale, which keeps your average ship's speed in mind. These things aren't nearly the size of real nebula, if you're curious. But by no means are the jump points small. Here's an example of a pirate jump point next to Microtech. Oh, uh, to explain uh, the process a bit no more, way, bro. Uh, we That's create a parent huge. at a large scale, then cut out a small box in the center of it. Inside the small box, we'll gather the volume data from the parent, up-res that, and then add details. The details will be different depending on what type of gas cloud you want, and if you want to easily fly through it or not. We usually spend time investigating different designs for the gas clouds, but with the Stanton jump point, the work had already been started and used in the 2019 CitizenCon demo. We just had to go through, clean up the Houdini file and get it game ready with a couple of extra tweaks along the way. If it's too quiet Some or anything, let me know. we made to the parent were making it feel like more of a structurally sound rotating disc. This was to make it feel like a safe and well-used jump point. The child gas cloud here was changed more dramatically uh, it used to have a bunch of dark clouds around it. We felt that it was feeling a little bit too closed in. Man, that so looks so awesome from a distance. So we spent time morphing the magnetic lines in the center to create a really interesting horizontal, flowing, relaxing composition to visually show you that Stanton itself is generally a safe place at first glance. The parent gas cloud for Pyro was created with the same process as the Stanton parent. But we changed the shape of the cloud into something more menacing and violent. We wanted the reveal of Pyro to be a clear warning of what you should be expecting throughout the entire system. So we made it very closed in, uh, dense and very active. We did make it a small it challenge should. to traverse it the should. child. Something that won't take too long, but should be something. I don't think it's already in though, through. but it should. Something that helped really quickly create a fun traversal route was creating a white box play area in engine, out of solid geometry, and flying around it right away. 
<laughs> yeah, this is white box, all right. <laughs> this is white box, all right. After we were happy with the route, we exported the geometry to use in Houdini, where we converted it to a volume and yeah, that is actually how low setting should look like parent, instead of still the same fucking graphics. Hey man, at we least you get over sure 60 then. Systems feel very different from each other. Some ways in which we did this was by the shape of the jump points. As I had mentioned before, Stanton feels very clean, put together, and generally safe with the disc like form that it has. But Pyro feels like it's more violent, distressed, and this shows in its form. The comparison is shown well in both of the child clouds. In the Stanton child cloud, we have nice long strands of the magnetic waves that encapsulate the jump point that feel harmonious, beautiful, and free. Whereas in the pyro cloud, it shows almost the opposite. The walls feel like they're closing in on you, moving in unpredictable ways, completely unstable. Your ship could enter into a wall and disappear within a second. Lighting also plays a big role in how we feel about these spaces. You can see these are dramatically Man. different areas in the, the moon. The stations look really tone, cool, though. Lighting is the key to that. So that's a brief look at jump points. They've evolved quite a bit since last time you saw them. Enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, I would hope they changed a bit since uh, so 2019. One of the that players will first probably come across when they come into the pyro system is the space station. You know, it was discovered a long time ago. It was sort of deemed uninhabitable because it was just too dangerous with that, that variable flare star going on. Uh, so they kind of utilize the system for resources and then when they kind of tapped out they just sort of left and that's when all the sort of squatters came in so there's sort of older infrastructure built to sustain kind of the mining activities and the gas harvesting and stuff like so that it's basically but like another grim x basically left and then other populations start to slowly move in so sort of like a new grim x survivors and whatever and, and start to kind of take over what was left behind which gives us some unique gameplay comparatively um to Stanton and the the space stations there. So looks Pyro, cool though. It like they're in such big disrepair. part just broken. Some of them off. are inhabited. Some of them are what the abandoned. hell? And then so the players can go and explore. Are those they can fuel tanks? What, what's happened there? Um, whether it's been hit by an asteroid um, or if it's uh, there was some sort of fuel tanks there before. But you'll be able to go and explore the different decks um, and be able to. Uh, go in, meet new people, meet the frontier lifestyle, enjoy it. Okay, so before we go to the inside of the stations, we're going to jump now to Eric, and he's going to go in a bit more detail, the concept development process taken when looking at the exteriors. Hi, I'm Eric Gagnon, principal concept artist on Star Citizen. The goal of that initial step of sketch development is to create something not invited. Dangerous, damaged by asteroids and surrounded by floating debris. Hiding place for Atla looks old, decrypted. Lawless, I'm gonna get out of this course no for a bit. security force here. Approach at your own risk. Industrial look, messy, but not abandoned. Some parts are wrecked, but under repair and relocated. I like to use the black and white sketches to start. It's, it allows us to go very quickly and focus on the shape only. Fuck we yous. try to play <laughs> with a touch yous. of color <laughs> to define more of the commercial port platform. We try different schemes to remind us of the whole look we are That one looks cool. And brown tones. Adding a touch of light and some <laughs> around fuck the sketch. Yous. <laughs> allows to see the scale of thing and properly view this silhouette. I'm not surprised, man. We expand on the ID to play with the mechanism and functionality. This is the color sketches. I'm just glad it looks different than all the other stations. And the different angles. It In should sketch, look different than all the other stations. You can clearly feel the arrival of the asteroids and the dismantling or destruction. destruction <laughs> We also oh, yeah. need some He's French, all right. to properly showcase the size and scale of it. With all those elements in place, we can now build a nice plate of the entire concept for the asteroids, harpoon with all the piece together. 
The Shantytown module habitation is a nice idea to have a kind of small city on the outskirts of the space station. So here I sketched those shapes to create something very modular. From the grayscale, it's pretty easy to do a color pass. I played with a color palette that reflects the vibe of Shantytown. In this sketch, here we can easily this is where, the, where all the fucking belters the are gonna be. Area is going to be. The station. Another angle shot here is pretty nice too. Playing with warm and cold color contrast is interesting. All those different angles help define and expose the different elements of the concept to properly illustrate it. Now we have. This is gonna a be your second home, right? Yeah, Benta Loeda. Gonna be a second home. We this. apply the same process here for the commercial port platform. The black and white sketches. You're gonna spend a lot of time across uh, this station, Grim Hex, and of course Clash here. Sketches for the front of the port platform structure. A quick side view plan here is necessary. Nah, I think you'll be well around in Grim Hex a lot more than we this station. Foreign, Grim Hex, this station, and Clash here. What we want to achieve. And of course, we create a color sketch to see what it could be. We see the industrial look and some potential details to better define and deep dive into. For those, we have a deeper design exploration of this industrial area. Pipes, tanks, angular shapes, and a color touch. Combining 2D I'm just and so happy that it looks really different from all the other stations, honestly. I'm it's so a glad. technique now, but it's really efficient to highlight areas of the concept. Using 3D is also very useful for level designers to validate the size and shape of things when yeah. creating the environment. Bounty hunters wouldn't be on there. Let's talk like about like they are now. the big repair machinery ID. You'd want to bring a big this ship machine could be to get someone to repair surfaces instead of just a gladius. by asteroids. Inspired from the AV machinery that we see in mining. Nice to see the overall add-on IDs brought together on a single board. It gives a great look and makes you want to see the asteroid next hunter system. harpoon. Are you kidding me, the bro? Looks. We also create a mood board from our different shots. This shows how lighting is used to set the tone of the environment by giving different options and color palettes. Finally, we provide some options for paint of the exterior surfaces. We work from a list of brands and faction that we need to incorporate to the design. We started from the narrative things, work to build the visual identity of the different brands, exploring different ways to represent them and the environment. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was also thinking about. Like, you're gonna bring in an asteroid, but you have no job. way to to stop its this really its momentum alive and set in the unless you attach some boosters onto it. Actually, the harpoon could maybe the have boosters on it. Are a simple of the like, say, you have a harpoon, and, we hope and then like on the side extent, you have like two two boosters. Excite you as much as we had fun to create two it. boosters to reduce its momentum. You. Thank you, Eric. That could be a possibility. Looks great. That's the exterior. So right now we're going to go from the outside and we're going to uh, jump to the interior. Before we really started exploring anything, one of the core concepts um, that we was discussing as a group was the idea of power and the idea of that. heat. Now we've got like this big interior layout of this, maybe this old mining station how how would they have adapted the space you know they would have right okay we need power here okay that will create heat so we started thinking about okay where would the heat lamps be and then be, where would light come from so chon, chon. The, the principal concept of power wait did it say fresh creating kebabs heat creating light <laughs> that was pretty much the i thought it said fresh kebab of the start of the visual development process so when we started talking about it from a design side we needed to make sure that we were covering certain shops uh, just basic needs for the player. Everything's bare bones. Um, it could be that <laughs> it used to be a clothing store. No candy, just alcohol. A food shop, and and so 
they converted it, the gangs moved in, you know, it's it's very, it's not what it used to be. Rust and, so, buckets, but you beer, see that old skeleton or rust is whiskey apparently. One of the things that definitely we've been talking about with Pyro that we didn't really get to see in Stanton uh, is the idea of the sort of the gang presence. So yeah, there's uh, going to be a lot you know, of that, gangs that here. That they're the sort of local law uh, in the area. So, you know, you might see gang members coming and shaking down some of these shopkeepers for, for protection money or, or rent, you know, type type thing. Uh, or, or even shaking down the player. Yeah, it, yeah, which would be very fun. <laughs> shaking <laughs> down the player as law enforcement. So yeah, when okay. we started to explore some of the side areas, there were other things, other factors that we had to cover. That's some nice big um, bandage you got there. Clinics. Yeah, you want to see my other big bandage? A place to sleep, to log out, as well as players need a way to get themselves healed. And then we started taking the same treatment or similar treatment that we were doing with the, the main market area and started to take it into the Habs and how they were possibly repurposed or the clinics and how those were possibly repurposed. So, and just make sure that everything felt cohesive in its <laughs> no gang got mistaken. My torpedo burrito. In the way that we have the Hell station no. structured, um, we haven't let players go into like living quarters of where no um, the people that lived at the station would be, or even into the lower decks where um, where the power, where the gravity generators are. Mm. And this is where we're going to start introducing these areas, and it opens up new opportunities for the players to go explore and, and do new things. But it's also areas that the gang might want to protect. Yeah, it offers a lot of possibilities for, for mission content, you know, whether it's actually maybe working for the gang itself or other kind of little small things you could do inside there to really kind of yeah, drive you deep into the bowels of this thing. Okay, so that's a little look at the insides of the stations, but now we'll jump to Christian, and Christian's going to take us on a little bit of a deeper dive into the concept development process of the inside of the stations. Yeah, I wonder, do they already have like a 3D model and all that? Like, how far is this Hi, station into Christian development? Uh, I'm a senior concept artist uh, on the environment team, and uh, we're going to look at the concept development for the space station a little bit. So first off, we looked at the heat map. So there is a lot of um, what I said, the electricity is gone, the, the heating is gone, and the visible air, the oxygen is gone. So um, there is pretty much all of those connected areas, they are, um, they are lifeless in, in a way, right? So you wouldn't settle down somewhere in between those, uh, um, in between those empty corridors. We were trying to uh, sort our thoughts and get them on paper, right? Yeah. So we were exploring different ideas. Or, they, we, or, or they're going to show it later on. But uh, so we were thinking about pathways um, that the player and the NPC could take. So what would happen, we were thinking about what would happen if all of a sudden one pathway is blocked off or um, another one and so far yeah it's only up, concept right? art so, so i don't know how far they about are verticality into development. and um, how the players and the npcs can traverse all of those um, interesting areas that are in the end pretty uh, ominous right so think about there are some people just screwing off side panels on the wall or they are uh, screw, uh, uh, screwing off um, ceiling panels and you would see all of the imagine if freeform cutting is a thing it, so, so we'd see and there's no like armistice in all this you can just grab out your cutter and just hanging. slice up so, a little bit um, of a fence and just go through the, the fence into a different area of the station that'd be sick uh, see what those eventually could evolve into and um, we also started then slowly with some uh, loose uh, uh, 3d sketches so getting everything into 3d and it's pretty much evolved over time where we could talk to the environment guys and we were asking for some of the current rest stops uh, a geo and some of the textures and uh, then getting then uh, um, oh, they got something we were just changing up all of the props all of the side panels or all of the the whole uh, um, the environment so they got the white box face looking back at the references then convey this feeling we could introduce more dirt we could introduce uh, some damaged Yo, panels, up, side panels and pretty much explore this uh, side area right so they and got the white box phase of the station. The, the big advantage of this is that we can yeah, make the, the environment how we like. So one thing that we did is like kill all the lights uh, because we don't need lighting. We want to we wanna create our own lighting. And this is what, what I said earlier. But that was more uh, than white box. Are super bright. They are, That's they're textured, they're textured and all but that too. We want to make it ominous. We want to make it dark mood. We want to make it super dark with the players like always is feeling this in game? kind of in danger. And especially this is concept art. Mind, right? The other one I think was in game. So 
This will allow us to this is about the pyro, the, uh, the pyro station, or uh, one of the, the um, earlier uh, 3D explorations, like the big, which the big station in pyro. One of the final, uh, concept They've already shown the, off the gas clouds and the jump, jump. Uh, so when we were at the point, uh, where we were kind of the jump um, point into pyro. Okay, or where we thought like, okay, this is this is an environment uh, that we want to see. Then we took care about the last 20 percent. So the last 20 percent. In this case, means yeah. having a final. Yeah. His main keynote is also the big. Uh, uh, so we were just the biggest um, painting over in Photoshop and doing some uh, um, some more refined uh, so refinements for quick. the mood the... and the lighting. We were painting in some uh, some of the decaling and some of the. Yeah, this is life in the first, the main keynote. To do all these things in uh, 2D than in 3D. This takes until uh, so quarter past to, um, six our just time. Refine the, the final concept in, in so like uh, forty-five more minutes. And. This this wasn't a, a straight straight process from A to B. It was um, oh, an iterating so process. So and in between, if you look at some of the other concepts, um, for example, the barriers. We were at one point thinking about what would happen if we introduce barriers that the gang members then would set up on one point. So what does that mean for you as a player? Um, gotcha, gotcha. What is the player doing, or what is the player doing at this point? So will he? encounter these uh, um, these gang members will he try to find a way around is he going to use some of the ladders or the um, the underground vents for example so we were changing the concepts here and there um, more or less and this leads to in the end having a nice vari variety of concepts or Damn, uh, different types what a of difference concepts that we then could cherry pick the best parts of it or the in other teams oh, the, environment team, the design team could cherry pick the best ideas from, from those concepts. And Jesus, that looks pretty much sick, a rundown dude. of uh, um, the concept development for the Pyro Space Station's God damn, interior. That looks awesome. Thanks, Christiana. That looked appropriately scummy. So we've been talking a lot about the insides of the stations. We've been looking at a lot of the concept art. Uh, but now we can jump to Josh. And Josh is going to talk about uh, one of my favorite parts of the process. And it's when we take some concepts and we, we start to do some ideation, some uh, visual development in the engine. Hi, my name is Josh Van Zorn. I'm the principal environment artist here at Cloud Imperium Games. Today, we're going to be going through the Pyro Space Station's um, visual target and pre-production sort of things that we're going to be doing for these rundown slash outlaw space stations. So, what I have here right in front of me now is obviously the the food court from our Stanton space stations. We've just dragged the wear up on all of them, so now we're getting all of this wow. really nice grime on all of these. Surfaces, this is right? this is three D. So if I turn off this my working lights, which hopefully are gonna, yeah, this is in engine you know, too. Produce that mood that we're after. So I'll turn on that right now. So a number of things have happened right in front of us, right? You can instantly see where we've got lots of heavy Damn. fog coming in. Don't pay too much attention to the particles now. I'll go into them a little bit later. We've got some light panels up here shooting through the rafters. And Dude, this looks sick, well, man. Right? So we're going to do an, a, a, a quick little thing here. It's adding in some cables, right? And now this is really important. <laughs> Space, Not right? only to achieve the art direction, but it gives us a really nice level of parallax within the scene, right? We have a couple of design Man, that looks so within cool. this space as well. One of those being we have a, a gang and then a general civilian population, right? Now, one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of that design in this particular space was separate it out in like a kind of class type system, right? So we're going to start to explore some of the requirements of that. One of that is that a mounted that machine gun like in I the top left? Before, you can't get up here unless you're in favor with the gang. So we need to put in the instruments an actual that are going proper to check help point portray that. And with a machine a gun right on the left so and just a side note all of this stuff is yeah, like a machine gun or a progress, and nothing is final so don't read too much into it so that's crazy dude from here we're missing a few bits and pieces right but one of the ways that we're going to solve that is with graffiti all right so i'm going to turn on those decals now you can start to see that okay. the walls here are starting to disappear a little bit it's a very subtle effect in this particular area, but you'll start to see how much more it comes through in others, right? Damn, so moving bro. on from here, we need to start putting the stuff in the environment. So bear with me for a sec when I turn this on. All right, so this is the marketplace. We've got though, here is a lot of stalls, right? We really want to get that cramp vibe in, like that was kind of similar in the concept, and um, start seeing how far we can push the limitations. You know what this what reminds me of? The engine, but also what this we can do. This reminds me of the marketplace in the aircraft well, carrier right? on One Fallout of the 3. That was immediately apparent to us is that AI is really tricky to deal with when in 
tight and enclosed if you've played Fallout 3 so that we is. need to look at areas like this here and this here to make sure that it's wide enough that a few AI can pass each other or a player and not Damn. you know look completely gross right now I mentioned lighting before so I'm gonna turn off the uh, working lights that we've got so far yeah I bet and you'll start to see what I mean so we've got Damn, that mood lighting at the moment the entire God thing damn. is being lit by the stalls itself is it really that bad now this has already come a long way and the stalls themselves have had a bit of a lighting pass so um there's this is already starting to look quite nice but we're not getting you know that 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 thickness that we were getting up up on the top level right we're not getting that yeah i'm not, su not surprised life mate. to a certain extent this is and exactly why i turned off chat here where, where they just fall completely into darkness which is which is not fun so obviously like i said before we'd be doing lighting as we go through this process but just to see how much of an impact that's exactly why i turned it off on an environment like this we'll just turn it on for you so you start to instantly see we've now got a lot more thickness within the environment and if i just double check just to make sure that our lights are <laughs> generating properly, rtx on, on a 1080 right so we're getting a lot more volume it's got that rtx feature now. we're getting all of these heaters coming in now the heat shimmering off them we've got these little portable ones lighting up the place we've got some ones that are hanging from the roof ones that are over in the corners and stuff like this right so we're starting to get a lot more mood in this this is starting to feel really nice now now what i was mentioning in terms of the rain right so yes we're talking about the rain now why is there rain inside right so this is generally a really cold station. And when people are, are in this area that's in the center, because Humidity. there's so much stuff happening here, it's starting to get warmer, right? You've got the heaters here. You've got the gang that is kind of maintaining a lot of this stuff and, and producing a lot of the heat themselves. Uh, everyone, this is prime real estate for where everyone wants to be, right? Prime real estate, So cool. what happens when you have this many people cooking food in this one small area, you know, breathing hot air, that sort of thing, it all starts to rise in this this environment and it starts to get that, that massive cavern, right? I know, right? Got up here, all the way up to the roof there. As it goes up, it starts to cool down, right? And we start to get precipitation inside where it starts to rain. And even in, in many instances, we start to get a little bit of ice coming through as well. So that means once it's all fallen down here, it's actually quite wet and damp. Uh, for It's still cold and a little bit warm around heaters, but it's generally quite damp because of that weird kind of event. Now, the rain as it currently sits is just a placeholder asset that we're borrowing from Squadron, and that will have to obviously be remade to suit the amount of rain that we want to have within this environment, which won't be, you know, crazy, <laughs> but... Um, it I wonder if this is already like one big station or if it's just a right. single so scene in their engine. That is pretty much Pyro Stations. Um, I hope you really enjoyed like seeing the breakdown that we've done here today, um, seeing, uh, learning a little bit about the process of going in and doing a visual target and, um, you know, just a little bit more of that earlier process and problem solving that we go through. So yeah, I hope you really enjoyed the rest of CitizenCon here today and uh, I'll catch you later. Cool, thanks Josh. That was looking really good. All right, Mike. All right, so as we Catch continue our process of exploring uh, the Pyro system, uh, now I think it'd be good to look a little bit at the planets and moons that uh, populate the system. Now, uh, one of the things we thought it'd be interesting to talk about is how do we design a system from the ground up? As with all of this, we always uh, start from narrative, you know, before we put any pen to paper or we have any discussions about player experience. Um, we always start from, you know, the world that, you know, Dave and, and others have, have kind of built. Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, it's also the thing of, you know, the pyro, I think, was first initially conceived very early on in the process. But once we finally are tackling it from a, a realistic, practical, how we're going to build this, what is what is each planet going to look like, uh, you know, it's important, you know, to to ask more questions about to flesh it out more because we kept it intentionally kind of vague because we want the art team to you guys to do what you do and the designers to do what they do so when we started that exploration process we knew we had like a, a ballpark that we needed to stay in uh so we we literally thought okay how do we how do we design a system and fundamentally it it kind of comes into maybe three key areas so um 
because we're a space game, the establishing shot of that planet Pyro is one. very, very important because it it uh, it describes everything Pyro from okay. you know continent breakup, fundamental palettes. Pyro four. So right from the get go, we we started to sketch in ideas of what the key establishing shots were going to be like. Damn, that one looks uh, and then awesome. And from there, then we jump into um, <laughs> key art. So that key one art cool. is basically on the surface what is what is the mood what's the tone that we're expecting to see and as you're saying like t t the first one we wanted to tackle was parawan because you know david described this this wonderful um picture and it was already clear in our minds of what, Damn, what it wanted bro. to look like so we hit that i really want to see and, when know, like we that. wanted something hostile we wanted something hazardous uh, also yeah, part of this process how did you say is, that? I don't um, remember there being, I remember there being like um, two tech moons? limitations, but we also knew what we two wanted moons to do and in one terms of our future tech, planet you know, or something. Um, future planet tech, weather, you know, so we kind of went crazy. Uh, oh, hey, it's basically her ideas as, as we was exploring. So we went through the various planets, did some key art, and again, put them up on the board. And just to validate, we are keeping within that, that palette but we're getting that diversity. We're getting that diversity of, of color. Damn, this you, one, this is like... Um, uh, value structure, silhouettes, composition. Fuck. The... Um, because even within something like Stanton, the Hideo Kojima game. There's variety, you know. The UPS uh, that simulator. That was important for me and the team where you, you want to feel like, like you're that, on a space where you can travel around, but now we're going to a completely other system. So Death we stranding. continued that ideation process Death stranding? There. Death stranding. So we had the establishing shots. We had some key art. And then um, from there is we create like uh, what we call like breakout packs. Huh. Uh, this is where when they, so, they said we've Pyro designed four. about, you know, what are the what are the interactables that the player maybe will come across? What are the mineables? What are the harvestables? And then from there we start to build out um, literal breakouts for or almost asset packs uh, that will go to the team. Now from there, like we did a, a first pass um, exploration. Um, and what we did is we put it all together on a single board for Chris to have almost like a commander's view of a new system. Um, you know, we showed it to yourself. Yeah, this is Pyro 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right 6. On, on one That's sheet, six pyro, you've like got the six planets shots, there. you've got the key, you've got the breakout. And, and for me, personally, pyro one I, through like six. I like to see that, like I said, a Maybe that lore view changed a bit? of an entire system. Maybe and Lord changed a bit from uh, when they first conceived it. Just and you know mold things into uh, what 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 play experience we want to put forward. So that was a snapshot of the visual exploration yeah, process we used I when think so. designing a system from the ground up. Now we can take a break from us talking and go to an art video, a sizzle video uh, created by the art team. And what this will show is uh, it will show a kaleidoscope of planets and moons from Pyro. And it will also showcase some of the, the latest and greatest uh, art techniques and processes and tools that they <laughs> I know, right? have. Yeah, I remember Pyro having like three, like three planets and like, or like three, yeah, three planets. And then like one big broken blown up star in the middle. Or like a blown up planet. Wait, is this in game? Or is this just an in-engine render? Would have loved it if they actually showed it. Looks in-game? Man, look at that cloud tech. Bro. This is crazy, dude. Drake ships in Pyro, imagine. Is that a gas giant? No way, that's a gas giant. Wait, did they update the star map like right now?
This is actually in game. These shots are actually in game and not in engine. You, you could see that from the clouds just now. So they literally just updated the star map, like right here, right now. <laughs> Should have done that before, before Citizen calling down. Awesome. I'm fully in love with Pyro and hopefully from seeing that video, hopefully you guys are too. So as a continuation now, we can jump to Sebastian and Sebastian will talk to you a little bit more about the cloud authoring process. Yeah, let me know what goes in there. Cloud tech. Then we can jump to Maximilian. Maximilian will talk a little bit about geology creation, how we create that type of biome. And then lastly, we can go to Oslem and Oslem will go into a lot more detail about how we take some of the concept art that we've been showing of the uh, botanicals and how we interpret that to in-game artwork. Planetary clouds. This looks so goddamn good. Hi, my name is Sebastian, and I'm a principal environment artist on the Planet Content Team. Sebastian Schroeder. I'll be talking a bit about the data that's defining the visuals of the volumetric clouds and how we create it. Crusader was our first astronomical object that made use of the volumetric cloud tech that's being built by Carson Wenzel and others. Looks so good, the volumetric clouds. While working on Crusader, we learned a lot on what kind of data gives us which results and what is better to do. Ah, gotcha. With the tech being new, we also needed all new workflows for it. We are currently building more tools for producing the data, so we expect to get better, more complex results in less time in the future. We are evaluating everything from a very manual process that involves painting every pixel to a fully procedural one with little to no artist input, and we will probably end up somewhere between the two. <laughs> that artifact thing this is still so bad. What you are about to see is very likely subject to change. Due to the way the shader works, we can either throw random data at it and hope for happy accidents, or we can be very specific with the data and what kind of cloud formations come out of it in certain areas of the planet. For most use cases, there are two types of textures that need to be created. The first of which is Five the global moves? property map, which determines what, what, what type of cloud hell? is being used at any point on the planet's surface. It is also used for controlling the color placement of non-water-based clouds, but I'll get to that later. The other map is for defining the types of clouds and is named accordingly. The cloud type map allows us to control the cloud density and the impact of the two separately tiling 3D noises, which add detail and definition to what would otherwise be fairly low resolution shapes. The way the two textures interact is maybe best compared low to forming a base out of clay on a pottery wheel, and that's kind of what we're going to do now. <laughs> In this video, we are revolving half the silhouette of a vase around a circular pattern, which gives us a vase-like shape and 3D space. The big difference to a pottery wheel though is that we can not only feed the data in the shape of a circle, but ultimately whatever shape we want. What the With hell? the density channel, we can control how thick the clouds appear. White pixels represent very dense clouds, <laughs> Look at that pixels wall, bro. produce no clouds at all, and then we also have everything in between. There's always a tiny bit of Six impact from the panning noises, which no you can wonder see to have an effect Pyro takes so long to features. develop, dude. The shaping like noise twice and the big texture are the most impactful in terms of turning a nicely shaded volume into something we can clearly identify as clouds. How much it gets to affect the shape of the clouds depends on the brightness in the corresponding channel of the cloud type map. By combining density and shaping noise, we can model everything from dense clouds to soft, Man. more ethereal shapes and everything in between. This tech is really damn good. The last good. of the cloud type map channels controls the erosion noise. Really damn good. It is lower resolution than the shaping noise, since its main purpose is to add an extra layer of small detail. We usually just add it everywhere, unless we specifically want soft clouds with less definition. Black values add details in the way the tiny noise is no offered, noise. Gotcha. while white values invert the noise, and medium gray values mean that the noise has no impact. Maybe you can already get a feeling for, how for the complexity of the system and how every pixel in every channel can have a dramatic effect on the end result. Another That's thing crazy. we can change are the tiling 3D noises themselves. By default, a cauliflower-like noise is used for the shaping to model those fluffy sheep-like cumulus clouds. But by changing it to a different 3D noise, we can produce some more abstract cloud shapes that wouldn't normally occur on Earth. This is an area, in combination with different global data, we keep investigating to produce so more it was. cloud formations. So nothing changed with Pyro then, huh? We've been advancing this approach with Pyro 5, another gas giant, 
which brings me to the other use of the global property map. Damn, this it looks has a cool. Channel, which, in combination with a color gradient, is used to control the global Man, I really remember that being like three planets from Pyro. Incorrect. And not six. Of the gas giants. We sometimes have to restrain ourselves to Look not make brightly colored balls of cotton candy. That's crusading. There are a lot more settings that allow us to tweak everything from how the clouds are shaded and shadowed over the global impact and frequency of the detail noises to parameters that drastically change what results the textures I've shown you today produce. We'll have to bear with us as we'll figure out if there's the best combination of settings and Oxygen how those might change food. once all the features that are still planned eventually get added. Hey kids, what about some you've probably seen a fair amount of volumetric clouds as part of this year's CitizenCon and I quite likely to see a bunch more. This is actually pretty cool. Because of that, and since I'm still an artist at heart, I leave you with this bad drawing of a cat instead of more epic cloudscapes. Thank you for your time. I need to Hi, send this my to name you. is Max and send I'm this. a senior environment artist at CIG. I am part of the planet team where my focus is on planet and asset creation. I want to give you some insight into how we transform simple terrain shapes to a final biome. Plus a little preview of what you can expect in the future. When creating a new biome, we start by assigning ground textures to the terrain geometry. For this research and development desert biome, we chose a selection of different types of sand and soil. For additional depth, it does detail, export something, the to use displacement it, exp it exports crime. <laughs> the next step is adding our first layer of ground cover assets. In our game, ground cover is any low cost asset up to knee height, which does not require a like and allows us to use a lot of these assets to create a nice level of density. Here, we use a mix of gravel, patches of moss, and dry grass. After that, we add slightly bigger assets in the form of clusters of desert bushes to give context to the smaller assets and add variety. We finish the object scattering pass by adding individual larger rocks and arrangements of small rocks which give the player a better understanding Damn. of how far away something is when walking, driving or flying over a planet. Damn, that's cool. For performance reasons, we use a range of settings like randomized rotation and scale values to get as much variety as possible out of the number of assets we created to mimic a level of complexity that feels organic and comparable to what you find on Earth. Something that we have been missing on our current planets and moons are massive rock formations due to tech limitations. Some of these limitations have since been solved. For example, we are now able to render assets much further. Because of that, we recently kicked off a research and development phase during the production of the Pyro system to find workflows for the creation and distribution of cliffs. Full disclosure though, this is early in development and heavily work in progress, but we still wanted to give you a little glimpse of what to expect in the future. The challenge for us will be to figure out how we can make these assets look as good as possible from all angles. If a player walks up to them on foot, they must look just as good as when a player decides to land his ship on the highest point of a That's cliff. That's pretty cool. But we are excited to add an even more epic level of scale to our game. Now That's this, for me. Thank this you is for cool. watching and enjoy the rest of CitizenCon. Who wants Hello, to race my name through is there? Aslam, Anyone? And I'm part of the Organics team. Today I want to talk a bit about how we build the different biomes on Pyro 3. Pyro 3 is a planet with very This fucking reminds biomes. me of Death Stranding, honestly. For example, we got the yellow moss biome that is a strong contrast to the dark volcanic regions. We have some icy areas, boulder fields, acidic fields, different coastlines, and a lot more. Excuse when me, working acidic on a biome, field? The first thing we do is to Excuse have a look me? at the concept art. Acidic field. We do fields. an acid breakdown for all the elements we need to read. Can I grow weed on Pyro? By doing so, we get more information about Probably. what kinds of rocks and vegetation assets we need, um, the proportions of the assets in relation to the character. The distribution and frequency of those assets on the planet um, but also the amount of coverage per biome on the planet and um, we can also get information about the color palette the terrain colors and what to scatter on the coastlines the last thing we can see from the concept actually pretty is, damn cool um, the acid and ground materials we also try to reduce the amount of the acid packs because of performance and time constraints Instead of doing 50 unique rocks, we can achieve the same result by using just three with our procedural scattering system, since the assets will be scaled and rotated From 50 randomly. assets to three, After huh? figuring out all the necessary elements, we start with the white boxing phase. This means doing a very quick mock-up of the scene by using very simple So this assets. is Pyro 3. The white boxes should just represent AKA the shape Death and Stranding. color of the final object. 
We do that to see if the acid breakdown we did beforehand is working in the 3D space as well. At this stage of the process, we can still change the whole look of the scene if we don't like the outcome yet. We can say, let's make the rocks five times bigger, or blue instead of red, and so on. Or we realize know, we man. need to do some research on a specific acid to solve it visually, which was the case for the moss, for example. When doing R&D on the moss, we were trying different shapes and sizes, and we also had to figure out how to do the moss trends that are covering the whole mesh. To make the workflow for the moss trends a bit easier, we used Houdini to procedurally scatter them. Otherwise, it would have been too time-consuming to place every single moss trend by hand. So that there tech is called Houdini, huh? After for figuring this out how to do the moss trend, we still didn't like the overall shape So that's why my ships keep disappearing. As it was a bit too blobby and yellow. It's the Houdini software. We wanted something software. that looked a bit more natural and integrates better into the terrain. So we created some rocks with a moss blend on top instead. We broke up the moss shape even further because it looked a little bit too molten. And we added different kinds of moss trends to get a little bit more variety. In the end, all these things got us to a result that we were satisfied with. The usual approach to setting up a biome is to start with the largest elements first and work your way to the smallest one. If we take the moss preset as an example, we would start by adding the largest elements first then adding some smaller moss patches around it to create a nice fall off. We continued with adding some I don't even want to know what, to what, what tw uh, Star Citizen's but Twitch chat is like currently. To bring the elements Probably going to be toxic as hell seeing so we this. Decided to add some high grass as well. All I want to see is fucking deadlines. Like as you can see, see Pyro while yesterday. building a biome, we need to do several iterations to get the best visuals. Thank you for watching. <laughs> True. Thanks to Seb, Maxi, and Oslem for showing us their work. So when we started looking at um, outposts and started really from a, a ground up on how to make make it so that there's more diverse gameplay in there, um, the player can approach it in multiple different routes. Um, <laughs> Is it slow encounters. mode now? Uh, oh man, I'm not surprised. Encounters. Um, so we needed to kind of rebuild and rethink the way that we were doing this. We started honing in on what what was working, what wasn't working, and then mm. did a lot of adjustments. But this yeah. is the stuff I want to see, the development of it all. I'm interested in how something five, comes to, to uh, you know, when uh, we fruitation. When we hear from uh, an art side of what the design requirements are going to be, Fundamentally thinking about these as, as modules, thinking about them as thematic modules and outposts, you know, very specific, then, you know, already like the mind was going of like, okay, we're going to need a kind of like a paradigm shift in terms of how we. Tatooine? Anyone? These. You know, what could these settlements kind of feel like? And, you know, as some dude spamming bolt like 20 times whenever the middle dude is on the screen. You know, it's, it's a gameplay. Uh, or it's a location that person is 100% bald himself 100% smallest location architects that we have and then in time that will lead to like you know villages and towns and yeah thinking about how we wanted to push this forward i i mean chris has always talked about putting outposts into players hands mm -hmm. and so we needed to think about how would this expand? How would the players be able to make these homes feel, you know, homes or outposts or even businesses feel unique for the way that they I want mean, to play? I mean, honestly, Shype, I can't blame and, them because that, that looked like that we had to dead out of, uh, out of Tatooine. To embed these into the ground and, and like all these assets, sure a lot of them look like Mos Eisley worked, um, buildings. Much better than what we or did. Or buildings you would see in, in on, on Tatooine. On, kind of on stilts. And, so I can't and blame just, them for that one. You know, just the points of contact were very limited. On I want to cut my space suit and have Moss walk around like an e together, How do we get something that doesn't feel like... Well, it, it's, I, I know that design, we came up... Uh, Dan to win. Andreas and Dan came up with <laughs> a long list of things. You know, okay, well, here's what we'll need in half. Close. Here's what we'll need you know, for utilitarian. Here's what we'll need for defenses. Here's what we'll need for mm. um, power and some oxygen, life support, so on and so forth. So there was a, a very long list. And then it's, it's how can we take those and make them feel unified mm. and visually unified together. Yeah. Um, 
fundamentally, the thing that probably got us the most excited is finally we started to think about these as <laughs> yeah. um, like unified settlements, you know, base building. So as you can see on some of the concepts, base building, we, we deliberately presented early exploration shots like element interstellar, in kind of like semi isometric view to see you know, how does it feel if I'm laying out my base, how would these modules kind of, you know, tie, you know, tie together and, um, you know, it, it kind of got the team excited. And finally, we were thinking, all right, these settlements are going to be more than just, you know, like a single outpost, but, yeah. but more like a collection of modules. Uh, so just to continue on with the uh, module building and the module creation, we can jump to Christian and Christian can talk in a bit more detail about the visual development process. So I suppose to build these modules, these of these new uh, I imagine that you would need someone with a um, consolidated outland okay, pioneer so we've talked a little bit about the colonialism and, for uh, this now we're going to show you a little bit more module about development modules. so the very first thing that we did was creating all the primitives and all the primitive shapes because this was a pioneer so for like producing here, and placing a lot of variety right uh, there's the modules coming in there's the cylinder coming in the spheres coming in for example if i take this building over here and i uh, duplicate it and move it around i could just simply grab some of the other ones and combine them together and you will see later on that this is one of our um, archetypes or one that we that we pretty much like right so you can see here already there's a lot of variety of entrances uh, maybe some garages maybe some smaller entrances for um, for those uh, npcs or for for the players right and if i zoom in all of a sudden um, you, you can already see like how they react to the uh, to the environment or the, the overall scale, right? So if I pan over here and you see these buildings on the um, on the back in, in the background, um, so you're always having a, a first person um, standpoint or a first person view. So we were not only creating those entrances but also smaller details and very briefly looking into the modules. So what you can see here is the the very first. Uh, concepts for the uh, solar panels, for example, or the top-mounted, the roof-mounted solar panels. In the background, you see some, some other nice details that we can then just pick and put on our buildings, right? And some of the very last that we did stand pretty much those. So those were one of the archetypes. And you For see some reason, this stuff makes me want to play um, Stellaris, <laughs> honestly. Or housing, or housing buildings. Um, I don't know why, but it makes me want to play Stellaris. We have some uh, secondary and tertiary buildings like those uh, radio towers. If you imagine you're, in the, um, you're a um, colonist on a planet, right? On there, are, there are multiple uh, settlements on a planet. How would they communicate uh, with, uh, with each other? So we have a kind of a radio tower or some of those um, cooling, cooling devices. So if you imagine maybe there's something yeah, maybe. there's an um, even bigger uh, facility underground because you're on a very hostile uh, planet environment. So you want to store your very sensitive data underground. And uh, um, we were looking at those hints of life. Uh, maybe you are a kind of a farmer. So okay. you see already, this is the, the first archetype. This is more uh, cylindrical. And um, there are some storage spaces coming in here and there. So where would you uh, store your oxygen or your water gases, for example? All of this is just a, um, a consideration from, from our side. Uh, going over to the next one, uh, this is more pyramidical. So we were that building at in the middle also again reminds me of a the, town hall uh, from uh, uh, Age of Empires. Of so now it's it is again a more concrete, and the, the the color palette is changing. There are some of the storage coming in, and going then over to the next one, it is again looking at different materials there so this is team yellow from age of empires not in one big storage facility but it's um divided into small uh, smaller parts so you have to to walk around your settlement and see like okay i can put some stuff in here um, but if i need something else then i uh, need to, uh, to walk over there and there is some playing around with some uh, more entrances and windows how do they react to the environment right so this was just one of the very many files that we we created so Ooh, the refinery buildings but uh, um, we have different different files for for assets and props and uh, the refinery looks cool would, though would fit inside this 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 main architectural style that we wanted to to see more involved right so just a, a very early version of the refinery for example but all of this in the end was given us the opportunity to just cherry pick the best ideas. Look at that anti-air system over there. For this specific, Those uh, um, look like, look like Patriots uh, 
like a and, uh, like a ground mounted patriot system were able then to just grab looks the awesome parts and then use it in the actual game engine yeah and this was pretty much the um the concept development i didn't even see those missile turrets at first uh, i hope you have a great time and uh wish you all the best for the uh, for the next panels that are coming up Awesome, thanks Cristiano. Uh, so that pretty much covers uh, the work we've been doing on the exteriors. So now let's jump to the interiors. So um, we pretty much had to follow that same ideation process that we did for the exterior, but now for the interior. Now, um, slightly more simple, we, we knew there was a few key areas that we needed to design. First, it was the social space. You know, this is basically these kind of communal hubs. We knew we wanted like that open kitchen, seating areas, windows, an area where people could kind of hang out and, you know, relax. And then second to that was habitation. You know, we knew these are going to need to be abodes. We knew we needed bathrooms, uh, hub units. But again, oh, yeah, for, uh, for when in uh, here hygiene be, comes into play. You know, Pre-manufactured. So we wanted actual beds, not, not uh, racks of beds. So um, everything about uh, this process was to about, you know, creating a design which you would look at and relate to and think, oh, I, I, could, I could see myself living there. I could see someone living there for a, a quite a long period of time. So in habitation, you know, it's soft, soft surfaces, soft shapes. Um, but again, something which felt fairly integrated into the core architecture. In contrast to that, we knew we needed uh, technical spaces. You know, these could be used in the future to be, I don't know, uh, soil processing rooms or anything really within a technical bracket. So um, this one was quite a tricky one because, again, we needed to describe a feeling of age and, a, you know, a type of historical depth in this. So we tried a few, um, you know, visual cues like, you know, there's the, the physical tape deck, you know, the, the clicky buttons, you know, again, to give you that feeling of like, all right, this isn't necessarily like a modern technology level, you know. So that's why we uh, see solar panels, I guess, because it's not supposed to be like was modern, it's supposed so to be to look like dated spaces, and all that. It could be a power room or an engine room or some areas if, if, you, if your armor got beat up, you could you know, repair your armor in there. Basically, <laughs> it's, a, it's a language which will enable us to create a variety of like engineering type spaces. And then once we'd, um, once we'd established a, a spread- Dude, when I saw of, that command and control um, room, it reminded me of um, Yavin 4. That they were all working well together. We could take Either Yavin 4 or Hoth. Start to think about more about One of those two. themes that we wanted in these albums. M more Yavin 4 though. Yeah, the kind of looking at the, who would be the people that would be inhabiting it? What are the circumstances that would drive them to be there? And uh, so we, we sort of came up with like, we call it the, the a triangle of, of kind of the, the edge points of the sort of the independent, the outlaw and uh, the corporate. Uh, and you know, where these, the inhabitants would fall somewhere in that spectrum of, uh, of, of three points. And it's also important to note too, uh, you know, that this stuff would be applicable for the stuff we've done in Stanton. Like if we wanted to add these back backwards in Stanton as well, that it wasn't just exclusively pyro based. Tom Yard. Basically okay. when we was doing the design process, we pretty much focused on independent, um, mainly because that was our, that was our baseline. It was very easy to kind of design these and visually design these spaces to, is it like a, an independent farmer or is it a, an independent miner? And then with that, we wanted to really create a, um, an experience where you walked into one of these outposts and it feels old. It, do, it feels relatable, but it doesn't feel recognizable. Kind of similar to if you went to a, like a historic ruin or a historic part that you'd never really been to before. Or yeah, somebody's old farm. Exactly. So we did a lot of uh, exploration process of like, what type of artifacts would you find there? You know, what are, how did people used to decorate the house in this time period? You know, you'd still see uh, patterns, surfaces. That was shapes, an interesting looking snake in that, uh, in in that uh, bottle. Um, outposts. Yeah, even, even early versions of modern technology. So you could see that, you right. know, oh, this is like the mobile glass I have, but it's an older mobile glass, or right. just as an example, but. 
but also when when we're Old, older Moby glass, even just to back you mean up an iPad? Bit, when we're talking about the planets, we have a, a certain style, or we have certain amounts of points of interest that we want to go to, or an Apple Watch product placement, by the way. And so Dave and I and and Will and and others sit down and talk and say, all right, what do we need here? And all right, well, we need mining facilities, and then that helps to inform Ian and the. Uh, the other design teams and our teams of all right is that an independent theme is it a corporate theme yeah. is it an outlaw theme so these are all kind of layers but the first and foremost it's oh this is farming or this is mining or this is you know cargo because looking at something like pyro 2 which you know again starting from that sort of original pricey sentence of the planet was the idea it was like that was a heavily mined mined out planet that that had been kind of stripped of a lot of resources so there would be remaining infrastructure that would have been corporate mm -hmm. back in the day but is now independent or now even an outlaw setting so and then there would be the ones that would just be a straight independent one and stuff like that but yeah exactly like you said you know we'd start start with that sort of the base and then apply the theming to it to kind of mm. when we're thinking about the theming um we we, we kind of wanted um like a space catalog, like a furniture catalog. So uh, I know this is quite big for Chris is we kind of went down that um, process of, okay, let's design this one independent outpost in a few different ways. Like how could people have decorated it in many different ways? And it was quite a fun process because you basically create space furniture catalogs, which, um, which again, are going to be ways for, uh, it's so ways pretty for cool, the but then again, it's all to dress and all build, concept but, art, know, like eventually maybe it's a way for people to, I don't want to be that yeah, guy, but their own spaces, we've seen know. concept artists homestead um, stuff for like a year about, now. Um, the outlaw, uh, versions of these outposts, again, it, we, the process is very similar. You think about the visual rule sets, which would turn this into an outlaw. Um, outpost, uh, namely, you know, would it, has it been taken over by hostile intent? You know, is the signs of combat, is the signs of destruction still, still What we're still seeing present? currently reminds me um, a lot of like the actual a very stretched out version of, outposts, of, the of, in, of Inside of Star Citizen. Up. Yeah, it could be any number of situations. Yeah, it's one of those Inside Star Citizen episodes. Here and they're operating it as a base, which makes it a potential combat space, or is it, you know, was it a potentially an independent? Uh, refinery that outlaws attacked and killed everybody there and now is it a drug facility so yeah, on and so forth exactly uh, and then lastly on with the corporate you know um, you know it's something that we really want to just what it feels like early it just feels like a very stretched out inside star citizen location is owned by a corporate I would hope so because they also have ships to show like new ships that go on you know, sale immediately the, the the costumes that you'd expect the NPCs to be in there you know so there's a huge amount of visual world building that we can Speaking do that. to you know present these outposts in a few uh, different ways and even potentially reputation as well like yeah. we talked before about that idea that that you know if you do missions for yeah. corporate outposts that it you know reflects in your general to be honest uh, relationship with that they already um, I mean that I actually thought that pyro would be like, like later on maybe in you've just come from citizen uh, and not one like of the immediately at the start that, you know was occupied by a certain gang type and then they but sent you to we haven't seen uh, any a settlement on one of the deadlines yet and clearly it's or been, like um, any you know, window where they could gang. possibly so launch Pyro. Want that read and that consistency uh, we might well, hear more on that with the, um, one of the one server of the, meshing uh, panel though the server meshing panel is only like 20 minutes long i was long. quite excited about uh, getting into was the idea of a, a trading outpost you know we've been talking about you know buying and selling uh, for a while but thinking about it in a in a frontier context you'd you know it's almost like the money's kind of worth yeah i know this you know, is all it's concept. more about the ability to barter or, or you know trade so um fundamentally i thought it'd be cool that if we kind of design i wonder what ships they're going they're going to like so straight to flyable planet, or straight you know, to would, um you know, people would kind of you know uh, trek to like and, straight you, know, you can buy like what new ships they're going to uh and then go back you know we've talked about the idea of i have my ideas of of nowhere, one like, of them might be would I want uh, or would I the want argo raft which is an argo carrier you know so 
Um, and so the other did, one might you know, be the Origin 400i, but the Origin 400i might go straight in 3.15 into instead. What would a, a trading post be like on one of these frontier outposts? Argo so, Rest, uh, an Argo Carrier. The images, Imagine that. We wanted that feeling of um, the majority of the stuff around this outpost is pretty much junk. You know, uh, spaces isn't at a premium. So they just keep it outside, you know, maybe it's rusting, maybe it's rotting, maybe it's, the, you know, getting overgrown. But I love I know, that man. idea is that you're approaching one of these settlements. It's very easy to understand. All right, this is a trading post because... Usually when they know, add ships, all of that stuff, like, they um, go into the game the for outside. backers. Well, and then the first patch it, after that, the like the major patch, the is when they go into, into the game for uh, AUEC. It's very conventional it's just the you know the what we've done so far has been a lot of franchise stores actual companies that own you know that are selling wares so i personally uh, you know, th i personally think that uh like that and the idea being that out here yeah but they want it to be a grind i guess different. it's not going to be that polished exactly. it's going to be much more of a personal interaction with somebody uh so it's been really fun talking with you know the ai and behavior guys to try and work out exactly like how is that dynamic doesn't really matter if they add it in 3.15 you know, straight uh, to flyable like anyway player all right, cool. So that was a little bit about the Nobody can afford of these it. outposts. So let's throw it over to Eric now, and he can go into a lot more detail into the visual design process we did for the interiors. Hello, I am Eric Gagnon, principal concept artist on Star and Citizen. Today I will present the interior colonialism outpost concept and explain a bit how the pre-production process works. The goal is to create an interior design. For I wonder how much, uh, how many hours it was the go first into time we this had picture. To create a timeless design look. We how have many an hours? To create something Just in this one and with a cozy art. feeling interior. At the beginning, we started from this concept art made by Christian Dorritz. We have a lot of information in there to inspire the interior design. In those interior, we have a specific zones, social area. Place to eat together, play game, leisure, the bedroom, place to relax. At least four hours. Space, and of course, Bro. sleeping. <laughs> the engineering room, the place for the building machine who maintains the possibility to survive. It has to be a joke. The technical room. Because you could also the say like, oh, at least one hour. To analyze minerals, yeah, exactly. Some elements it's like, a, like an entire entrance. week, if not more. Use for storage material and stuff to go outside. At the beginning, we had an overview of the plant that's helped to organize the zone. To create all of those areas, we need to do a lot of exploration and design. Social area. For those sketches, we want a centerpiece on the ceiling. Could be a light, fan, or whatever that could be cool. We feel the curvy shape of that space. Here on this sketch, I play with a very contrast values in the greenish color palette. That one is the best. Long vertical windows from the side, let the light inside a lot. After validation of the most relevant sketch, we do a 3D blackout. As you see, this 3D blackout follows very closely to the last. Where's sketch. the band? Yeah. From the screenshot of the 3D blackout, <laughs> where's, the, the, where's the fucking container band? Value that helps to better organize the it. coloring phase to make sure all the elements fit and will live together. After this, I like to do a 2 It makes you think, right? Will they add? It's um, a good way to will they add instruments into the game? Together and the ratio proportions between each of them. The final key shot of the social area bring it alive. Nice lighting come from the windows. Cozy mood give a soul. Like a jukebox you can put area. somewhere in your uh, now my outpost. Co-workers extract the elements from this key shot and break down the props to define more accurately. First, the Homestead Radial Contour done by Danny Chan from the UK. That concept is the perfect blueprint to start the production. Honestly, now that I think of it, I haven't seen anything in the schedule Marcos for CitizenCon talking about Squadron 42. Some explanation they can't have a CitizenCon and not talk about Squadron 42, right? The the There's no way. All the details are there to define a fully functional story. For the bedroom area, the process is the same as the social area. 
the sketch phase is essential. As you see here is an example of grayscale sketch. From one of those shots, we get a validation from art directors and CR. And boom, this is the final one. To detail the engineering room, we again go back to the painting technique. This process again is key to... Well, you say that, Shai, but uh, Chris the Roberts is moving from California really uh, at the, of the end of this year so or far, January next year to the UK to be to at place. the Squadron 42 team in person room, to finish it up. To make sure the technology came true. Squadron 2042. Where we start from wouldn't be far off probably painting to set the tone and then deep dive into color elevation this is Yavin 4 honestly to make the homestead a living space the bathroom props are important to define the functionality of futuristic and <laughs> spray nozzle okay. finally let's exit by the entrance this is the first sketch exploration I did for Star Citizen the goal of the homestead entrance is to show what the player has access to and I mean, set the overall ambience. A sink of the place. is cool and all, to all for but how to useful will it be on a planet with like low gravity? That is produced during pre-production. I sincerely hope because there's no way that these homesteads will have like one G gravity system. generators in them. Thanks everybody. There's no chance, dude. Thanks, Eric. Awesome stuff. Especially because uh, they are so old. There's no way all of them theory, have like a gravity uh, generator we in it. want to get into game and, and show off what we've been working on. We're going to be showing you uh, kind no of uh, multiple playthroughs. And how play it changes um, based off of what you do and, and how you have faction with the certain game. Pyro in play. Okay, okay. Let's have a look. So here we are waking up in 400 eye. Uh, that will be released in 315. 400 I this boys. Is a competitor to the constellation. It's here. It doesn't compromise cargo for vehicles. 400 I. It's faster, more agile than Connie, and it can run with a smaller crew. The 400 so I the, boys. It's finally yeah, here. Wars, and then we'll go out and see a little bit more of the habitation deck. Coming to 3.15. And then make our way to the cockpit. After like what? So this would be the a year or more in the dark. And eat and and basically plan your next mission. The Origin 400i. Honestly, then, dude, this looks pretty damn good. Here we'll go to the cockpit. Master plan should give at least 0.3g, which is enough to stand on the floor comfortably. Yeah, but so I mean, we're over Pyro 3. the water, um, like the physics of the water for a mission for a to sink. acquire an artifact. Um, and uh, you'll be making your way down to a trading post. So, wanted Damn, to the origin uh, 400 just give you a quick overview. Crazy. And then we can start talking about the planet. Is that yeah, is, is that is, thunder? Uh, yeah, it's just a, a terrestrial planet. I saw thunder very, in those clouds. Uh, breathable like atmosphere. Like lightning. Uh, but it's still pretty inhospitable, very cold. Uh, as you can see, I see lightning, yeah. lightning strikes in the clouds. But, uh, but yeah, very. There it is, the 400i. So this is no, uh, no, 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 the no. first time we're actually seeing it, clouds it's not, above uh, ship uh, talk. a terrestrial planet. You know, we went through quite They're a few showing iterations off pyro. of uh, forms. But this is the 400i. Uh, the ended upon was something that felt quite... It's finally uh, coming, uh, the 400i. People have been looking uh, forward for this for like more than a year in now. In terms of uh, how the wind would have shaped them. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, it's showcasing a lot of the, the, the more recent... Um, tech uh, that came online. Dude, those lightning uh, strikes look so is, like, fucking cool. Kind of distant thunder strikes. And what this is, it's uh, kind of like a prelude to really, you know, future. Uh, it, the it was basically on board, kept in the know, dark this will tie into, by CIG know, for a uh, long time and, uh, until like three D sketch, three you know, D so models good. started uh, leaking out. The, um, you know, the rain hit the canopy glass here. You know, Dude. You these cloud banks. Also, as part of the, the process of shaping, one of the things we is create these, uh, these kind of like these pockets in between the clouds. So you're in these cavities. So as you're flying through, you get I know, right? The terrain beneath you. Dude, this uh, looks so but, fucking you know, awesome. It, it feels really quite exhilarating, you know, to fly through. Also, Even well, this like, isn't uh, 60 FPS because you can see that. A lot of the more recent uh, tech coming on board as well. So, you know. Um, it's you know, like it's, stuttering a little uh, bit as well. A lot of optimizations been going on. 
uh, so it's way more performant than previously uh, than previously it was. Also, like the the level of artifacting that we're seeing here is is substantially reduced. Uh, yeah, the artifacting in the clouds is a lot less than on Crusader currently. It also gives you a great sense of parallax when you fly through these these cloud sandwiches. Dude, a cloud sandwich. Yes. Look at that. That's, that's what it feels like. This effect like on the windshield is also new. The, the cheese it, of a cloud because sandwich. it is different from what we see in, th in uh, the cloud sandwich. So on Crusader when we fly through cheese, clouds. Uh, another really big feature that was important uh, for me was uh you know terrain uh, terrain shadowing and terrain occlusion from the clouds so uh you're actually seeing you know these uh, large areas of occlusion uh, cast onto the terrain and it's, um, it just adds that depth it just adds that believability to uh, what we're seeing in the frame wait, is this actually you know when you see like these over like dark overcast, oh, wait, is uh, uh, overcast clouds in the hovering above the mountains it 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 finally completes the uh, the frame especially yeah it's crazy the dude rumbles of uh, thunder in the distance it's stupid how expensive so it is James Cameron, like. who's doing the, the the run through yes that is his name um he will be taking us down to the outpost uh the goal for us is to basically make 50 of these whether they're inhabited or derelicts or, i know or man, even it's, it's stupid um, basically inhabited by that's why a, I, why um, why i invested in semi like a, a lot in so uh, the goal is to have these semiconductor uh, manufacturers and so that you can develop different rep associated with them um and you can start seeing how big these outposts uh stretch to with the, the comms tower that's behind us and then even some of the aa turrets that you'll actually see up close yeah. and personal I'm not gonna lie, those outpo outposts look actually pretty darn good. Shibe, if, if it has access to, really um, uh, from James to the there, Dutch markets, have a look at ASML. 3 out of 10. 3 out of 10, Jeez. A ASML or like... Yeah, it, it, yeah, 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 yeah. never mind. Yeah, just just, six, just look up ASML. No one's ever got a six. Of course, do your own due diligence Gotta before that, before going into ASML. But so here we'll ever since the, the COVID uh, lockdown started, it went up like three hundred and thirty percent. So show up the cargo area. As Semiconductors well as are, are booming. The climate controlled um, ah, gotcha. areas, and then onto the gravity generator. What a shitty broker, man! And the stairway out. Is it the generator there? Oh, also interactive panels. Okay. <laughs> Not gonna lie, the 400i looks pretty damn good. Um, so you'll be able to learn more about the ship in one of the later yeah, panels that we I know. have with Ben, Paul, and John. Um, I think the team did a great job on this. Uh, also for cinematic this is purposes. One of my favorite skins. Yeah. Yeah, they did a. But yeah, this isn't running at six uh, FPS. No just shot. That felt a lot more, you know, suitable for pyro. But you, know, you can see how it, it, you know, feels suitably worn and, and weathered. Uh, it looks freaking good know, though. Four hundred eye. Not gonna lie. These climates and. And I'm not an Origin fan in the slightest. on the ground, you know, on pyro. Uh, I think Missile it looks turret, great, okay. uh, especially in, in in contrast to what we're seeing here. Is like actual AI on the terrain. You know, walking about, going about their business. Um, and is that an AA turret there? That is it an is. AA turret. And radio comms towers and all these other elements that we want to make sure that are interactive Bro, with the player. This looks so freaking good, dude. Go and explore or use as uh, used to their advantage. No joke. Um, we want them to be able to interact with these these different items. Here you can see like uh, various outpost modules, you know, to the right there, we've got the garage unit, you can see the infrastructure on the roof, but this large, beautiful, you know, archway here kind of signifies... I'm not gonna lie. You know, ...the main entrance, the primary entrance Looking at the, this, the right? main social module. And seeing all this... I think the air looks look great. It's no, honestly it's hard to believe that we're looking at Star Citizen right now. The if you compare it to what it looks like in, like, what Stanton looks like. 
And then uh, we've seen the concept art previously. It's day, honestly hard to believe. Know, We're looking at Star Citizen currently. Uh, in game, I, I like think no it joke. absolutely looks fantastic. You know, uh, the radio forms, you know, is, is quite. Uh, quite Am I the only one that, that, that thinks that? Uh, and you can see how that, that complements these archways that lead into other areas. Of the it looks like an entirely different game, this. Like, even so what we've seen just AI, now from Pyro sure 3 with the 400 living, eye. It's breathing. Um, if you look back it a look, bit, it doesn't look like the Star cooking. Citizen that we know it. It's um, like a different game to me. There's security guards here to make sure that they're actually protecting their investments. Protecting a better one, their home, by the way. Uh, from strangers, and then... Yeah, Stanton's uh, gonna look so them. dated. And, uh, when this so when this comes out, Stanton looks so well, looks so so dated. The other players wouldn't be able to enter into. We also got a, a quick what shot at the, uh, past the loadout anyway. that James is playing. So it's female loadout, but it's also showing the um, the backpack, uh, which is new. Also, the what some Man. new hair as well, which is rendering much nicer. Jesus. So here the player will make their way out to the training post. Um, go see Look the dealer, at that, where the dude. artifacts. And for the for the training post, you know, we wanted to get Jesus all of the junk Christ. on the outside as well. Uh, you know, so the player can see it as they're approaching. Uh, we wanted, you know, as I'm many blown away, as honestly. Could, and you can see it's using the new soft deck shader, so these are reacting to the planetary <laughs> wind. Uh, you know, the same. The same force that the, the the tall grass and the moss in the ground is reacting to as well. Other thing with the training post. Honestly, am I really like the only one that that thinks before, I'm looking at a different um, game and not Star Citizen? And what they'll be able to actually sell here will vary. <laughs> am I the only on, one here? Um, where they're at in the solar system, are they close to uh, a jump point where they might be coming down and using this as a chop shop or? Uh, are they in a very rural area that you know they care more about um, the frontier lifestyle and being able to survive versus money? We uh, we passed the kitchen as well on the way back there. That's the that's the local diner uh, for this outpost. Man, tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, so in the inside as well, you know, we wanted this. You know, kaleidoscope of, of uh, colors and shapes. Um, you know, like it's just literally the the dealers displaying. Look at that rug. All the wares, everything they'll have uh, outside in the open here. Usually, I'm not, I'm not blown away by a carpet, but seeing that, that's the one, Kyle. Well, uh, Fall on order, hundred percent. Take a look. I'm sure I have what you want, and if not, but honestly, I'm just as good. Usually, I'm not blown away by a carpet, but that carpet with those f little folds in there. Like every everything in Star Citizen currently, when so it comes to something like that, credits of disposable income, we get our first look at the it looks uh, too uh, uh, Hadesian artifact. Too smooth is currently. What is and seeing the carpet with like a fold in it, it's uh, crazy. Thing that you'll hopefully be able to start finding in the in the galaxy, uh, which is sort of if you're familiar with it, lore of Hades was an old civilization that destroyed itself. Uh, so somehow this trader has gotten their hands on. Uh, this artifact. Man, bro. So here we're showing one way of actually playing. Look at that carpet. This area. <laughs> uh, it really depends on your standings Aww, within the gang work. and how they want to deal with you. And then it, what's the dealer going to do? What's the dealer going to charge you? Dude, and you would need there, we have different so much security showing, to go um, into Pyro and to buy look at an artifact, two now. bring it to Stanton, and then sell it off. So here we're going to run it back um, a little bit and show off a, a different way of entering into the trading post. This is a little bit more straightforward. But yeah, you're right, man. It the, reminds me of Fallen Order a lot. We took a side route through uh, the social area. So yeah, this is just some additional warehouse space that the trading post would have. Uh, and you can see it would lead directly onto the this courtyard. Um, and for the keen eye, uh, people, you'd see that the barbecue's still not uh, being eaten yet. The grill master would be fired. Yeah. I can tell you when I come back still in, in 10 weakness. days that barbecue's still not eaten. Because there's no AI that will come up to it and eat it. 
Unless you can steal so it as a player. Again, we just want to make sure that it's filled out with items, filled out with different things that you can interact with and possibly buy. Um, it, it's like Dave said in the beginning, um, we want the stores to feel different here, uh, but it's, it's still making it feel believable. Quick reference to some uh, additional traversal areas there on the right when we came in. Sure, I have what you want, and if not, I'll have something just as good. Yeah. The guys had a lot of fun. Wait, uh, hold that's there. five million. Uh, a lot of storytelling going into it. That artifact was so five million. I didn't even see that. The price. <laughs> um, and we want to. We don't mind um, losing reputation with with the faction, <laughs> and. Uh, Decide that we're going to take the artifacts um, oh, uh, uh, through betrayal. Uh, oh, oh. Just take it. Straight into the backpack. <laughs> so here we've got uh, different oh, uh. routes for the players to enjoy and, and to use to, to flank um, <laughs> and also navigate around. So each area will have different uh, secondary and tertiary routes of navigation. Um, James was really just trying to scare me. <laughs> yeah, subscribe to, to life. Your free <laughs> trial to life has ended. And also, if you notice, the reflect, there was a, uh, the civilians are actually cowering as opposed to fighting, which is kind of, you'll see another coming up. But it's super cool. It's honestly like a different game, bro. So again, I'm looking at a different game. This isn't Star Citizen. Choice, you know, do they actually want to interact oh. with the civilians? Or, Shoot them. You know, does their conscience get better of them? Oh, I didn't shoot him. I think James made the right choice there. He was nice. Yeah. What if you walk away and that fucking uh, AI just pulls a fucking pistol out of his ass? When you see the uh, uh, the enemy AI kind of fanning out across the terrain like that, it's fantastic to see. It feels really great. And then you add up the, base, the current server tick rate, uh, yeah. trying to exfiltrate. and you can shoot everyone without them even turning also, ahead, under, uh, turning their head. You know, combat stress, but because the AI is unresponsive with the current, just, just looks fantastic. Uh, with the current server tick rate, yeah, that's how I play. But with the current server tick rate, you wouldn't see so this. Here, no chance. Just wants to get out real quick. I imagine the guys from the homestead already called. Like a security force, right? Even if it's like a gang, because they have to be under protection from like a gang in Pyro, right? Like, a gang has to show up because, you know, their protectorate just got attacked. Yeah, the SAM side too, the missile turret. You're right. Surely it's not shooting yet. So Doesn't seem to be shooting. Hinted to in the first walkthrough, um, this is where the AA turrets will come alive. There we go. And uh, basically, oh, there we go. If you're not fast enough, as James isn't, um, <laughs> with your countermeasures, then they'll take you down. Wait, are those unguided missiles? Well, fuck so your what 400 we saw there was The player went in, and based off their actions, the faction changed against them and then uh, basically became very aggressive. So in this last playthrough, what we'll show you is if the faction is already against you from the very beginning, and what oh, are different that's ways gonna be interesting. to go about it. So here we are in our last walkthrough. Um, since you're all by yourself, we wanted to show the player... Look at that lightning in the distance, dude. Versus if you were with friends, you could go in guns blazing. Um, but this allows the player to come in, access the the outpost from a different side than what we've shown. Uh, it also allows them to clock all the AI and see how they want to approach the problem. Please tell me you can shoot out that light. Secondary or tertiary routes would be open to them, either via the ladder or maybe a possible door. Oh, that was a frame drop right there when he zoomed out. And there. Good night. That was a great shot. Uh, also, one thing we did as well, as Todd said, you know, we, we changed the time of day 
uh, the wind is slightly stronger, so you'll see the uh, gorgeous yeah, and it's going to be the best yellow game. grass blown just a little bit more <laughs> intense DLC. Uh, than uh, before. Uh, also, what we see in here is like um, something to to imply at the frontier living. You know, maybe the growing crops or vegetables out here, but it also gives a kind of like a soft cover approach uh, it's to the crazy, perimeter of the dude. base. Look! Look at nice. this. Can you shoot holes through that? Through also, all that? with it being a different time of day, this allows us to show off the AI um, having their 24-hour schedules so that they can they can be in different areas. Um, oh man, the alien dangerous deaths are watching this 100%. So you approach it at night or you approach it during the morning. At you least someone from alien dangerous is, uh, is watching this. Is valid for their schedule. 100%, guaranteed. Oh, it's locked now, huh? That door's locked. So there's no going through that way. But what uh, what James does actually see here as he's scouting out the next... Well, AI Carl, is, you uh, say that this isn't even a mission. Check in the roof line, but... Uh, as, as I said It's not a mission. You can just walk up to, to a... Kind of like, uh, views in, uh, you can just go to, to an outpost and just instead possible. of... You know, just so the, the instead of uh, buying it, you can just keep steal it. Of, of what's inside. But also when it's just a sandbox. You can just do it. It's not even to, a mission. To have context of where they're at within the actual outpost, and that was a great shot. But one thing I don't the uh, the the AI fell get right on the uh, the already Say this out is beautiful yellow grass on an actual server, animals. right? And some troll also, as a, decides, as decides to shoot back, up an entire town. Uh, what he's doing is like actually, no survivors. Uh, making a, a mental map of are they actually you know, going to respawn routes, or what's uh, possible advanced traversal routes? On what's going on with the that? Outpost. Especially when it's one continuous persistent universe, right? If you shoot up an entire outpost, like what happens? Can you shoot through the glass? And we saw the dealer there in the bedroom. Just end of the day. So with each outpost, there'll be different routes that will be open to the player or closed to the player. So some of them might have ladders on the outside, some of them might not. Some of them might have uh, basically ways to get in through the floorboards, other ones won't. But this is this is just one one version of, you know, many possibilities. So here, the player will take a secondary route of navigation all the way up to the roof and then from here um, this allows them to be able to check out any of the AI Pew. also be able to look at any of the interactables um, in the future you know if you're uh, if you got a good reputation maybe you need to go and fix uh, different uh, items on the roof um, or if you are there for uh, nefarious means then maybe you want to take out the power and which will then turn you know kill the AA turrets or um, will turn off the the lights in the in the outpost so it allows the player to yeah fuck that items, dude and then uh, basically you're, you're them, supposed to nice, get like audio nice cues like for I see one you know it shouldn't be like a visual cue on screen so here you can see one of those interactables as well as the AI or like you hear someone yell Just like he's over there like we've from these, distance these kind of archways like right now this uh these are just Ooh. kind of empty and uh, to just illustrate like a like a guard point in the future you know these could be maybe melee takedown please or, melee takedown you know, they could oh. contain like an AA turret like we saw on on demo one or it could contain like uh cargo storage um, basically, we tried to design something that was as flexible as possible. Ah, uh, showing off the new inventory system too. So here we're showing off the looting system as well as the. Um, this is already in, in 3.15. So. so this will be shipping in 3.15. This allows bodies to. Um, I know, be able right? To be interacted with and take off the items associated with it. Also, with this um, change, you will no longer have global inventory, so you can't be pulling off weapons that you didn't take with you um, to this location. Uh, everything will be regarding uh, what you carry is is what you um, what yeah. You have this could actually hands. be what the actual tick rate is going to be um, so like. It really AI just makes unresponsive. Think about how they want to approach the problem. 
And but like I said, I, I wonder how they're going to approach like a, like a troll, right? Uh, Especially in a persistent universe, like someone is obviously um, going going to come to an outpost are, and shoot up. Um, shoot up the entire outpost like will those certain, um, characters respawn certain way will they stay they, dead they maybe didn't bring with them i don't know what, how they are be including the uh, going to approach that your team the knickknacks app for your mobile glass so now that you aren't carrying everything on your body and it's not sort of universal inventory you'll be able to consult this app well, that's, to see kind that's of where smart. stuff is being stored and keep it even though there's a letter over there so here this allows the player to uh, have a, a quick little puzzle, but just gives them a little bit more interaction and then allows them to go on to a, what I would consider a, a tertiary route um, versus climbing up the ladder and, and possibly having to deal with the AI. Or yeah, I guess they would respawn. It's just like a weird thing, if you know what I mean. Yes, melee takedown. That was low, kind of low FPS. Also, I think the team did a great job on the planet, as well as the outpost. Yeah, it's you're really right. It didn't actually and, replenish and the ammo. It's and, still um, one round. You know, allows. Uh, you're right. Allows for many possible, you know, ways of attacking the same problem. What we're seeing here is like uh, James. I like how complicated to, this uh, is one of these, to to like, get that uh, artifact right. It should be a challenge. And it's, it's given like the the highest point in the base. So from here, you can actually you know make probably the most informed decisions on you know how how to nah, approach get out the here. problem. You know we're seeing this guard routine here. The AI responds to that. No way. And then ultimately, uh, you know, throwing an item to uh, distract the guard. Nobody hears that door open too. To, to go and access new areas. Um, it's this a behavior is cool, that we're though. still working out, but at least you're we're seeing like the first iterations and be able to uh, continue to optimize it as well as um, <laughs> exactly. make sure that the behavior's working. They properly. don't hear a dude open an airlock. So we just saw that for the first time. It's like the first route. Oh, I got the uh, Ruck Diaz patch. over there. So previously, uh, route in and out. Uh, if the if if the outside wasn't pressurized, there's a like rover the, in there too. Uh, we wouldn't have this option. Dragonfly. But now, through that rooftop uh, airlock, you can you can cycle and and then oh yeah, the you know, it infiltrate uh, through the roof. And also, what we're seeing here is um, this is cool. You know, potentially scouting out uh, an advanced traversal up into the rafters. Please you know, tell me you can shoot some shoot out a light like that and get in like this overview. Uh, as we go into the uh, the garage module, loot boxes. So here, yep. this is placeholder, but it gives you a, a very, it gives you an idea of, you know, we want to have different interactables, different loot boxes um, laid out around the the location. So, if the players um, explore, they'll be rewarded. You know, we we want to encourage them looking in every nook and cranny and and enjoying you know what the dude what that ursa the, looks dirty as fuck and i love them. it that ursa is supposed one, it one usually looks clean these garages and not won't like be dusty vehicle like that. spawn points so so it's not like a big kind of like pad in the middle but it's more like you know if you want to if you want to have your, your wait did that, that man did that man just walk it off so here you can see a variety of vehicles just just laid out how the player would have just parked them just gives a much more believable and realistic uh, design. I really love how um, complicated it is to get to that artifact. It should be. It should be complicated, especially when it's worth so like again, five we're million to just buy. Just encouraging different navigation, different routes. It should be this complicated. Player to go and see. Uh, over to the left, back there. Oh no! Yeah, he there did was actually a, die. A possible way of going into floorboards or going underneath the, the outpost again it, those those will be opened up or closed off based off of you know just how we want to build the outpost not every not every second dude should have reacted there the same um our philosophy for for these are to to make sure that they each one of them feels unique shoes. um and this is just one way of us 
us customizing it and, and making each one feel um, different. And so the player won't always be used to the same routes. So here, again, we're using the inventory system. We allow the players to go in and uh, if you take out a certain AI, Mag didn't um, reload again. you might have different tools or different uh, notes or different items that you'll need um, in order to solve uh, your mission. Interestingly, when we <laughs> mean phase of that phases, psychopath uh, right there. We knew we wanted these internal uh, uh, airlocks, um, but we knew we needed some sort of like new, uh, like pothole uh, on them just so before you commit through, before you cycle, you know, you can just double check to see if there's any bad Pistol guys still on the didn't other side. reload. So we, we got some ragdoll bugs. Um, I guess it wouldn't be a citizen con without any sort of uh, issues or bugs. Hey Kyle, this is for you. The voices from the artifact told me to murder them. True. So here, like the, previously the players being, uh, you know, on the roof, They've come down through the main uh, section of the outpost. But here, what the player's doing is they're going to the, the underfloor section. So these are vents, but they're more like uh, subfloors. So they're meant to feel very dark, very minimal, but you're actually seeing the foundations of these outposts. So inside here, it's uh, the player will need to kind of uh, work out how to navigate I know, right? through them. Cutter it's is actually really cool. A, a, like a torch based experience. You know, um, and then within here, uh, what the player can actually do is work out uh, roughly where they are in relation to the um, to what's uh, upstairs. And what you see in here, like this light bleeding down through, you know, you can kind of make informed decisions. Or okay, that's where that AI was. Or uh, right now, the player is just underneath that main social space. So if you think back, like that was that guard in the beginning, just just next to the kitchen counter. You know, the, it, we, we've intentionally made these spaces not necessarily like very easy to navigate because, you know, it, there wouldn't be a lot of light down here, you know. I uh, know, dude. The player would have to, you know, follow, for example, like James is following the blue wire here, you know, um, you know, making a decision to like, hey, if I follow that blue wire, I'm probably going to get to something interesting or a point where I can actually you know, exit this supply of space and get I want less up. markers. I don't like markers for all kinds and of stuff. What I like about them is, is basically just the claustrophobic feel of it. And then obviously the addition of possible secondary um, or more advanced navigation. So either going into prone or uh, just going full crouch. It all, like, still, it doesn't look like Star City. So it's like out. a completely different game. Uh, in the bathroom space that's on the other side of the garage, <laughs> on the opposite side of the outpost from where we just were. It's a good ragdoll. And now the body drag. In the shower. There any clothes? So here, um, this is just a <laughs> different wrapper on a loot box. Uh, in this case, it's a hamper. And so the player will be able to... Uh, really change outfits and, and adjust the way that they look so that they can walk around the outpost and, and not be um, be noticed. Uh, there will be kind of a, a certain a certain time limit associated no with it. We still need to way. work out the, the details on how all that will work, but the the goal is to to give them a little bit of um, leeway and so no you way apart, you can go into cover like that recognized as, as much and the AI won't uh, um, won't notice you as, as quickly no shot bro so here we can see back into the social space but this time on the other side and then this door will lead directly into the the habitation room that we saw previously on the outside <clears throat> So that's the shopkeeper right there. He's now dead, or at least I think Speaking that was the fun, shopkeeper. Fun ragdoll physics. That was a great one. So here, dude, um, that's fucking the sick. Player, uh, decided to take the the dealer out instead of actually figuring out how they could open up the safe. Um, so should have questioned him. They're gonna have to look around the room. They're gonna have to interact with the body. <laughs> yeah, he's sleeping. And possibly see 
you know, is there a way for them to actually open it? Um, in other cases, uh, maybe the safe will be hackable um, in the future, and in some cases it won't be. And then this you'll, is so you'll need cool. to figure out a different way of, of actually opening it. Hard night at the bar. True. Oh, a little paper there. So here we that one stands out. A little yep. clue. Um, a little note, and uh, you'll notice the. Uh, Sorry to leave before you get like back. The name on here. All set up you like you wanted. See the, right uh, now, the code is. Some the AI would be taken out. Uh, you may notice Factory some default names. one two three four. Um, so here's the clue for the player. But one of the coolest things for me here is the player is holding an item with the clue. And while holding the item, they can seamlessly interact with another item to solve a puzzle. That's awesome. And then here we got a little bug. Yeah, that was the player was able yeah. to acquire the artifact, and then uh, will be able to do whatever they want with it, either sell it or be able to use it somehow in a future mission. <laughs> Put the piece One of the paper in there, really and they lock it again. Kind of back to back to back. It's, Nobody's gonna find the, the, the fucking code ever again. Choice. And it's like, it's really, really, I mean, again, the, our locations. That's what I would do. Put the piece of paper in there and beautiful, but now like close having it. that sort of striking that balance between, uh, you know, this sort of well thought out social space and construction of these locations, but also an equally effective stealth and combat thing. It's a, it's super cool to say. So after seeing the demo played through, you know, three different ways, um, it was a huge team effort. So uh, everyone that worked uh, on the project on this part of what we wanted to show, we want to say a big thank you, you know, big shout out because, you know, we're just presenting it. Uh, it's the people that did a lot of the hard work. Yeah, um, I actually, I actually bet this was hard work to get this all done. And uh, speaking of people doing hard work, uh, now is a good chance to throw it over to Eddie and Joel. And they're going to tell you a little bit more about the uh, how we built that outpost that we just saw. I'm Eddie Hilditch. Uh, I'm a senior lead, and myself and my team have been working on the new colonialism outposts. My name is Joel Azapati, and I'm a senior environment artist too for the EU Sandbox team. So after the initial concept is done and rounds of feedback have been iterated on, we move into pre-production. This phase allows us to spend some time testing the concepts for in-game viability. Translation from concept to game isn't always one-to-one, -one, and during pre-production we'll get rough versions of the concept meshes into game and spend time making sure that they'll work practically. The art direction can also change at this stage, so we use this phase to kind of explore creatively as well, and concept art is a fantastic jumping off point for sparking ideas. One of the first steps when starting a new location is to start look development a hyper-focused small section of the location where we can hone in the tools and methods needed to execute the concept in-game. Some things translate well, some things don't. It's important to figure all this out before going full steam ahead with the entire team. One of the great assets on the Sandbox team is we have a lot of people who are passionate about concept and design, which means when translating from concept to production environment, it's very easy to expand on the concept art. With the art styles of the Colonial Outpost, we decided to change up the way we typically author content. Our hard surface locations are meant to feel prefabricated, like there's a manufacturing plant out there on Art Corp that churns out these flat pack space station kits so stations could be mass produced. Colonial Outposts are more personal and handcrafted huh? by the people who live there based on their needs, not wants. They're on the frontier world, so they can't always choose luxury over practicality. Materials were one of the first things we tackled, and we started off by developing the idea of how the inhabitants would have built these structures and what materials they would use. We wanted to show not only the age of the outpost, but also wanted the to hear the made out of wires of Excuse the structure me? and give you an idea how, functionally, they constructed them. One of the biggest challenges with the new outpost is how we introduce variation between each location the player will visit. Building each as a bespoke set of buildings is impossible, as we want hundreds, if not thousands, of outposts in the game eventually. The modular approach that we've developed really evolved out of our previous work on space station interiors, but with a few key improvements. Uh, this starts at the macro level, where on the planet's outposts are placed, how the local conditions affect your time there, then what kind of buildings an outpost has and how they're laid out, all the way down to the ability to independently swap out an underfloor layout in a single building of that outpost. 
we all have various types of modules from large standalone modules like warehouses or ore extractors which have a singular function all the way down to smaller room modules that can be connected together in different ways to form a complete headquarters building. Damn, After that pre is actually finished, pretty we had good. a list of the room pretty module cool types that we wanted to tackle first. For the headquarters building, everything hinges around a hub module with different room modules that can be attached to extend the structure. The room modules will serve different functions in the base with various gameplay systems linking one to another for an interconnected web of sandbox gameplay opportunities. As content creators for the outpost, we needed a new system to build, edit, and manage the library of modules we're creating. Rastar is the tool we'll use to do this. It allows us to intuitively create a location template directly on the surface of the planet. Not only this, but headquarter buildings can be snapped together directly within the tool or with an intuitive user interface. One of the other major innovations with the planet tech has been the ability to modify the terrain mesh and flatten areas of terrain. Previously, that's we actually were at the cool. Tech. The train when it came to designing our buildings, which is why our outposts had to be built with stilts and placed in naturally flat areas of the planet. Now we can build much more natural buildings with walls and entrances connected directly to the planet's surface. Yeah, that's actually also, pretty pretty cool tech that they can do that. Much wider range of locations. We believe our new outposts inject a refreshing new location experience into Star Citizen. They're organic, warm, personal spaces that really convey the age and history of humanity's expansion. Kind of looks like Daymar, this. The new art style, the focus from design on gameplay, and the flexible, modular approach to their construction will allow us as developers and you as players to be part of creating a wider variety of rich and satisfying experiences for every outpost the player comes across. Okay, cool. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Joel. That was awesome. <laughs> okay, cool. And moving on, we're actually going to talk to Corey now, uh, who is going to give us kind of a deep dive into the creation of uh, the artifact, which was actually kind of our first little glimpse of the uh, Hadesian culture from Hades system. Thanks, guys. I'm Corey Bamford, lead props artist at Fallen Crew <laughs> Games. I'm here today no specifically shot, to talk bro. about the Hadesian artifact that you'll see <laughs> in the walkthrough. Every fucking time. So we knew early on we wanted some sort of MacGuffin for the walkthrough. Um, we originally had a few ideas of what that could be. Originally, it was either going to be a tablet fragment, a sculpture, or a Hadesian artifact. So initially, the concept team explored a variety of ideas. We used a lot of reference for existing alien artifacts in the game, as well as reference from the real world. You know, lots of tomes and ancient kind of Egyptian stuff as well. Just all sorts of really reference. Just to Literally, get one guy just, just types exclamation mark, we we wanted give to way, and every form fucking of guy power technology spends give away. Asset. It's too we also knew we wanted it to have some sort of symbolism and text. So once the every, concept every fucking channel on further Twitch. on these ideas, they then presented those back to Chris, and we narrowed down the selection of assets until we had a candidate that everyone was happy with. So once we had this asset in mind, it then came down to turning that from a concept into a production asset, and that's where the props team comes in. When a prop artist gets a concept like this, immediately the wheels in their head start turning, and they're trying to figure out the best way to implement it in our game engine. They need to find solutions within the engine to achieve the visual target of the concept. I'm not gonna lie though, Obviously, that it's artifact not as as just taking the concept actually looked really damn good. About the shaders, we have to think about like the model the looked really damn good. Our, our job really is to find a solution within the game engine to achieve the visual target of the concept. Once we've figured out a strategy for achieving the look, we begin to actually make the content. So for the artifact, for example, we knew that it needed to be split into three segments and they needed to fit together. The first thing we do is get a placeholder into the game for the design team to actually implement as an entity. We also then figure out how the scale actually works in the player's hand uh, and when they inspect it. For the artifact, there was a bit of back and forth between the size because we wanted to get a balance between it having prominence and also being easily carryable. After we figured out the size of the asset, we then need to actually break down how we're going to make it. So the first thing we really get into is the material. We know that this asset is made of a few different materials. Firstly, we have the stone with the complicated glowing pattern. We also have these large copper structures and some smaller, thinner metal structures as well. For this asset, we knew we'd need to use unique textures just because of the amount of detail we wanted to achieve. One of the biggest challenges we had was making sure that the stone looked really good. To create the stone, we started with some scan data of rocks and concrete, as well as some mesh data like curvature. We also used a lot of procedural noises from Substance Designer just to add some variety. Using the height map as a jumping off point for the rest <laughs> like, of the like a phone, like, hello? It's quite a nice logical and physicalized way of doing things. It took quite a lot of iteration to get And only three right. people can call effort. with each other. The glow was probably the trickiest part of this asset. We ended up actually using a shade that some of you might remember from the Vandal Driller trailer. We created the iconography using a bespoke texture mask 
and then the circles were derived from some cells within Substance Designer. We took these cells, quantized them, and then got the edges of that quantization to create the rings. And then we used a procedural mask as well as some hand-painted textures to mask out that glow. Once we were happy with this texture, we multiplied that onto the height map, which is used to drive Dude, the glow threshold. The look glow at has three how many inputs, fucking layers are on that, te- an animated on glow that map, artifact. Which it's... is sort of used to drive the background effect of the glow. There's also a gradient it's crazy, which dude. colors that map. Finally, we have the actual pulse itself, which is the texture map that pulses across the asset. Next up is the bronze. This was actually pretty straightforward to achieve. We didn't need any fancy shader effects for this one, just a standard set of unique textures. We dude, wanted to get this is... nice scratches <laughs> and aging on the on the bronze. And in the concept, this is crazy. Also this it's nice like effect on the edges where the metal I, 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 I saw like so like 30 layers well already. More distinctive feel. That's for one model. Once we were happy with the visual look of the asset and engine. It then was just a case of wrapping it up. We needed to create LOD meshes for the object, as well as collision proxies. As you can tell, quite a lot of work goes into these hero assets. So that was a little bit of exploration into how we created the Elysian artifact for the walkthrough. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to me I talk d- about it and enjoy the rest of the I trip. don't even want to know how many so textures there are for like a ship. We thank you for your time. We wanted to uh, like how many layers. introduce Pyro and show all the hard work that all the teams have been working on and uh, working towards. The team has put in a, a lot of hard work in building the Pyro system, building the AI, building coming uh, to you tomorrow. The planets, the worlds, and that you'll in three point fifteen. So Pyro will be ready when server meshing is, and it will be coming out with Star Citizen Alpha four point oh. So on behalf of myself, I want to thank Dave and Ian, and uh, yourselves for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Uh, it will panel, come out when server meshing is ready, boys. Con. See you in the verse. Oh boy. It will come out when server meshing is ready. Oh my lord. Oh boy. Ready to wait another two years, boys? I'm not. nine what do you mean we're already waiting we're already on 3.14 we're already on alpha 3.14 That carrot does not move that way. No way. Also, why would... Why would the anvil carrot be there if the Pisces is right next to it? Why did you unload the Pisces then? You could have just opened the, the ramp. You could just open the ramp and... Let that dude out. Right, it's burning a hole in your pocket? Didn't think so. Something tells me, though, you got a pile of junk in that hangar of yours. Turn that crap into scrap at Dumper's Depot. Old Zeke always pays top grid for all your used gear at any of my verse famous franchise locations. From Art Corp. To Crusader. Stop on by and tell them Zeke sent you. I know, right? From thrusters to mining lasers, power plants to shield generators, we got your back. Dumpers Depot, because everything is valuable to someone. Dumpers Depot LLC is not responsible for inaccurate appraisals. Commercial service and delivery fees will apply. Space is cold and unforgiving. Only the toughest survive here. But even the toughest outlaw has a sensitive side. He doesn't have to show it to everyone. 
Because with your very own Moby Horizon, you have peace, freedom, relaxation, and your very oh, private oh. emotional retreat always with you. Welcome to your very own Moby Horizon. The use of Moby Horizon can be addictive. If in doubt, consult a licensed physician. What the hell? A distress beacon is triggered, and a quick reactionary force from the lead expeditionary is mobilized. Roger, boss. Albatross flight prepare for drop. One minute out. Loadmaster talking. Dropping ramp. Utilizing state-of-the-art technology, highly trained professionals arrive with it Albatross flight, 30 seconds. Camera team, now we're up. Rolling on three. Prepared to deliver justice in even the most remote reaches of the verse. Execute, execute, execute. Camera team is rolling. Last man, camera team down and safe. Roger, last man. Albatross breaking off. Elite Expeditionaries got your back. We need a fucking trailer, boys. <laughs> we need a commercial to show up at one of these citizen cons for our organization. Man, we need one of these commercials for ourselves. Here at Kelto, we have one simple goal to oh, it's bring board you the gamer. items you need quickly and easily. We've got everything you need: food, drinks, toys for the little ones, guns for the wife, all inside one guns store. For the wife. Just walk inside to begin your astronomical savings. Using yeah, you missed mobile, everything, dude. Technology and machine learning. We know exactly what you've picked up and have already charged you. Want something hot and ready to go? How about hot dogs, nachos, or burritos, Kelto? We've even got the latest in Gemini ballistic weapons. <laughs> this like is the board gamer. LMG featuring an explosive rate of fire that tops over 1,000 rounds per minute. It's the best light machine gun you can get in a convenience store. Looking for something a bit smaller for the kids, we also carry the Gemini LH86 pistol. Perfect for those small hands. So come down to Kelto today for quality products at low prices. Yeah, you missed everything, dude. Come to Kelto. Come to Kelto. Hey, like, they showed off the entirety of Pyro and, like, three, yearly three playthroughs of, of how to steal an artifact of what Star or buy is one. On its way to become. As usual, I'm your host, Jared sure, Huckabee. Could be. So, what is CitizenCon? When it started in 2013, it may have had its humble roots in Sandy just wanting some place to bring folks together and a solid excuse for Ben and Pete to watch the Wing Commander movie in a theater in Austin, Texas. But as with all things Star Citizen, it grew each year to become a full day of activities, most recently held in Manchester, England in 2019. Now, with a hiatus in 2020 due to the pandemic and our desire to remain diligent and responsible in 2021, CitizenCon is back as something slightly different this year. Now, while it won't be the same without seeing all of you in person and worrying if your plastic bag helmet is safe or not, uh, we hope this year's event brings with it a similar sense of community and interaction as our developers present to you their continuing efforts in, in uh, bringing Star Citizen's future to the present. And I'm gonna let's do a summary video on everything showed here. Saw with a look at we just took at the pyro system. Maybe. Now, I've always said it, and I'll continue to always say it. We get better with every one of these things we do. Whether that's planets, I might uh, spaceships, ex might or export, anything else in between. Uh, and with this the stream from Twitch got our to first YouTube. true look at some of the new uh, planets and moons, the process of converting our existing space stations into new outlaw variants, uh, but I might taking those end colonial up making outposts multiple that you've been seeing before from concept to amazingly detailed reality, and uh, perhaps most excitedly, planetary AI nav mesh in action with a 24-hour day-night cycle that will truly bring these worlds to life 
and provide that. Yeah, I completely forgot about that. The AI walking outside, that's those multiple mesh. different ways you can go about achieve, achieving your objectives. Completely forgot and, about that. Uh, for those of you who were wondering, yes, that was really Pyro 3. That was a real outpost and our real mission. No sandworms here. That's what's coming to Star Citizen and a whole lot more. No sandworms here. Oh, because I'm a, the patron saint of bad ideas, let's take a Is look at some of the comments that came out on Twitch. that about their old Citizen we Con with the Lear system? This should be good. Uh, Ngeon says, using talent from across the globe, that's a good thing. I agree. Uh, Adderoth says, this guy is talking like it's been made. <laughs> uh, DFX2KX says, they probably have the gameplay, but they want to force folks to stick around and watch the whole thing before they show it. Yeah, exactly. Annoying, but typical for them. We are who It we was are. all made, made just for the demo. Uh, Rolana says, Like the sandstorm coming in and all that. And chat. The sandworm. Under Fern says, that was all made just for I wouldn't demo. buy a melty dog from that man. I don't know if they're talking about Todd Pappy or Ian Leyland, but agreed. Uh, lots of people said, 420 Space Weed Vape Nation Damp 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 Dank. Is he going to say bald too? Uh, Gaming <laughs> Fortis says, just remember, he's more scared of you than you are of him. That's the truth. <laughs> And then everyone went on a claim spree for a while. Uh, James Cameron, yes, the real James Cameron, he does exist. And then finally, uh, Shorty Max said, number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. The last thing you'd want in your Burger King burger is someone's foot fungus. But as it turns out, that <laughs> might be what you get. Wise words, always. You can always rely on the Twitch community. And said said no one ever. You may have noticed a selection of community-created videos throughout the day, ranging from commercials to skits to a variety of things in between. Those are all here as part of an effort by our fantastic community team that started months ago to include as many of you in today's festivities as possible. And while we can't show every single one that was sent in, the team did expand their original idea of just 15 videos to a whopping 42 for today's show. So you're gonna see a few more as the day progresses. Now, of course, CitizenCon wouldn't be CitizenCon without the swag. Check that out, huh? Yeah. And this year, we've got it coming in two shapes and sizes. First up is the digital goodies pack seen here, which comes with the newly minted Arden SL Balefire suit you may have seen recently on Inside Star Citizen with that slick Theta Geo helmet. Uh, it's got the matching oh, Balefire look at that, uh, statue because accessorizing it's the, is always important. It's a part and of that artifact. Classic Citizen Con 2951 trophy, which I'm still trying to convince looks like a, like team the artifact. to turn into a bludgeoning weapon. Just say red one one more time, people. Now, these will all be distributed Monday to all backers. So if you've been Monday already, huh? so far and decide to back the project today, you'll get it along with everybody else on Monday. Now, over in Meat Space... No, fuck that. It should have been given up just before Citizen Con. Bag, fuck the people that only buy it on the ticket. hype. <laughs> We're doing a swag box for, that you can purchase on the RSI store. Uh, for the collectors out there, I. it's got three brand new Star Citizen pins to add to the collection, as well as an individually numbered challenge coin that says there are many like it, but this one is yours. Now, both collector's items come in a neat box and bundled with stickers that you can place all over the place, like Steve Bender's desk. I know. There's <laughs> no C2 in there. Not going to buy it. Now, the swag bag made box is available now on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And we've also got some contests and giveaways going throughout the day, uh, starting with this Astro Gaming Headset Contest where folks hosting their own CitizenCon watch parties have an opportunity to submit images on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag SCWatchParty to win Dude, a custom-painted Zeno Threat headset. looks senior. so small. Whether your party is at home or at work or if you're Captain Richard in his car. And for those of you who don't do social media, we're also giving away some Toby Eye, Tractor, uh, Toby Eye Trackers on Spectrum today in a short story contest. So tell us about some incredible moments you've had in person with your fellow citizens and win a Toby Eye Tracker. How many Check people are going to put a story up there about 30Ks? No, uh, I don't have Any one bets? of those to show you. 
because as somebody said, I don't give things back. How many people will put stories now, up there about 30 Ks? about the day's activities. We just completed our life in the verse or life in pyro presentation. Up next, we've got ship talk where you'll learn about the latest and greatest in spacecraft coming to Star Citizen. Then we got Gen 12 and the multi-core Vulcan, where we'll take you Fuck through yeah. some of the new technologies that will unlock Star Citizen's ultimate performance potential. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Uh, crafting Worlds, which offers a brief look at some of the new tools I was having this great fucking story on Star Citizen. Those wonderful Huge battles. We just saw. It was hookers, uh, it was drugs, it was everything, and it was got a 30k into our entire story. Got a look at the no story of gone. expanding Star Citizen out to the breadth and scope we all want it to reach. Uh, the Sounds of Space, which for my money... It's the sleeper presentation of the day. Uh, don't miss out. It looks at the new tools that will unleash our sound designers from the constraints of yesterday's okay. outdated processes. Okay. And then finally, systemic gameplay and the stream of thought. An entirely silent presentation where Tony beams his brainwaves directly into your skull through the TV. Provided, of course, you have your SGS brainwave amplitude receiver. You all have your SGS brainwave amplitude receiver. Don't you? We'll figure it out later. Basically, it's a big, long day of Star Citizen presentations and infos. That pyro presentation alone was like an entire season of ISC just crammed into a single day. Which makes me think, can I take the rest of this quarter off? I can. I cannot. I cannot. All right. Well, if you this end up missing gun, any man. part of the show or just want to watch it again, each presentation will be going up on YouTube later today in glorious 4K. Oh, fair warning. Thank fuck. Do not look directly into Todd Pep Todd Peppy's eyes in in 4K. Thank fuck. That means I can actually just download those videos and not and have to download the entire the live stream. It's time to throw it If I want to make separate videos. Today. Ship talk with Paul Jones, John Crew, and Ben Curtis, where they'll be well they're where they'll be discussing a uh, ship you know. A uh, ship you don't know, and a ship you weren't supposed to know, but you ended up did knowing. It's not invisible any longer. Here's Four, the 400 eye. All right. Through unforgiving lands. New ships. Across the impossible expanse. This is the 400 eye, probably. A distant oasis. Yeah. We chase what most consider myth. Honestly, dude, this ship looks really damn good. Pursue the Origin Four Hundred I. I really like That's it. That's what pushes us to greatness. The Oasis. It's real. It's like a formula, it's like a car commercial. The 400i by Origin Jump Works. Hold on. Did I just see a little elevator in the front for like a bike? It had a little elevator for a bike in the front. What the hell? Pretty cool, right? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So we we made the 404 yeah, in the it was, end. It was a ruse all along. It was a real <laughs> ship. So. But cool, uh, I yeah. like it. Uh, those trainers are always super cool to see the the artwork from both yeah, your teams. Who would have really thought that the 400 that the well, 404 would have been the 400 yeah. I? Not so me. We should probably get on with the show. Uh, this is Ship Talk, uh, where we are going to talk about a variety of things today. Uh, my name's John Crew. I'm the vehicle director here at CIG. Uh, I'm Ben Curtis, and I'm the vehicle art director at CRG. And I'm Paul Jones, art director. So the, the 400i, it's a Constellation competitor. We've got a few of these ships in this category across the board. We have the Constellation, we have the Corsair, and now we have the 400i. And the 400i Corsair, boy! Few, <laughs> interesting features that makes it uh, a compelling choice over the others so 
being an origin ship, it's obviously very visually sleek and fast, but also it can carry cargo and a, a vehicle at the same time. Size-wise, there's obviously a big gap in the range. Uh, we have the, the 100 series at the start, so it jumps up to the 300 series. Then there's the big jump to the 600 series and then another jump to the 890. So finding a space for this was, was fairly easy size-wise. I think it fills the gap quite nicely. So in terms the of the process, um, uh, normally what happens is we, you know, we, we assign it to one concept artist and we start the ball rolling. So it's really just a, a game of sort of exploration at this point. You know, it's fast and loose. You know, we always have a timeline uh, for each yeah. concept. And so it's, uh, you know, the pressure is always on. Basically. It's like a cutlass. Uh, it doesn't matter how many ships we've done. There's always that pressure to get it done and hit and hit the sort of key points. And so at this point of exploration, it's really sort of uh, loosey-goosey in terms of figuring out ideas, looking at shapes, looking at silhouettes and sort of not locking yourself into uh, a line of thinking. It's basically, you know, we'll look at different ships. So we'll, some will be more influenced by the 600i, some more by the 100i. Is this another email from Horizon? And then we'll Horizon? sort of do a mix no. and match. And so, like I said, sometimes you don't quite hit it on that, on that sort of, you know, I think like right at the yeah. beginning. Yeah, when, when you've got like a, a well-established manufacturer, it's, it's really beneficial because you, you kind of, you know, you have that, to pull from but you also don't want to get into the point where it's just a scaled down 600 or a scaled up do you know what i mean you kind yeah. of like you don't want them all just to look like the same ship just slightly different variants yeah uh, so i think the 400 is um it certainly stands out within the lineup but it's clearly an origin ship and i think yeah. it's i mean because we we sort of follow the man, you know sort of car manufacturers don't we in mm. terms of so it's got two decks the brand it's sort of expanding the brand three sort of three decks also develops over time so we have like a but double a bit... yeah you know since the start of the project origin is sort of slightly changed actually its style a little no bit. two decks two um, decks and then like say yeah you don't want to you don't want just a mini 600 yeah even though there's a part of me that would just be like, right, let's do a mini 600. I do really like the 600. Like, yeah, 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 the 600. Yeah. Down. And even that, even Looks at pretty this dope, point, though. I kept sort of coming back to one original sketch that had been done for the, oh, what was it? I think it was 100. Yeah. I. It was a little thumbnail. And, you know, it's literally, in my head, it's about that big. And the sketch is just teeny weeny. I was like, I kind of want a version like this. This looks kind of cool. And and so basically, in the end, I just went in and and kick bashed um, some ideas together. So this was, this was before my time on the ship team. So it's quite interesting oh, really? to, to learn a bit more about the the process. I, I went, yeah, a lot of the, it's a great ship. It's my favourite <laughs> one, Paul. In that case. <laughs> a lot of the uh, the little concept thumbnails get. If you see one, because we often show them in Jump Point magazines afterwards mm -hmm. after a ship's being released, you see all the early sketches, and people probably noticed like that 100 eye uh, mm. thumbnail that we did that was rejected for the 100 yeah. but then has come around for this and you never know what might happen with ones that we didn't choose for this one yes Could yes in the they might appear in future ships so ultimately this was this is what uh you know that second like one in the top one, left so it's you know it's that looks like a, a like a cutlass black uh, what we call kit bashing from different it's literally models, a cutlass because number two as an art director, you've always got. It feels like you've got zero time to get yeah. to get a result. So it's how do you get? Oh, uh, check this real quick. Provide a visual that people can understand <clears throat> in the uh, shortest time possible. And so my understanding of the ship was it was a luxury, a luxury explorer. Yeah. And so you can see here that that's why there's a swimming pool in there, and a and a deck. You know, part of the process is that we show it to Chris Roberts. Uh, to get sort of direction and feedback and chris was quite adamant that this this was going to be you know an, an explorer it wasn't it yeah. wasn't just you know, uh, a, a small scale party ship it was you know it needed to have a function yeah. it needed to be a competitor to that scale it, and, at and first it ship. did look like a yacht yeah, we did quite a lot of interior investigations and it it, um, it looked like a party ship sort of when i saw the leaks looking at ways of arranging looked like another 890 but ship, smaller like I said earlier even though the ship looks big, it's actually really tight. Like it's like yeah. it's a lot harder than you think to achieve everything that now Star Citizen would expect to have in their ships. And 
yeah. all the components and all the fun this is the one we first saw sort of two decks the other one like one deck that stretches most of this also th this one's also one of the yeah, leaks that we should that was that we uh that yeah. we saw maybe one day you'll get maybe you'll get the cool, you'll get cool one day. so in terms of this process what happens is we finish the concept or what we what we think is finished and then get chris stein off do a couple of paint schemes and then it Jump passes over to yeah. at your department. Yeah, so so from the concept, um, normally you know the we'll kind of take it as quickly as possible in, into the editor, and that just allows us to um, kind of really get a good sense of the space from from the player and making sure that um, you know everything that we think we need is actually going to fit, um, making sure the components go through, and like like we were saying earlier. A lot of time is um, what a ship starts off with its kind of um, paper design. It, you know, it's they already design put it out like a point where we're actually on sale kind of, on the pledge uh, store. Working on the ship, the requirements can change. That might, you know, that's not just because because it's you know, probably going to add this and add that to it. it it's going to be uh, on sale done in the game. We've realised that today. You know, a certain ship item, you know, a certain size shield might not be suitable for it anymore, or um, it might be just that. Yeah, we. Think, well, actually, yep, it's for it'd sale. Be great if we could fit the X1 in it because it's kind of the perfect mm. ship for it. Um, but that wasn't, like I say, on the, the original plans. So, yeah, I mean, like like you're saying, the, the ship is kind of hard quickly. to split with its, its two floors. So, we it's we already kept sort of all of engineering already on sale. and cargo and storage and everything downstairs still. So, and then the kind of 266 the, the space is all upstairs with the, the bridge, obviously. Ugh. Once we kind of get that white box in game, we then start just making sure that Crazy expensive. Um, we can fit everything in we need. We also, that's uh, the point that we kind of really start internally showing that ship to everyone that, that yeah. is invested in it, and, and you know, including Chris and um, you know, everyone that, that needs to Yeah, 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 true, true. You and can ship up Chris. One of the kind of things that Chris was really keen for, although he didn't want Looks really to damn nice, though. a kind of luxury party ship, he did want it to feel origin. I think originally we had like the lift. Again, this is smaller, try not to this is the price for it. Yeah. <laughs> there was just two hundred and sixty six dollars. Small platform uh, just for the crew that went straight up into Yeah. yeah. In, in, into I mean that nose. whole area was quite tricky, wasn't it? Because there yeah. was the There you go. Um, docking ring the docking collar. Yep. Yeah. The lift. Yeah. And then there was a an entrance to the front and an entrance to you the had, back. You had yeah, originally I think on the concept you, you walked in through the docking collar. Um Oops. and like you say the floor was a lift, you had the collar on the side and then doors either side which took you to like a little antechamber that had the suit lockers in, yeah, I think it was. At the front room. Yeah. It might and actually end up being a ship yeah, that the, the, I buy. The first feedback from Chris was the entrance doesn't I really feel very honestly, grand for an origin ship. I honestly um, really do like it. Kind of introduced the, the stairs and the, the kind of like the big not marble staircase, but that that sort of idea that you were kind of. I really like, do you know, like like the ship. The ship felt a little bit more grand. That had some knock-ons to the the kind of interior space as well, because. So I might buy it in game. Yeah, you know, obviously making a, a one person or two person lift is something that's that's relatively. Small. What the fuck? It's, it's, the it's volume the suddenly space. went down. Um, but when you've got a set of stairs, didn't even do anything. Bit, or need to have yeah, a fuck decent it. height change. Um, that requires a lot more space. So what we ended up doing was kind of opening up. This first chamber you walk into. Yeah, right you're more like like rooms, Drake, kind of Misk, kind of Argo type of type of dude, type of type of guy. Um, Basically anything does, that doesn't look that like smooth and nice now. you know yeah. Yeah. fancy. For you, it has to look like very industrial. Yeah. It ha it needs to be, yeah. it needs to look uh, one, like lived in. But yeah, mo most of them, if they've got a ramp, it's, it's like... Yeah, I get you, I get you. It's, it's pure function yeah. and, and not really... No, I think of... you guys done a good I got you. Because it was, pretty... it was tricky. Yeah. yeah. I remember it at the time when you feel the time pressure. And, and then it was, it was when I was just starting on the team as well. So I was like coming in and be like... Oh, what did, what I kind of hope they put the volume like, up again. Oh, go? But it also, I mean, it's also nice because it sort of dovetails with that original sketch, which mm. has... There's an element there in that oh, thumbnail. Is there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I think... At the time, I sort of binned it off because I was yeah. just like, I don't like. I'm sure I had some thoughts about it. I mean, everybody knows I've got a sort of 64 kid at memory, so stuff kind of like gets lost yeah. after a short amount of time. But um, I think we did discuss it. But then, yeah, it's just like, no, let's just let's just go, let's go simple. But yeah, yeah, you guys did did good stuff. Yeah, and then, then the next thing to tackle, like Paul was saying, was um, the, the kind of like the addition of the bike garage. Um, it it 
I really do like it in 400 I. Kind of fit that in. And the original plan that, that you, know, you can see is originally we were six year old AC Cobra or a modded Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet, I bet dude. Um, it, I wonder what those other two new ships are that they're going to show. I think one of them might be the Argo Raft, which is an Argo carrier. The other one, I've got no clue. But yeah, the other one might be the Argo Raft. Drive your bike onto this platform. Get off your bike, send the bike up, run around to the front of the ship, run up the stairs. Yeah, and, and the and stairs then just look at your bike. Opening just... isn't exactly like a super quick thing, so yeah. if you, you yeah, know, it just felt yeah. kind of like in terms of flow. Yeah, yeah it's like oh, it's... I need to quickly quickly get off planet, and you're like oh, I'm click that right, okay, yeah, send that up. Oh, but man, pyro, up, yeah, okay, yeah. oh, pyro later, looks so later, damn good. You're in the seat ready to fly. And like I say that was one of the, the issues we kind of hit, and then the other, oh, I, I guess, um, issue was it just. It started eating into the cargo space, so it meant that you couldn't. Once you had the cargo fully loaded, there was very little space for you to kind of traverse around the um, the cargo hold. Basically, you know, we we had a number of kind of ideas we played with, and then uh, if you click on, yeah, we ended up um, basically that elevator there is the pretty ship. pretty cool. Now the nose, should we call it the nose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the nose now opens up, and it's got like a nice little kind of dedicated X one garage in there. It's a nice use of that kind of spine yeah, that was there originally. Yeah, there was nothing um, really. The, the gravity drive was there, yeah. but we kind of nudged that back a bit. Um, and I guess the mounts to the guns, but they they kind of were still tucked out to the side a little bit. So yeah. yeah. So they've got an X one. So yeah, like you say, it had the gravity platform. There and it had like an X one garage. Weird that you had to go through. But the X one is not yeah, in game yet. To get your suit. And yeah. Then back as far out. as I know. Yeah. So yeah, taking up that space was because that is the uh Alpo and Nox. The really good thing is all the controls for getting a new ship and doing this, they're all on right, right platform next came down at the end. That's a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. if if the animations the sync kind of like, up uh, correctly, the, the, the like I say the nice things of it is is you know you can I guess ride up to your ship. They've just not synced up in in up a PU for the C two. Yeah, there's no messing around. Um, so yeah, that was one of the other challenges. And then, to be honest, most of the the rest of the ship kind of went pretty much to to plan in terms of you know what was on concept i don't think there was any kind of real surprises so you know, yeah now is, is your end of the ship and you come really into, damn nice the main body you're into engineering this ship does have large shields yes yeah. yeah so that was that was another thing to make it different um obviously we've made changes whilst during development to other ships and shields have changed so it's not quite as unique as it was um but it's still very well shielded for its size uh, and the other cool thing about engineering is those rooms at the edge are cool cool yeah uh, they're climate controlled so uh, it's another nice little thing to play with gives all the teams so something have some full, extra full dry ice and everything full, full dry yeah, ice yeah you can get the come in and the out light sticks out and, and flow out a yeah. little bit of party mode in there yeah <laughs> but yeah um i think that's it that was one of the things i think you established early on in the concept was, was this kind of like cool chamber in engineering yeah because we needed that space i yeah. mean you need space to put all the components somewhere and we just thought well, let's just turn it into a feature yeah so i think they'll actually the uh show the 400i uh, well, I, uh, I think it's going to be there with ie and, and then yeah kind of from engineering you kind of go straight to so you can probably rent one in game storage check it out i don't know if you know the scu size off offhand but um not off the top of my head now. No. no. Should, you can should probably put that in the notes. Press. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so you can put a decent amount of storage in there. You've also got the escape pods. One of the other things we were doing when we were looking at this space with the bike is originally we were kind of, if we put the bike in this area, it meant that the storage would do. So we were looking at kind of other ways of moving the storage around. At one point we thought, oh, we could put it out in the wings, but then that didn't really make sense because, you know, ideally in the wings where you saw your fuel and that sort of yeah. stuff and, and it just felt really awkward yeah. where this kind of gives us the kind of classic traditional big block of cargo yeah big block of it cargo it can't have a vehicle in it can't you yes it, yeah you know, um you can fit a cyclone in there yes and other, other smallish vehicles okay yeah like, obviously it will take away your cargo space, your cargo yeah. space so it's not a cyclone you can do it so no ursa okay cargo, so. yeah it's like what and 120 then, yeah, scu three man three crew Bridge, yeah, bridge. Um, and yeah, it's it's you know it's very. I think 120 me, SU. Bridge, it's, it's very origin. It feels, Give or take. Um, you know, very very sleek. Um, get a real nice view of the 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 kind of front of the ship out in front of you. 
um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice place, and it's got the classic kind of Origin uh, kind of HUD, and, and you know, we haven't got any low-tech screens, it's all kind of projected. And I'm looking at Discord, and yeah, that's true. Um, Does that mean you can see there's a lot ships of announced that Citizen Con will come, uh, will come with LTI. Yeah. So I was keen to get those, that sort of, it's almost like a like the black louvers yeah and then get everything sort of because they're, they're one of the things that we we kind of kept referencing back during the production was like let's just go back and have a look at the 600 because that's one of the again one of those kind of shapes that really sells origin mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. and yes yeah, so then uh, again lti is more of like oh, a buzzword yeah, also, uh, my c2 origin? has cool. 10 and a half years it's of cool. insurance Thank you. so again we've got the louvers yeah in the Ten and a half years. years. Like all the the bigger origin ships have this sort of arrangement of a single center seat and. I wouldn't really buy a ship just for LTI. Not even as an uh, not even to use it as an LTI yeah. token. And then habs wise, you kind of got the captain suite and you've yeah. got the the crew suite, and you know within those they've got their own kind of lockers, they've got their own kind of personal ship storage. I'm not sure if it's exact, but they're very similar in, in their kind of scale. But obviously, the captain gets the yeah. um, slightly more space, a little bit more kind of day in the TV, though. He's, he's the boss. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. A, at one point, it was a, a four person ship, and then they reduced it down to three. So, we've got that extra space for the. Oh, see, I'm learning loads of stuff. I didn't know about today. <laughs> lots, yeah. lots of things changed during <laughs> yeah. the concept. Like changing it from four to three might sound like a quick thing on paper, but then it's like you're leaving a seat out the bridge somewhere. Uh, yeah, you lose even lockers. You tough lose to fit an extra seat in that bridge, though, because it would have yeah, yeah, yeah. you would have had to have kind of had them two banks. So it would have been a bit, yeah, 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 just just purely visual. Sort of, it feels a little bit nicer weighted if it's. If I mean, it's, the whole shape has a essentially a triangle. It looks fast. Yeah, yeah. 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 It looks fast. Yeah. And then, yeah, as you kind of progress through to the rear of the ship, um, this is where, like I say, originally it was it was the party time. Yeah, it was the party room. Yeah, we've we've kept some of the elements i guess you know there's still a kitchen a, a decent yeah, sized kitchen a, it's still a nice space isn't it do you know what i mean it's like luxury it's still yeah. that sort of luxury yacht you've got your wine fridge kind of so feel, isn't yeah it? yeah, so, yeah you've got every, every i know dude there, you've got your food maker you're right you've got your breakout area and then yeah. your big hollow table at the back yeah and, and, and that was sort of like the um i guess like the operations area and we kind of we, we tried to make that place feel like um it was a little bit more focused with the, the hollow table than the sort of you know the, the breakfast bar that, that's just in front of it and um i think having because we tried quite a few different ideas there as well actually i remember at one point we had like a war table with, with seating and stuff but that was yeah. a bit tight for kind of maneuverability yeah. and also i think um it we ended up going with like the standing kind of hollow table rather than a seating one because when you first kind of like look at it it felt like an extension of the um, relaxation area rather than like a kind of planning you know what, what we're going to do in our operation type area and then yeah basically that that kind of covers most of the 400 i guess as a, a whole anvil liberator this is new so we'll move from the 400 i to something a bit bigger um and something entirely new which is the anvil liberator which is what is Anvil's this latest design spaceship which is purely for transporting ships. So huh. we want to do something properly uh, and sort of provide that entry-level spaceship for that career. If you want to be a, a ship hauler, then... A ship hauler, huh? Provides that good foundational base for it. It's a fairly regular sort of process on this one, as Jared and I have chatted Is that one already in there? You know, these ships are often described as is births, you know, easy births, hard births, difficult births. Um, I think this one was a fast birth. It's been a while since we've worked on some Anvil stuff, so in terms of the lineup, you know, we have the Anvil Blast, Liberator, the Hurricane, Valkyrie, you know, it's probably more sort of, you know, it's one of those larger ships. Then we've got the Carrick. Yeah. So a lot of work has already been done for those ships, and we've got, um, you know, we've got. That's going to be used kids. as a carrier 100%. So in terms of a concept process. Uh, Yo, what's up, dude? It's it's smoother sailing. The and Anvil Liberator looks like know, like people are going to use that for as a carrier. Uh, it's that it's that investigation, and you know each manufacturer has a sort of anything interesting, dude. You've missed so much interesting stuff. 
slightly the uh, you missed yeah, so much the they spent like an hour on pyro like manufacturers change with time yeah, as well as they evolve. yeah it's not like every ship came out of exact same day exact <laughs> yeah same bought kind of cig kind of oh yes, boy yeah. imagine that it, was the I, thing i mean that's kind of what i like about star Citizen is we've got this sort of it's a sort of rolling kind of like design you know it's sort of design everything is being updated yeah. Yeah. it's going to be uh rebranded um, into uh you know it's nice the sims you know, star citizen edition narrative and they're like oh well, actually it was based on this old design yeah or whether it was it's a new stuff but yeah they spent like 40 One minutes of the early requirements were from john which you can they spent like 40 minutes on showing off pyro design in game art. and all that yeah yeah I'm liking looks it. so good like an entirely yeah, different game green, doesn't even look like star citizen but Basically, this is super easy for us, and also, you know, because we're working with a contractor about sort of laying out the limits of, you know, because we always, you know, we like to make ships big, you know, and, and so it's always okay. We've got our metrics, it has to fit within this. Like, Let's see if the Envil Liberator is already on sale. Yeah, it was, it was quite strict on the landing pad. It's side, on sale. You need to fit a number of ships in it. But also make sure that it really kind of stayed. Bro. Otherwise, John will give us yeah that, that big slap wrist. I'll so. come after you. Yeah, because um, on on that image there, you can see <laughs> there's the red box, which is the maximum bounds that the ship can be. If if you it's go crazy. inside that, it literally won't fit through the hangar doors yeah. and ceiling. So obviously it has to be in there, and that's a max, not a. Kyle, to did you see that price? Yeah, we've ended up in the past with ships that have we'll a get a price tag. clearance right, right at the edge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you're coming in and out of the hangar you just clip yeah as soon as you clip one side of it then it throws it into yeah. the other one yeah um, makes it just people are going to use this as a carrier 100 percent. extra small landing pads uh the green size so once you've got three of them so at this point in the the design brief it was just three extra small ships pretty the expensive you've got these three green and they're actually they have some no, z which i didn't put in pull here. up discord um, mm -hmm. By the time you've got these green blocks, you're like, you've got to have space for these. It's and crazy. You've also got to fit in this. Then you sort of start funneling yourself into. Yeah, and I shapes. think I mean you you know you provided uh, a reference image right at the start, which is of. And from the, the size I've seen, craft, yeah, with that picture the they've shown, I can't remember, it's the it can hold the like two. And so um, that was like, uh, I, I mean, people hornets straight away. The, oh, that looks the cool. Combination between the two you know, sort of influence. But it, you know, it also makes sense, right? You know what this it's reminds me of? I'd say it's a very functional ship. It's got a it? lower it deck. Like, like, say, obviously, the, the real life version has been made for that function, and this just kind of follows suit. Yeah, definitely. This reminds so, me of that uh, you know, U.S. Marine Corps hovercraft at some of our that can transport Abrams. Again, it's always, you know, it's quite different for uh, amphibious like invasions. That, that reference in yeah. It's basically that, but in space. Hovercraft. Because instantly it sits in your mind, yeah. and you sort of get, um, you kind of get sort of stuck in that thinking, and so you know part of my job is also to sort of push push the concept artists, and say right okay. Concept art looks fucking good this? though. What about that? I think you know, it's always a you know it's it's always a sort of you know, dual role. You know we sort of you know you work together and kind of you know two minds is always better than one right. So in in this case we're sort of looking at. You know, this is a sort of first first stab at it, so there's a lot of similarity with three gladiators, huh? So obviously Valkyrie engines. You know, it's it's pretty standard. It's just one one floor plate and it's symmetrical. Then we look at some cleaner stuff. It's not, you know. Yeah, see, it's, it's a nice design. They took it from the uh, United yeah, States Marine Corps uh, um, hovercraft. That can bring in uh, Abrams tanks for amphibious it's invasions. Cool. I like it. There's some, there's some interesting things. Certainly very hovercrafty. Yeah, yeah. I think just to, uh, too too simple. Kind of, too wedgy. Yeah. Let me see if I can this one was find a picture of it. version. You know, got that massive tank on the side. What it does, I'm not quite sure at this point, but it's you know it's just visual exploration. We've got the asymmetrical wings. This and, is what they. You know, sort of interesting stuff. What they use. At this point, we're starting to push. Uh. Um, this stuff into like terrapin territory so we've got sort of this is what they use as reference for that the bridge and it's kind of like got a, a cowl it's like a sort of see it's kind can of hold abrams tanks a little turtle head mm. for a terrapin and sort of mixing and matching and so you know it's kind of interesting again you know the, we're doing these things it does look so, good you know, has, has some pros i quite like design, it design wise well because obviously 
we have the XY yeah, metrics. That's what it's made for. Z. So but then from space. A lot of our hanger metrics are quite tall. Um, mm. So uh, the problem with this one was it was just to the height of the ship. Like the actual yeah. actual height it would have needed to be would have been double that. So then you end up with this really tall uh, bring up this score again. gangly mm, thing yeah. because we've also shortened it by a third. Space beaches. So, so like you're trying to get yourself in like, the shape of a ship. Ursa yeah, has, um, <laughs> And beaches. then here is like um, where we sort of start hitting upon something that um, I don't know where the decision was made, but you know it made sense to have the garages yeah. on that lower deck. Mm -hmm. Here, you know, you've got two tanks lying side by side. Which dude, this is honestly something that cool, I would save up good. for in game. Uh, isn't actually like an official, especially thing. as a corporation uh, point where that we specializes in the, uh, thing, security uh, and trying to get these. This would be to amazing work, to bring in vehicles. Three but then again, we've already so we changed it from the three we've already have like a C two, multiple C twos even. Pads, which basically take any single seat fighter in the game and some around. So I think a prospector also fits on there. Yeah. And then we scaled the the front one down to an extra extra small. So mm -hmm. that's things like the the Argo MPUV, uh, Origin eight five X, and smaller flying ships like that. But also interestingly. That extra extra small metric. I wonder when it's gonna to come into the into the game. Vehicle metric. There's there's like a meter difference yeah. in height, which is the ballista and nova. So we went from these three extra smalls uh, to two yeah. extra smalls on top. But then again, the kraken is like a one extra, extra a big command front, ship in and of itself. Garage slots, which can also. It's just like one of those things that only you know bring stuff from A to B. Yeah, you were playing around. You could fit quite a few combinations. And yeah. personally, I personally hope just that that thing, the Liberator, sure. cannot yeah, carry any SCU. Yeah, yeah. Because people would just buy it for for the SCU yeah, yeah, and not for yeah. vehicle I mean, storage I mean, or vehicle like transport. You know, like a ferry, you know, they're just full of the vehicles. It needs to be able to carry um, zero like SEU. Flying it, wasn't it? Like, you can, otherwise, <laughs> people are going to buy it, it like for yeah. other 15. purposes, it which it which it isn't for. Play around. So uh, you know, once we have a you know an exterior that we were happy with, then it's you know, then we move on to the interior, and you know it's only two crew. Yep. So it's, large it's docking crew. collar uh, too. You have obviously, the, the person flying the thing. Uh, and then the the second Damn. person who it's got the same dock and collar as like either, a uh, sort of like a hammerhead or an eight ninety. It's crazy. They can control. They can go sit in it and uh, shoot anything that comes at you. But it's not really a ship that's a combat ship. It's mm. it's a transporter ship. If you want protection, you need to bring protection with you, or rely on the ships that you're carrying to provide that protection. Which mm. is another benefit of this open topped. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Can just you come under launch. attack, yeah. everyone yeah. can launch that straight away. You're not having to fly your ships out one by one out of a tube. They, they can get off pretty quickly. Mm. Unlaunch tubes, yeah, maybe. One day. One day. One day, one day we do launch Oh tubes. boy, launch tubes. That'd be cool. Yeah. Bell Star Galactica <laughs> style. Think about that. Um, Shoot out fighters so, out the side. Yeah, basically, we've moved on to interiors. Again, it's, uh, it's just investigation of, um, you know, we've got our function and what it needs to achieve. But, you know, in the last what, two, four years, definitely the last two years, is like our process has just been a lot, a lot stronger in terms of player flow. So there's no more of the Starfarer, uh, Higgledy Piggledy. Myst mystery tour. I mean, that was our first <sighs> Thank fuck. cruise ship, so yeah. the pipeline wasn't in place. Starfarer was I mean, horrible. Interior was like... I don't know. So, Starfare I mean, interiors are terrible. Going on, so now it's like, okay, if I'm a player, a kitchen area like, too. What, what experience do I want? Yeah. Like, how do I get from this? This is really nice. I really like this. A to G to I actually H really like the ship. B. Yeah. None of that business. So, so as we look at these um, uh, interiors, Damn. we just sort of looked at sort of different flow, basically different ideas. So um, it feels quite good, and we sort of worked on again just flow. So if you're in it looks garage, way smaller than it actually is. From the garage, like when you see this, you can actually see how big this fucking ship is. You know the elevators just run the full height. Yeah, actual docking collar is same size as a hammerhead and the eight ninety, so you can actually dock to um, and so do space stations uh, with that. The whole process is a lot more streamlined, um, and there's even like even if you're in that top 
in those top rooms. I'm not gonna lie, I'm getting really interested in that ship. <laughs> it's a call to action, we've all gotta get out. Not like I'll get it with we real cash, but nice in-game, yeah. yeah. I'll side probably buy it in-game. So you can just park and run down, get in your... Which is really damn ship, good. And then off you go. So, a lot of... I feel like a lot of thought was given to just and, improve. And I think it, it's really nice as well, the fact that you've got, like I say, that, that passenger section kind of sectioned off, and they're always yeah. ready. But then, like I say, you were saying about like, the bowels of the ship and how that's that sort of, all that technical stuff's like hidden at the, the bottom, and that, that feels nice that that's crew only, and, and you know, because you don't want passengers just, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. just... Like, at the start, it looked so small, but... Moving on to, I can see here, the garage Damn. space and where the cargo is stored so originally that was, the cargo was going to essentially take up one yeah, of the garage spaces it was going to be a, a compromise choice that players could make of the, the yeah. cargo is stacked cargo so should not be in a garage the of the, it should the, the lower garage or across like one of the pads so you could choose uh, but then decide to uh, well we had a bit of space well yeah, of basically space uh, the concept guy when i went rogue <laughs> I was like, oh, what about this? This is cool. Like, yeah, yeah, it does look cool. Yeah, yeah. He's like, all right, John, can we have this? Come into a meeting. Oh, I've just uh, gone away and done this, uh, this, this thing that we're not going to talk about, but it's, it's turned <laughs> yeah. into. It's way bigger than it actually looks. Room, so yeah. It's, yeah. It's Especially when they showed off the internals for it. Save. <laughs> well, we want. I mean, it's massive. You know, for me as an art director, I want you know I want my team to feel like they can take those little forays off if they want if they've got a good idea. Um, and you know, luckily this time it's yeah. it's panned out, yeah, and makes good use of the space. I mean, because like you said, the ship is it is quite big. So then we get to the fun part, which is when we get into promo. Damn, and I think it's everyone's favourite part involved with this sort of stuff. And that is really sort of well, I call it selling the dream. So it's, um, you know, you're really sort of honing in into what a player's experience might be. Um, I think it's I, two I two things well, wide. So so here we've got you know, fully loaded carrier. And the uh, core of what that ship is for, like, you have these these smaller carri Looks carrier sick. born ships, is what Chris likes to call them. Like, they're they're not deep space fighters. They can't go long distances by themselves. They they need to be from a, a parent ship. So, the the Liberator is unless you suddenly got an Idris. To carry things with this is, this yeah, is, yeah. yeah this that's is something that could really be made could really be interesting for as a liberator like pyro you might be able to load your fighters onto there Stanton, already quite and big to go from one side to the other so to go from these ships to help you Stanton to pyro you might need a ship like that to carry your fighter like a gladius or an ant or a, uh, a hornet like he says be, I don't know, 50 100 I actually Cram in one of these, and I actually see it going to be really good use for this ship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Imagine yeah, ships I'm that are stranded in space. Someone to kind of get onto. Yeah. They're stranded. You can, you can go in, grab That's their ships, bring them to a station. Um, ship transport to its core, two man crew, designed for for hauling three spaceships and some ground vehicles, uh, long distance. Uh, hmm? No trailer cool. or commercial. Ah, the Banu Merchantman. Let's let's talk about the Banu Merchantman then. But no commercial uh, for the Liberator. Been for, for a long time. For a long time now. Fans of yeah, that's your favorite, huh? For the Banu yeah, Merchantman. We haven't really shown a. You actually gonna get that ship or? Original concept images. So. No, and I think um, you know, this is my second round on this, so I think maybe like. Three years ago, we did a we did an initial concept yeah. round oh, around the time of the Defender, I guess. I can't actually remember. So long ago. Yeah, yeah. it's been a while I'm since sure they talk about the Merchantman. So there's a few things that need to be updated for the Merchantman. Uh, obviously, we talked about this many times in the past. Uh, yeah, I bet. As in develops, things get added, uh, things get refined. We we improve our our workflow. So number one thing we had to do was look at the size and the scale of the ship because i think it was it was 160 meters wide and 160 meters long so this is god huge. damn yeah, yeah but it's a very tall ship as well yeah it? but it was it was very vague because we had never done a full interior 
layout so not not to like the new system no. yeah so we need to make sure it fit everything in so it's always a good starting point but um, no commercial for the, the liberator were, they've so, never really been changed uh, since they were it's a bit weird concepted as freight units not standard usually they at least have a scale commercial out for it we did it originally i don't remember freight units yeah. it, was, it was yeah it was a long, for my long time. time ago the marketplace slash bazaar yeah. uh, needs to have a good working out and then lastly uh, we want to have some synergy between the defender and the merchantman so we we found a way to get a defender hanger on board so defender so hanger for the ship so yeah, defender hanger on a merchantman i guess the thinking about it, it seems so it seems so long ago since i started on this damn um, but <laughs> anvil promo team is indeed slacking basically had the biggest impact in the end and it's just because because the defender is not a slim ship is it no it's, it's deceptively it's, big to me like the defender i always think in my head that it's this tiny little yeah. thing but it's, in fly it's, mode it's quite slim yeah but you know, then when it's landed it's got the sort of you know big stance. yeah the yeah. banu defender is a so, pretty damn um, big ship this has been uh, I, I can't i think i've probably been on this for maybe a year something like that now um, and but a Banu Defender we, Hanger? It's pretty We did an initial round bold. of concept work and it was sort of done more in isolation so we didn't really have uh, a full interior we sort of treated it more as okay we need a corridor we need a, an idea of a marketplace we need an idea of a bridge Banu um, Defender Hanger you know, yeah. We'll kind of sort of uh, piece them together and so that was maybe like three years ago something like that Obviously, process has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, as we discussed today, it's more about the player experience and the flow and things making sense. Less, less rule of cool. If we, if we still have the coolness, but you want it to work right. Yeah. You don't want it to be frustrating. I think, I think when when you kind of do it, like obviously this big ship, so you think, oh yeah, you know, we can make whatever room this size, and it'll be it'll be fine. But that kind of always sets us up for just a lot more headaches when it comes to to our side so by you spending the time to actually like fully flesh out the interior it just saves us so much time when we come to actually yeah, do the production yeah, side of it definitely. And kind of takes all that risk away from us and puts it up front onto onto you basically yeah. so thanks Paul. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, welcome. you're welcome i mean we've tried we've tried hard i mean you can see here that you know the ship did have to scale up yeah we talked about earlier, oh. those, those hanger metrics. Look at that scale, and dude. Scaled up it now. Oh. It doesn't fit the hanger yeah, metrics. So we'll, we'll, get to the, oh. we'll get to the solution in a little bit. Yeah. And just a quick shot of the front. And you can actually see that <sighs> from the front, it hasn't actually changed that much. You know, it's grown a little bit in height, but, you know, gained a little bit of body mass. Oh, yeah, it's overall pretty pretty similar i mean we've it's become you know, it's become sort of, a fat you know, fat girl that's for sure the ethos of this whole thing is you know the ship was really cool oh the thing's I huge really like the ship so yeah it's fucking it thick to change it just to change and it same. became even just thicker than it already was we do need to advance it um and so between myself concept artist mike oberschneider and mark gibson um one of the cig's designers we we basically met twice a week, every week for months, and basically gone through this ship from top to bottom, inside to out. There's, um, there's a huge amount. Of honestly, I like the remodel one better yeah, than the original. Yeah, and yeah. It, it needs to boot it to accommodate down, that defender. Yeah, true. You know, yeah, I actually I actually do like the the reconcepted version as well. I've not had a nervous breakdown. Actually, I wonder the, if they're the going to show like. Nice newly updated concept just, art for it the, or even better I think this is show it like, in game like an in-game model to, to begin with i was Maybe. really scared and then the, the kind of like the closer you've kind of got to finishing your work the kind of like the less scared i'm getting and the more excited i'm getting <laughs> and i'll probably have when we get into production i'll be like oh no what we're we gonna do and then it'll, then again once we kind of actually kind of get over that hurdle because it is, it is a it's quite an intimidating ship not not they probably put it on sale like, again yeah the, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, you've seen quick. here the sort of hangar Oh, look at that! Um, so basically, we've you know the one of the sort of design philosophies of the Banu um, ships is they they sort of incorporate tech where it suits. It's not on sale yet. They use tech from humans. They use tech from Xi'an. Um, whatever suits them. It's got a sort of so it's got a top hangar bay. Get so <laughs> your hard PP. So it's a lot of that um, levitation tech. 
stuff doesn't have to be physically connected to move sort of it sort of hovers and then and then shifts along so it's it's basically even there's a lot of opportunity for creativity so the hanger here you know it's always multi-part as well so it's always mm. kind of nice basically shot from the front this is with the, the front guns out oh that's the front the guns SA, that's yeah right. big big size eight guns size One eight the, guns the cool cool things with these pretty much almost all its weapons are two size eight away and forward you know, facing so guns non-threatening aura to start with and to put that into to, then perspective it's, it's gonna be quite a powerhouse the really, new like, uh the crusader it's, industries it's a ares proper, fighters it's a proper transform which are um class as capital ship killers they've got size sevens and again you know like it's got two times size eight with that kind of like oh you know it's crazy yeah just a friendly trader don't worry about me just going on my business and then size eight guns on a trading ship business so again sort of multi-stage animation for the guns again what the turret and i mean the turret featured in the original um you know there was a hidden they never really fully explained. No, no. There was a, a turret, a man turret there that you could get in and defend with, and it was man you know, like, turret as well. In, I guess you yeah, call. and when when you know when the weaponry is unmanned, it's a lot easier. You can get away with a lot of smaller spaces. Once you put a person in it, then it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, it's just a play of experience, and it's it's a you know twin twin gun. Twin, yeah, twin yeah. S5, so it's not giving you a little tickle, it's uh, yeah. quite a big punch. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's only a, a, you know, a turret, a gunner, you, you still got to kind of take all the considerations you're taking in a like, pilot seat in terms of their visibility and, and everything else. And, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. And, and yes, you know, you, you expect to see the big guns and the silhouette and get that kind of like real feel of, of being in a gunner seat, but it, like I say, it's, it's quite easy for it to just kind of grow in I wonder if they're going to. Uh... Quite yes. quickly. If they're going to have so like a commercial for the you know, version meant now, because they never had to, sort of they never had a commercial the turret, yet. Also to elevate the turret, um, it's still, you know, we've, we've had, we've got multiple ideas for that, so I think we'll just have to figure that out a lot further on. And then uh, these, I mean, these these guns look tiny. In yeah, they? they're still <laughs> size. So these these are guns that most fighters have equipped to them, but they're on these um, point defense turrets, so. Obviously, interesting point of defense. Huh? With. It's bigger now. It's more of a target for missiles and torpedoes. And one of the best ways we have in game to counter those is these automated point, point defense. defense. So, I know again, if you're, well, humans have these phalanx style guns that shoot down incoming threats, we'll we'll take that and we'll use our own guns. Uh, so there's, it's got four trading ship by the way on the hull. So there's two on the top near the bridge, and then I think you see uh, the other two uh, underneath. <laughs> So you've sort of got your your 360 degrees protection from the missiles mm. from those, and then there's a an trading ship pair by of the way. Size four remote turrets under the wings. Uh, these are size four the remote turrets. Uh, the bridge crew mentioned them. So yes, yeah, it's, it's not lacking on. It's not lacking the, on. The fire, thing is, it, it can carry a fair amount of cargo, and and you know it's got its own trading floor. And, you know, what a yeah, firepower yeah, for yeah, a trading to ship. Make sure that I mean, basically, that. yeah. There's a, there's, it's a bit of a TARDIS for me, mm, you know, yeah. there's a, as people will see, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff that we've squeezed into this compared to the first one. So there's always been this feature on the, on the Banu, which is there on the original, but it never really had a function. You know, some people called it the paddle, some people called it the flipper, but Chris was like, okay, it needs, it needs a reason to yeah. be in there. It, it is. It's crazy, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Well. I, I, it, I'll always remember that. One bit of defender concept art where it's just there, just destroying a mountain. <laughs> and it flies over, just dragging it. <laughs> so we've, um, you know, it's it's a multifunction essentially because um, one of the difficulties was is, uh, at the top of that flipper fuel scoop. Sorry, um, is basically the entrance to the marketplace for traders. Oh, okay, okay. So it was, you know, there's that challenge of what it needs to look. Uh, you know, it needs to do its job, but it also needs to look visually appealing because it's going to be the entrance. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, and we'll see that as we all in a second. Um, but it was, yeah, it was always, it was always a bit of a tricky thing to solve. So it's an end. It's the entrance into the bazaar. As John mentioned earlier, the ship got wider and didn't yeah. actually fit on a landing pad. 
which, which meant we had no hangars that it was officially fit in. Which yeah. You could only ever officially land at docking stations with docking yeah. ports or on a planet's surface, which is, you're, as a trader, you're missing out on Literally. all the places you could land to, to do trading. So we had to find a solution. a solution. I mean, the funny thing is, this is this is the mo- this is the simplest of the of the um, of the solutions that we came up with, and there were probably like ten others that we did. Some of them were super crazy, you know, part you know parts just folding back on each other and all sorts of things. So, but in the end, I think I mean simplicity wins out. I mean, yeah, I actually do agree with that. It should have been super simplistic yeah, and not yeah, like some exactly. crazy There's animation with parts here, of the we, ship we, like folding back and all kinds of weird shit. We'll, we'll work it out for you then. Because it's a lot of animations so here, to to do as well. A shot of which is all is like bad for optimization. Again, and becomes this pathway to the marketplace. So you'll have this basically why this experience again. It's kind of the red carpet treatment. You're walking up into the marketplace. It's not in this image, but you know we will have hopefully um, we'll have like soft like awnings basically that will sort of come out as well, and so we'll have that sort of marketplace. It, it, I think for me this is one of the ships that really excites me because um, it is very different to you know not all the, a lot of the ships that we've kind of we've done, um, and I think that sort of like initial experience, like you say, of seeing this thing kind of like come and land down, and and the traders kind of inviting you in and and entering into yeah it's it's very other world worldly yeah. kind of entering up that walking yeah. up those steps out of you know one of our kind of space stations like you know, our human space stations oh, absolutely. i think it's going to be kind of really it's like a space station in and of itself i mean the <laughs> idea is that as you go up those stairs you'll have you know holographic visuals of products that are in the marketplace yeah. and so they'll sort of pop up and just be spinning so you'll have like it's again it's just that sort of shopping experience and it's like oh okay i can get that and get that or maybe even artifacts that the traders picked up um i mean you've got options basically so yeah. um and then also the cargo that yeah changed, car- cargo it? is a big uh <laughs> topic um it was one of those things in the the original concept in even digging out the original design brief was wasn't particularly clear on was the cargo bay internal was it external was it uh, yeah, and it, and was we, it a walkable space? And we kept yeah. it external for yeah. the first half of yeah. this development, and mm. and then uh, during the meeting, cargo we should be internal for this ship. A bunch of us were in there with Chris, and we were all like, oh, no, especially it's because it's a trader, trader you want your goods protected and not like external. Let's make it enclosed. Um, we'll keep the the styling of how it was in the original concept, so you have that sort of I don't know how you want to call it shuttering or on the outside. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm struggling to actually remember it now because I'm kind of like yeah. not locked into this one. But yeah. it was more that it was it was you saw the cargo crates, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, they were exposed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they were they were exposed. Certainly from underneath, you could see them all. Yeah, they were top top mounted, and they could all drop down. But that caused huge problems with the entrance case, where if they could all drop down at the same time, then you couldn't get in the ship to start with. So we did have a solution, but. Yeah. This is definitely better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now it's now it's enclosed. You just have one way of dropping at the front, and then and we'll see later. So it's a gravity. Inside. So that's a gravity uh, uh, elevator. I think mm-hmm. the two the two systems are not interfering with each other. Mm-hmm. Or lav grav yeah, rather. Your cargo is more protected as well. Yeah, and that's kind of a levitation key, technology. It's a key element of it, isn't it? Is is you know not only having the. Um, like footfall into your your marketplace. Yeah, it looks looks really good. Big, is it the ship for me? Nah. You're gonna need to deliver them. Is it cool? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a ship for me though. So we're gonna move on to um, so we've been looking at sort of uh, sort of functional images of you know basically explaining um, how we've been dealing with design decisions and how that's affected art. And so now we move on to the sort of the sexy stuff of looking at how we've taken the sort of the existing band okay, materials, okay. you know, from the early merchantmen, which uh, there was a lot of good stuff on that, and then just progressing it a little bit further, and you know, again, this is still probably, you know, this is subject to change still, you know, it's it's previs, but in terms of where it's heading, you know, it's really quite exciting. It looks very shiny, um, way different than what it looked in the concept art. Sort of, you know, there probably will be more folds in the metal, mm-hmm. kind of like the. Looks way shinier than it was. Um, 
you know, if you look at the concept images versus where it all ends up pivoting on those those arms, yeah. and there's a lot more detail. There's a lot more, yeah, there's a lot more sort of intricate sort of folding of metal. And so we're just kind of like working in, we're kind of sort of turning it into more, it is more ornate, it's more of a sort of... Yeah, I don't know, I don't think I'm, I'm a big, of, big fan of the external outlooks. And sort of really trying to sort of... Get that in not a fan of so you know shiny we're stuff or, in the gold, or glossy we're layering in the sort of all the sort of um sort of art nouveau line work sort of you know the sort of banner influence you know we're looking at sort of taking um sort of uh, materials like opal or whatever the stuff is and you know equivalent is of that and also integrating that into the ship so it really is sort of a display of wealth it's yeah. like if you've got this like you've, you're loaded <laughs> <laughs> crown jewel loaded of course it is so uh, you know I think it you know it, it's it's going to some really nice places and so you know we're looking at this heavy breezer of a turret um, and this is still work in progress you know ideally there would be more work those size 8 guns if they're not yeah, gimbaled yeah, are gonna be horrible to use because that ship is gonna fly like a fucking school bus you know Time scale and stuff. And aiming those size eight guns, oh, we'll pass that. Going to be horrible. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'll get a, have a good. <laughs> Unless you're fighting like it, like a javelin or an Idris. So, that's the exterior. Um, we'll move on to the interior. Um, I guess we'll go over how it was. Uh, mm -hmm. how it is. <laughs> yeah, the ever given magical mystery tour. It's really it's horrible. Much. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was. Uh, a lot simpler, wasn't it? Yeah. Back in the day, it was pre pre metric, so we didn't have all the requirements in place. Yeah, no so this is the original, I think. Marketplace is a lot simpler in here, and so with with Banu Merchant Men two point oh, or is it, in my head it's three point oh. Um, you know, we've basically moved on to a, a fully upgraded interior. Hold on. And so you can see from this cutaway, and it's kind of hard to show okay. all the pathways in this ship. Market, two market floors. I feel like I'm banging this. You've got a guest room. You've got a yeah, conference room, room as well on there. And navigation, and so you can, you know, as a trader, you're locked off to a certain route. I want to see if they crew. if they put it on sale again. The merchant room. Access to everywhere, but as a trader, no. Cook over. You've got these areas. It's not on sale. To, you come in from. Docking collar and there's two different docking collars. You know, there's the, there's the larger one on one side. Yeah, and the ship it's station. not on sale. Yeah. And then that funnels you into the marketplace, <laughs> and then you can go back down through the flipper or vice versa if you're stripped. And so, you know, in terms of what's changed, you know, we've you know just we've had to create space for the cargo. Uh, you know, the hangar for the defender that was a massive one. So, a lot of just shifting, just shifting the internals around. Um, you know, there's two elevators in this. There's one for crew. There's one for traders. Again, oh, good. I think okay, that good. kind of like builds on the experience of, of someone. Thank God, it's not a shared elevator. There, though, and to, to me, that's kind of like part of the, the lure of the ship is that, you know, like I say, the, the crew have their own everything yeah, stuff, but yeah, the, yeah. The, the kind of like the people that are coming to spend money, that experience is like the, the kind of like one of the core elements of that ship. That's what makes it kind it's of a, yeah, special. a different experience to yeah coming on board it that way versus living on board it and yeah totally working on board and so we'll see here that these are like previous images these are straight straight out of 3d studio max a bit of photoshop magic but it's just giving you an idea of that going up the fuel scoop or the, or the market entrance you know you'll have yeah i don't know man all things all folded out it should be a real grand, it's not for me grand experience well, we have red I, I kind of, like, I don't know then again, I, I don't, I don't like yeah, alien ships to begin with. Kind of... And we've got, we had some reference images of that oh, okay. for the marketplace. And so you, here, you basically you've walked up, and you're, you're again. This is always in this concept uh, theory has always been this tree of life essentially. So basically, you enter at the base of the tree, and then it forms the spine, and then that tree branches out and basically reaches to the front of the ship mm. that's the thing like, it's yeah, always been this organic the theory the same in the defender you, you come in the defender up the ramp yes and then you have that big central tree yeah. which houses components and then that stretches out and back around to form 
So the line work in this is is a little more sort of refined. In terms, it's, it has gone less organic um, compared to the defender. It's kind of gone for a slightly less alien feeling. Yeah. Just to like like doesn't feel like it's actually a tree that has grown yeah. and they build a ship around yeah. this kind of organic being. It is a ship. Yeah, absolutely. And so here um, is a capture from 3D Studio Max, just so it's super clear, like this is where, this is the lower lower floor. So the marketplace is split into two floors, eight shops on each floor. Four, eight shops? Okay, no, sorry, so eight, uh, four eight, shops four on shops each floor, eight total. Okay, um, and eight shops in total in, sort of in the Merchantman. You can kind of see here, obviously, a flying jellyfish <laughs> but the theory is that that'll be a holographic display and you know hopefully the captain can choose what's on there yeah. it's a special know. offer for the day could be special offer could show a weapon could just special offer for the day flies, flies. these nuts but this really gives you a vibe of um you know the complexity with some holographic these nuts on display folded metal that organicness and sort of just that overall experience. The headaches that you're going to cause me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that yes. Aladdin's it's cave. Sweating. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got the little jewels yeah. hanging off the little. I really, I really like those, like the the kind of like the treatment of light in a lot of the concepts. I don't know if I'm stealing your thunder from. No, that's fine. Thing. Yeah, but the the sort of um, you know, these these jewels and stones that are kind of going to be used as light source throughout the ship, and I think that's kind of like very nice. I think that just just like a bit different, different and and it, yeah. Fluorescent tube, yeah, LED light. lights, or yeah, and so we really sort of pushed on that on this one, and so here is like, you know, there's basically as part of the tree of life in the in the marketplace. Yeah, I don't which, honestly, I don't like this at all. Go up there into the negotiation mm, yes. room, which was in the original. It's way too one shiny one and all that for me. Everyone remembers from yes. the, the original concept of that room with the I don't like it. Yeah, over the cargo. and so we've kind of kept that, and we'll come to that in a second. But before you get there. Come out of the elevator and you're sort of in a um, central corridor, which also leads to guests' habitation rooms. Because yeah, in law, these trades often take like a long amount of time. So yeah, it's it's, it's too much. It, it's too much for me. I don't like. I don't like it. The ship in particular. With I do not like it. How do Banu trade? How how do they eat? How do they? Because for the defender, it's sort of very small scale. Mm -hmm. it's, it's long duration. Um, so it's these these trades can take days, weeks, well, maybe months. So the, the people that are coming on board to trade need a place to stay yeah. whilst And, and it's not like, you know, the people that are going to be kind of flying this, they, they don't have... Hey, man, that's like, all up to you. In my head, I have like a baseball player. I'm not going like, to tell you, there, like, yeah. what so, you shoot like, what you yeah, shouldn't like. If you're trading your, but I guess just personal opinion, like, it's, it's not for me, it's too much. They're trying to trade these really expensive high-end items, and that's kind of... And you want them to feel special. Like, yeah. You know, the, the thing about this always has been... Uh, you know, making making the people feel you know True. something quite unique, and so you can see here. Well, you know, in this image we've got massive gemstones. They could be whatever, but you know, yeah, this is a huge display of wealth. The core sticks and the light, you know, for rotating. There's a lot of cool opportunities, and so here is the the conference. This is a huge display of wealth. In the original concept, it was smaller. A lot more compact. Obviously, the ship has got bigger and therefore we've got more space. But also, it's it's a display of wealth, right? If you can afford See? to waste a bit of space, essentially, you know, if you could be like, you know, well, I need to pack it with everything, you know, just got to make this nice uh, player experience where everyone feels sort of relaxed. And so that's kind of what we've been pushing with. So there's no, a mate. lot. Of, there's a lot of commonality. E that even that from. table, even that table is too small for that for that display. Pushing, pushing Even a table is too small for that. Again, you can see the, the sort captain's of quarters. Carved gemstones inlaid, inlaid with more gemstones, inlaid with gold, and so again, you know, in terms of player experience, it's going to be totally different to anything yeah. that's happened. And we've still kept that viewpoint, looking into the. Into the we'll get a bigger table. The cargo bay. It's one option. Cargo bay, and so yeah, it's it's been quite a tussle trying to trying to get everything into place and then this is an example of um one of the one of the hubs for like if you if you want to do, if you're doing longer term trading and this is a really sort of cargo bay will fit yeah, yeah again keeping with the organic theme the, the banner shapes but 
pushing what's like a different palette and materials and so it's kind of based off of the interior of a nautilus shell um, and so you can't really tell from here but actually it circles back on itself so there's a, a little internal wall can you show us the cargo um, toilet and yeah. shower and all that sort of stuff is and then you've got the bed in the back and then you've got lockers and the all seating area so you kind of like it, a real sort of organic journey so again just pushing on um, leveraging that GM tech as well so the chairs and the desk and even the lights are, are just sort of held yeah, held in space yeah. you know um, quite different quite different and so that's that's where the trailers go but yeah. the crew obviously has got okay, okay. access to the full ship and so slightly less grandiose but not yeah, it indeed so does very look cargo, uh, um, Banu. They've done really well on the Banu on the Banu design, quite but elaborate, but that's going to be shared between just not yeah, just not for me. Shared space. There's some more technical elements in there in terms of venting and stuff, and we still want to. You know, this has always been a theory of you've got your superstructure, then you've got your tech, and then you've got your layering of um, like your, your the body work, but, yeah, the cladding, yeah. yeah, and then. You know there'll be there'll be areas where the sort of tech is revealed and stuff and so um by balancing those two the proportions you sort of you can kind of like alter the, the feel of the space and so i mean it's going to be a going to be a journey for you guys yeah. of like how you know how we achieve all this but this is the corridor leading to the uh, marketplace from the document. It would be hella funny seeing all these military ships and one merchantman. Green ring, which kind of sort of. You know, I mean, that kind of put there. Might be possible there, because kind of, you know, the merchantman needs protection too. Safe. So. Yeah. You know, the docking, you know, yeah. There's not some kind of a yeah, vintage we, going on. Yeah, we're having this conversation. I don't think you would send out a merchantman on their own. That exact thing. I think you would at least like send a, send like an Idris like with it. Not in just a you know, as simple as something flashing on a screen or, or whatever else. Right. Send like an Idris with it or. Like a, uh, yeah, not a Kraken, I think. Well, a Kraken could. Just, uh, nah. The materials, the folds. Um, Especially the Kraken privateer it also has a bazaar. Like a trading area, so. Nah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't send a Kraken with it. You know, you Maybe an Idris, though. People who are familiar with the Defender will really sort of see. For our org, it could work as a decoy. Yeah, so, you know, the amount it's gonna be a very expensive Chinese decoy, then. God damn. But it bluntly is reduced. And so it goes to more matte materials. You know, it's a little less display of wealth. It's a little more functional, but still got that three D printing. You get a lot of, of that sort of like layering in here as well, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. That in the middle is the, a very expensive decoy. What do we call it the magic tagine. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. so it's fed from underneath, and you you know you choose what you want, and then it appears, and the top comes. Sure. Up <laughs> like yeah. He's gonna cough it up. Sure. Uh, be, be my guest, man. Be my guest. For a while about. Of how our aliens eat. It's, it's, I didn't hear the tag. Well, it's already been it's on. It's a tricky one because it's a sale earlier. It's a so it's a Banu ship, but it's got to support. Let me check. Humans, mm, yeah, yes. operating Banu um, merchantman. Get an entirely Banu crew. If you were playing as a Banu, then. Um, the Banu merchantman goes for or went for five hundred US dollars. Yeah. As a standalone, a lot, of, a lot of complex stuff. If you buy Warbond, Warbond is four hundred and fifty dollars. From my favorite bits, though, yeah, I really like this. And you can't really tell from this shot, but it's essentially set over three levels. So it's uh, it's a pretty pretty expensive. Pretty expensive ship. Components or walk up the stairs to some elevated stuff, but essentially this is leading to the main. And it's got like three thousand SCU. Like sort of counter rotating. Or at least according to the old concept, I don't know what the new concept, what the new SEU is going to be, because they might have rebalanced the SEU as well because the ship got bigger. In, in motion, just and if we can tie it to either that was it? Were you talking about whether tying it to damage or the state of the? It sounds like engine. a good idea, so I'm going to say yes. So you yeah. know, if the engine's malfunctioning, yeah, it's got a it's sort of slowing yeah. down. SEU of three thousand five hundred and eighty-four. <laughs> But then again, and then you know, in, in terms of the cargo space, then again, you don't know. Looking at here is like the thirty-two SCU sort of cargo. Oh, decks. These are the the big cargo containers that you see in all the the rest stops and the cargo decks. You don't know like how. Like, 
the modern day big shipping cargo containers. shipping containers. Yeah. 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 When you'd be surprised if it has like 6,000 SEU. You can't pick them up by yourself well, and you can't really do it. As you can see, it's these big containers that are 32 SEU apiece. So we've got, we've got so. a hefty um, a moving mechanism in there at the moment that you can control from this position that you can see in the, in the screenshot. Um, and so that'll be something else to work out then. Um, but it's like how to work out, John. Okay. Yeah, it's going um, to be interesting you know, for a cargo refactor. Really cool area, and sort of just below you, that's basically where the sort of the loading platform is. Yeah, because it moves the, the cargo containers into that space, yes, and then that and space then drops kind down, of drops down, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, so there will be that sort of like, oh, I need the bottom one on the third yes. stack. And, All right, okay, yeah. let's let's shift everything out and. Yeah. That sort of mini game of Jenga almost. Oh boy, it's going to be another Tarkov Tetris game. Are you and kidding me? Time we'll be able to see from the negotiation room into the poor guy the... moving. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be another Tarkov Tetris yeah, game. As a result of all these changes, the, the cargo oh, capacity boy. come down a little. I think it was it was a nebulous number to start with, mm. but it never really been proved still out. It's big. still big. So yeah. it's, it's around two thousand eight hundred. Uh, which is not a small amount of cargo by any means. Two thousand eight hundred. So it's still well above most. So ships, but until you get to the whole series, you went down like seven hundred. The, the, the hull is over three thousand, so it's well, just went down like seven hundred yeah, SCU. Um, but it's maybe not quite. Really looking forward to it. Nah, no, hell no. <laughs> I won't be loading that thing. Well, I think it looks pretty enough. <laughs> I'm the organization leader. I'll just get so one of the other cans yeah. to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that myself. I'll be chilling in the crew quarters. We could make it. Or the captain's quarters. Every ship do everything, but then mm -hmm. they just become yeah. these humongous vessels. Um, mm. So it's, a, it's always a trade. So moving now up to the bridge area. And what we're looking at here is very much work in progress. I mean, we are literally working on this right now in the sort of top left. Interesting. And then is. Um, an image that we created sort of on round two and we're and we're sort of leveraging leveraging that heavily so a lot of a lot of those shapes will appear into this new stuff but in this new sort of configuration you're able to access the bridge the reverse view to okay. access the remote not the, the land turret it's more of an experience and then also you've got previous work the merchantman bridge to, it's got the special name, but it's like a medit it's not a meditation room. I can't remember the name oh. of it. There was a, a approved name, wasn't there? Yeah. I can't think what it is. Um, it's kind of like a sort of sacred space, um, where sort of the Baru can sort of pay you. Know, a sacred kind of space. Like sort of equivalent of prayer. Oh, that's what. That's uh, where we're going to keep all the bodies of the people that that yes, tried to kill us. Space. So we're going to keep all the bodies. So that's been quite fun. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the areas on this on this ship are very sort of multi-threaded mm. you know you often have your central area and then stuff coming off it um, so like i said there's been a lot of a lot of thought given to navigation and in this area also uh, are two two lifts which also can take you quickly to other areas mm. from this bridge that's uh, an eight <laughs> how much for all these bodies uh, so the space for four on the bridge obviously. depends if there's still loot on them uh, stations there because in uh, 315 you're going to be able to loot dead bodies so the manned turrets towards the rear, one person that can fly the defender, and that leaves two to, to deal with everything else whilst you're flying around, because you, you can still trade whilst flying around, but it's probably not the the wisest of ideas if the person who's come on board to trade has left their ship behind. So it's, I mean, it might be good for negotiations. Yeah, good for negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the eight crew can then fill the eight shops if you're just landed on a planet somewhere you, you mm -hmm. sort of you pull double g you don't obviously don't be flying if you landed you can man your shop or you can let one person do do double duty in the shops so yeah yeah this is a um an example well a full-size image of uh, that round two concept of of the bridge and again you can see the sort of the superstructure that's and all the layering basically so you know, you know, we have changed the configuration since this image, um, but a lot of a lot of that view is going to get transposed onto this new one. Same with the materials, and again, just continuing with that flow of from from back to front, basically, always sort of this tree of life and going to the nose of the yeah. ship. By the time people see this, we will have actually we will have actually had someone start yeah yeah that's true start working on it. Yeah. So it's, actually in production now after 
after all these years. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Yeah. This is actually one yes, of the finally in production. Really it's been in concept Play so 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 long. It's just such a kind of I say it's got that kind of uh, full trading experience, but it feels like a proper home that you can can live on, and it's got a load of weaponry as well, which yeah, yeah. 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 if in doubt, you can just yeah take the guns out. Yes, <laughs> you will buy it. <laughs> yes. So that was the Merchantman. Pretty cool. Uh, looking forward to seeing that go into production, uh, yeah, go through production, because it's by the time people see it, it will be in production. It's yeah. gonna be a. I feel bad for the people who are. Who are working on that? It's such a huge ship. So to close our our talk out, I uh, thought we would revisit the the idea that we had last time we we did one of these panels. We showed some concept ships or some ideas for concept ships. Mm -hmm. Talked about it, and everyone voted for them. Obviously, as this is pre-recorded segment, we can't interact with the crowd and uh, get a feel mm -hmm. of that. So fight amongst ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Arm wrestle for which one we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> at the end, Jared will uh, explain how you can sort of vote or express your preference for what we show today, uh, and we will see what comes of that. But first, let's go over what we did last time. So uh, we had good dark. this ground mining vehicle concept. Yeah, there's a rock DS at the bottom. Jian small cargo. We had the Tavarin light fighter. Uh, people may recognise a sort of pattern emerging here uh, and then a small refinery ship so yep. let's see what's happened to those over the last few years the first one is the rock ds ground miner turned into the grey cat rock and the rock ds yep. second one is the uh, gatak rylan yep. was the Jian small cargo and that was third the one is the esperia uh, talon mm -hmm. and the talon strike now we have the esperia talon which was the talon light fighter and then the fourth one which it's a bit of a, a, a mystery. A mystery. A mystery. Misk. I like this okay, misc. I wasn't involved with this last time, but you've got a couple of my favourite ships in that, so yeah, it's, it's good. It's, it's going to be a misc, future, misc yeah. ship. Yeah. Uh, so that fourth one, the small refinery ship, obviously. Please show us. Know about, but uh, I can pretty confidently say people will know about it very That's soon. Cool. Fingers crossed. So, it's a, a new year. We'll do it all again. We've got four more sort of cuts of options here so we'll go over those option a explorer is, uh, ship a big explorer ship so we obviously have the characters the 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 pinnacle i like the top one explorer ships but you know there can always be more yeah, i like the top one competition in for the character really yeah maybe something <laughs> misky you know going the misk line mm -hmm. um, yeah i'm down for that then we have a selection of ground vehicles there. So the second one is fucking troll. Like mismatch there. So we've got two little uh, small vehicles the and third. Uh, what looks like a the third is an anvil ballista. Anvil ballista. Chassis. Yeah. They they all look cool. Yeah, the ground vehicles are kind of um, looks like a party bus to me. Although they're not as, as grand and exciting as the ships, I think they're just really fun. Um, yeah. And it, and it's nice. They're nice things to work on because they are kind of contained and they are quite small. They are. I was gonna say like less complex but they're probably not that much less complex mm -hmm. than a ship because they still require all the same sort of setup and everything else yeah. but and confinement yeah and you, you got fit everything in a, in a small so space. the third one was like a bike or hover bike the ground vehicles kind of um, and the fourth one was a, that like a new bomber extra element of fun when you are playing with your friends that it, it's it's um you know it's not all just about space we've got some beautiful planets and being able to explore them not by a foot is good yeah I don't see a floating noodle bike in there yet. A floating noodle, floating noodle bike. That's still on the list. Yeah, <laughs> it's my PJ list. special. Yeah, yeah. I've got a few that are trying to like just wear John down. And... Maybe the, well, maybe option C. This hover hover vehicle could be a floating big uh, pennies delivery bike. Delivery quad yeah. bike. Yeah, could be. And you've got like flying green zones, though, wouldn't you? And that that'd be like, oh yeah, actual kind of landing zones for all sorts of difficulties. Yeah. Mm. yeah so that's that's. We have some gravel bikes. For the bikes third one, in game at the moment. Probably the this is a second, sort of a more the second one, I think. More secure option because anyone that's flown gravel bikes has experienced probably some mild terror. Yeah, they, they try it's, and do it's been a while since we've done. Yeah, we've not done a. Gravel bikes are horrible. Proper gravel. They're horrible to fly. Vehicle was. Well, I mean. Or drive rather. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it'll yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. It's been a while. It's horrible. So the, the last option bomber. from D is a, a bomber ship. So I actually like the second one. We have the, the middle. Hercules A2, which is coming this patch. Uh, that obviously carries very big bombs. Very big bombs. It's a collection of smaller yeah, bombs, but bombs. it is our only dedicated ground bomber. We have bombers like the Retaliator mm. and Eclipse, but they're more torpedoes. This is... This would be another single. Yeah, but the third one is basically another eclipse. Bombs job. Um, I want to see something different and not something that's already the, there because like the third one looks a lot like the eclipse. The Might as well grab the eclipse then. Bombers, it's kind of like the single seat bomber. They just look, they just look cool. I think the hover vehicle for me. Yeah. Oh, I'll go for the uh, the explorer ship at the start because I like the I like big ships. I cannot lie. <laughs> you know, I was wondering if you were going to do it. And you it's did. going in my head. Yeah, so I was like, yeah. Do I, do I stop with this now? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, boy. I, I think a nice big explorer ship you can have all your friends on board because that's really where you have the, the huge amount of fun with Star Citizen yeah. is getting a group of friends together yeah. and just going off. I just think and causing chaos. Visually, the small little, small little uh, <laughs> kind of compacts are cool. But can yeah. we have them all, John? Maybe. That's what, well, what happens if we, if we do get like a perfect yeah. split on the votes? Yeah. Like Jasmine come back and be like, well, actually. Def definitely don't go down trying to split the votes. Yeah. So we have to make them all. But Just double your team, Ben. Double the team. It could happen. I'll try it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a, a little wrap up at the end of the, uh, the show. So mm -hmm. obviously it would have been easier to do this in person, but the, the world we live in doesn't allow that at the moment well, hopefully next year but mm -hmm. yeah. i don't know yeah 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 jared will come on in a minute and explain how to vote for these uh leave your comments and suggestions jared's like ah oh, fuck i thought i could take the rest of the day off jared huckabee by the way is the That's guy from uh, inside right. star citizen i'm john if you haven't realized i'm the video projector i'm ben uh first citizen con done Woo. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah welcome to the club yeah, yeah. And Paul Jones, our director. So, yeah, thanks for watching our, our Ship Talk panel. Okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna go grab something to drink real quick during the all these comedic showcases, so Pitted I'll be right back. Nature, you will need discipline, determination, and the courage to never. Looks like you need a beer mate. This is Nova AI. Application accepted. Report to Emirates Harbor. Welcome to Nova. Today you can join one of our five branches. Nova Core. Specializing in industry and commerce. Nova Skyline. Recreational activities and public relations. Nova Defense. Aggressive negotiations and security management. Nova Relief. Our medical aid and first responders and Nova Frontiers, the science and exploration branch. The future is in your hands. In the universe, where a hardened reaver on the edge of civilization soothes his loneliness on the spectrum. But I'm too old to find love. That is a load of space whale crap, and you know it. We're a slaver in the heart of Cathcart, meets new people every day, but just can't find that someone special. I can't handle this anymore, Maurice. I'm leaving. But who will subjugate your slaves if you leave? Perhaps a little magic can happen in the cold vacuum space. From the producers of Replace Me comes a romantic comedy with a pirate's heart of gold, Sleepless, in Stanton. Coming soon to the Spectrum on Cathcart Public Access. build more
more than money could afford and grow beyond what would define power. We venture into the future and stand together in unity. We are the Galactic Union. Welcome back. You're watching Citizen Gone 2951, just in case you saw the Benny Merchantman and lost all sense of time, space, and reality there. That was the Ship Talk presentation, followed by another set of community videos. Uh, so the 400i is real and visible. Uh, the Anvil Liberator may become the hero of Pyro when players are left without all the gas stations everywhere. And the Banu Merchantman aims to take the crowd of coolest spacecraft in the game. Like it didn't have it already. Plus, you can vote to prioritize one of the next ships to move into development. Uh, voting should be enabled now on the very special com link uh, found on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And uh, if it isn't, give it some time. I'm willing to bet the site is being hammered just a little bit at the moment. Now, as for what you folks had to say during the presentation, we're gonna try this again. All right, Twitch chat, don't let me down. Uh, Dial Tone said, Yo, dog, we heard you like ships, so we made a ship to ship your ships so you can ship while you ship. Uh, Aura Valido said, They're shipping the shipping, ship, ship, All shippings. Right, I'm back. Ships. Been enjoy, enjoy, enjoying Citizen on a lot. Thanks for the amazing work. Uh, Medusa One says, It's so stupid. I love it. I don't know which ship he's talking about, but we'll take it. Uh, Enig Marin says, the new most important ship in Star Citizen. That's still me and Jay Lee, dude. Uh, Blix88 says, pocket carrier. Yes, finally, pocket carrier. And <laughs> Actual Lars19 pocket carrier. says, balloon merchant man. They've best had a lot of, of the best. Uh, org ads, though. Lars19. Back to the 400i, that promotion should have launched just a little while ago. So be sure you check <laughs> sure, that out. Not doing free Q and A FAQ where the because nobody is fucking on to record an ad with questions and put them to John Crew ahead of time. I hope there's at least one question about the bathrooms. Now, of course, what we really want to do is fly the 400i. And I'm pleased to report that the 400i is not only straight to flyable, but will be available when Alpha 315 goes to PTU for Wave 1 testers, subscribers, and concierge. And as okay. for when that is, I'm told the platform team is literally watching this stream right now, waiting for me to say the word, and they will drop the patch. So all I have to do is say the word. And I'm not going to. Whew. That's a lot of pressure. But if I say the word, and the patch drops in the leak, and I'll be here by myself, why would I want that? You know, this reminds me of the time when I had that, that big crazy beard that I said I would shave when 3.0 came out. And then right before 3.0 came out, uh, everybody was on the go live call, and everybody was like, yeah, it's ready, yeah, it's ready, yeah, it's ready. And then CR made everybody wait. An additional five minutes just to torture me. You remember that, CR? <clears throat> Pepperidge Farms remembers that. No, no, of course, you're always on, dude, for that. All right, I've pushed the gag too far, as it seems. All right, here we go. Countdown ready. And three, two, one. <laughs> no shot, bro. <laughs> no fucking shot. That was predictable. <laughs> no fucking shot, man. All right. <laughs> Let's go now to Allie Brown, Christopher Bolte, and Daryl Barnes and learn more about Gen 12 and the uh, 
The multi-core of Vulcan. <laughs> no fucking shot, bro. Imagine actually embracing the meme of the 30k. This is huge. What's coming up Hi, now is I'm fucking Ali huge. Brown, director of graphics engineering here at Cloud Imperium Games. And today we're going to be talking about Gen 12, our new multi-core renderer. In addition to myself, we'll also be hearing from Christopher Bolte, our core engine architect, and Daryl Barnes, our graphics programmer. And today we're going to be talking about the need for our new renderer, the architecture and how it's built, Vulkan, uh, which is the back-end API we use, and the progress of how we're doing so far, and then what's Bro, next. Bro, I got a nose to. or a hair in my nose from the cat. Ugh. It's horrible. So, to help understand the need for the Gen 12 renderer, we we'll first want to take a look at the high-level structure of our existing renderer to try and understand how the new render will differ. So, here you see a diagram, very simplified, of our overall architecture. And on the left-hand side, you can see the 3D engine, and this is what manages all the visible objects in the scene, for example. Their position, their size, and ultimately is responsible for the culling of them objects and deciding what should be sent through on screen each frame to the renderer. And obviously, the job of the renderer is just to feed out the image at the end of the frame. And to do this, to manage this process, all of these objects have to pass through this single universal pipe, this conduit of information in the center. And as a result of that, every object has to come through of a certain amount of uh, settings or paperwork and baggage to describe how they should be configured and this type of represented on a diagram by these uh, switches. So this type of design initially seems very flexible and having this uh, universal pipe, you can very easily toggle certain no. settings and get a very different rendered result. This is the single threaded. But the reality is actually that the objects and the renderer both end up extremely complicated because they have to decipher this. This is a single threaded. And distribute these objects through the various pipelines and stages in the renderer. Center. And this has to happen for every object, every frame. And this yeah. deciphering ends up resulting in quite a significant performance problem. And it also makes the renderer quite inflexible. Oh boy. It's, it's quite complicated and hard to change the architecture. So, how does our Gen 12 renderer differ from this? Well, the methodology we're taking on is to try and make everything as explicit as possible. And we're trying to minimize all these redundant connections uh, and switches and configuration options and try and get things much more streamlined. So to do this, each object in the world will directly communicate with the render pass responsible for drawing that object at startup time. So when the object is first spawned, it will communicate directly with the pass responsible for okay, it okay. and pre-configure everything possible at that stage. Now, this has a bunch of benefits. So by speaking directly to the thing that's rendering it, it doesn't have to worry about all the other rendering systems. So we end up with a much more limited set of parameters, both on the object and on the rendering pass. And all of the settings we do have are very relevant for the task, which makes things much less complicated. And it's easier to optimize, more flexible, and more modular. So each of these passes then goes on to generate lower level commands that are actually going to map directly to our graphics. This API, is going to be huge, which is dude. a piece of software that sits just above your GPU driver. And this back end collects and executes all of these instructions. And because there is no high level knowledge of the rendering in this back end, it is just simply just issuing commands. It ends up very simple and streamlined and much simpler than the equivalent on our own. Yeah, this is very much better than so what it was. This simpler code it is much easier to. God run, damn. Which is to say, to run it on multiple CPU cores in parallel, something that is crucial for modern CPUs. The multi threading is a complex and often misunderstood paradigm, so I thought it was worth us talking briefly about how we optimize multi threaded code. And for that, I'm going to use an analogy of building a house, which is another complex engineering task with dependencies. So here you can see a list of tasks for a builder, a joiner, and an electrician, all running uh, one after another, and there's dependencies between them shown in red. And in this example, the house is equivalent to rendering our frame. Each tradesman might be a different system. Mm, and not in the first pass, I think. Our house is equivalent to the three CPU cores we might have on our system. And the occupancy, as in the average number of people in the house, is effectively the same as the CPU or GPU utilization numbers you might see in Task Manager. So in this example, we can see the, the project takes 11 units of time and is on average 60% full, this house. Now, this occupancy of 60% isn't the direct yeah, reason true. that it takes 11 units of time. And that is, in fact, down to for, the for, critical for path of work. With this, I might actually see 60 FPS in a lot of places. So the obvious answer here is that you need another builder or multiple builders to work on this in parallel to unblock the joiner and, and so on. You can keep on parallelizing this work to try and reduce the critical path. And that is our focus when we are optimizing multi-threaded code. 
However, not all tasks are trivial to run in parallel, and sometimes it's impossible to actually run them in parallel, so you will end up with these unallocated capacity space and these bubbles, and in this case, if we imagine the electrician was in fact our GPU, then the fact that it takes longer is just gonna result in a CPU bubble, which is unavoidable. And this type of thing happens very frequently if you have a configuration, for example, a very fast GPU and a very slow CPU, then unavoidably one of them two systems is gonna have a bubble. So we can fill these bubbles with non-critical work like streaming meshes or textures, and this can help fill the unused CPU capacity. And this can be useful to try and get some extra work done, but it ultimately it's not gonna improve the performance of the frame. And the point I really wanted to drive home was that the CPU and GPU utilization, which are often looked at as key indicators of performance, aren't actually the direct thing we should be looking at. They are useful as statistics, but ultimately the frame time is the only thing that matters and the critical True. Time that resulted in that frame time. Fact. Frame so time is huge. Out Gen 12, huge. We'll find some new statistics in there that the players can see. To Your utilization could be 100% and fully used, and that should but if that frame time is fucking terrible, who fucking gives so a shit about the utilization? Parallelism in practice, that's going to come down to two major changes. One is the architectural changes, which Christopher will talk us through. And the second is the Vulkan graphics API that Daryl is going to talk us through. We come to the next section of our Gen 12 renderer presentation. My name is Christopher Bolte, co-engine architect here at Cloud Imperium Games. And I would like to spend the next few minutes introducing the high-level architecture of our indie developer. Did CIG get half their personnel from Ubisoft or something? All of them are fucking French. <laughs> Did Ubisoft have a, have a, have a huge walk away or something? Of object instances in the world, for example, chairs, walls, characters, or spaceships. This part of the rendering Did they have a walkout or something? Rendering and has the largest impact on runtime performance. There's also a lot of work happening on the architecture to manage operations which work on all pixels on the screen, so called post effects. Not sure if he's actually French or German. The current slide shows our existing renderer code setup. We have a main thread. Might actually be German. Game simulation as well Wait, as figuring out what objects we should draw for every frame. Yeah, it might be German. And we have a render thread, which takes all those objects and translates their description into GPU commands to render them on the screen. The system is set up to double buffer the data. In other words, the render thread is working on data from the previous frame, while the main thread produces data for the next frame. Such a setup allows easy performance improvements in some situations, but it also has two issues on modern hardware. First, the rendering code won't scale over multiple CPU cores, which can result in a bottleneck during execution. In other words, every visible object adds a certain cost. The more objects we render, the higher the cost. And as a single CPU processes this cost, no matter how well we optimize, at some object count we will run into performance issues. Second. Since the main thread and render thread must be synchronized with VSync, we can end up with very bad load balancing. As shown on the slide, if the main thread takes longer than the render thread, the render thread has to, to be idle and wait. And vice versa, if the render thread takes longer, then the main thread has to wait. During such wait time, the CPU is underutilized, especially if waiting for the single core render thread. Why didn't they mute this audio? The goal for the Gen 12 renderer is to remove this kind of bottleneck and instead architecture the system without those weights and allowing every operation to utilize all CPU cores. When we utilize all CPU cores, we would still have an object limit, as every visible object must be processed. But we can process a higher object count and at the same time reduce the latency on the main thread until all objects are processed. As we will be making better use of modern multi-core CPUs. Let's take a look at some details. For example, please keep in mind that the size of the sections are chosen to visualize the cost. Relation and size doesn't necessarily translate. How many people are going to look at this and see it be like CIG RT core code? <gasps> They're going to add ray tracing, dude. They're going to add ray tracing RT code, dude. Pattern quickly emerges. It's and render thread code. For every rendered object, How many people are going to think that, Kyle? <laughs> for every draw call, some time that is spent inside our own render code and some CIG part of it is spent CIG in the race code. code. In the next slide, CIG ray we tracing will cover our code, bro. process, <laughs> as well as the next steps to move the draw core cost out of the render thread onto multiple CPU cores. 100% going to be people who think that. We have a level of parallelization on the main thread, used to find out what objects are visible. There we use our batch worker job system. 
This, this is a parallelization system to execute the same code on a different object instance of all CPU cores. To give an example, checking 400 objects can be split over 10 threads, so that every thread will be processed 40 objects. By doing that, the latency on the main thread until all 400 objects are done is divided by the number of threads, reducing said latency to 40 objects only, roughly at least. As in the actual system, several low-level factors affect the execution, making this statement not fully true, but covering those would be out of scope for this presentation. The visible check itself happens yeah, multiple dude. times per object in a frame. As an object can be visible in the main camera, the fact I've it already got a in four gigahertz CPU is gonna like so if I have a a four four core eight thread four gigahertz CPU as we can that's going to be more than one shadow pass, for example. It, it might actually Close work better than way more cores but slower uh, slower core times object is determined to be visible 4.2 gigahertz 16 thread yeah, yeah, yeah. multiple temporary for you it's going to be even better those temporary buffers are processed on the next vendor thread frame to submit every object's score call to the GPU in other words Object counting is already at the point where we want to... But if you have like a 32 core, uh, 64 right here in the thread CPU, like a space. thread ripper, we but you got like fuck all gigahertz on there, short, you might actually short, suffer with this. ...are now in the process of moving our own rendering code out of the render thread into the existing batch work execution. This is a very time-consuming refactor, as we need to change every rendering feature in a very old and large code base. But we have set it up in a way to allow us to quickly move over again. It, it's step by step. It's unmuted. After this operation is done, we you can hear his mouse clicking. The temporary buffer to be processed by the render thread, but the state which we copy is prepared in a way that we can directly send to the GPU with minimal processing on the render thread. Doing this step will already give us performance benefits when we are render thread bound, as less code will be run on the render thread. Additionally, this is a necessary stepping stone for the next phase. After we manage to move our own rendering code to multiple CPU cores, we will start to utilize the Vulkan API. One major selling point of the newest generation of graphics APIs like Vulkan is the possibility to generate GPU comments on multiple threads. This, this is, is going to be fucking huge, dude. Possible before, and mostly the cause for the existing renderer design. The catch is, to allow efficient parallel generation of GPU comments, the data must be prepared in a certain way. And that is what we are doing right now as part of porting the scene object rendering to Gen12 and moving our renderer code to the batch worker system. When this is done, we can implement the parallel work in backend and this is the render thread. This is a huge amount After of work, all that work is done, This is crazy. The renderer should be able to process a very high number of visible objects at lower impact on the frame time. At the same time, it will make better use of the available CPU resources and have less idle time when major systems wait for each other. Thank you for your time. Dari will now take over to cover the work inside of the Gen 12 renderer. This is such a huge undertaking, man. God I'm damn. I'm a graphics programmer here at Cloud Imperium Games, and I work closely with Vulkan and our graphics renderer to make the game look as good as it does. British. So what exactly is Vulkan? Well, Vulkan is a modern graphics API that allows us as developers to take greater control over what you as a player sees and also affects performance greatly. As you know, we already have a few areas of bottlenecking on the CPU but the design of Vulkan allows us to alleviate these bottlenecks by submitting work in parallel to the GPU. So I would like to explain a bit more about the software stack that's involved with our graphics in the engine. So from the image, you can see that we have a renderer front end, a renderer back end, and as well, the graphics driver. The Vulkan API generally sits at the renderer back end and allows us Dude, see Kyle, seeing this reminds me of the fucking OZ model. And how we develop for it. <laughs> it also gives us for some reason it just reminds me of the OZ model, including Windows and Linux and anything we may want to look at in the future. 
the graphics driver stage is not managed by us, but we look at that and we gather information and process any crashes or any issues that might happen, and then we can deal with those further down the line. So you can see now how graphics APIs have changed over time. We're, of course, in... The bottom one is uh, one Nintendo, by the way. ...is on feature parity, essentially, with other APIs such as DirectX 12 Ultimate. You might also be wondering what a graphics API actually is. And we see that as a tool that is used... For Apple. Metal! ...between <laughs> your graphics card... Please do not throw salami pizza. I've never heard of that one, dude. The latest and greatest. I've never heard that one. It also has many features and extensions available to it that we will be exploring in the future, such as variable rate shading, bindless resources, and GPU accelerated ray tracing. To address any issues, we also need to collect data. GPU from accelerated our ray tracing. Hardware so that we can use that okay. to target specific features and extensions. We're not aware of any large-scale multiplayer games that captures Vulkan data live in the exact same way we do. Capturing this data allows us to plan ahead for any optimizations and then leverage that for the larger majority Dude, of Dude, Pyro players. looks so good. So we can bring you the latest... Don't threaten me with a good time again, man. On screen at the moment is a diagram that shows the distribution available for Vulkan API versions amongst currently active players. This was captured in the last three months, and as can be seen, there is 98% of players that are able to use Vulkan fully in 1.2. We did see a negligible amount of 1.0 and some that were unavailable. We are actively looking into these cases, especially those that cannot currently run Vulkan as it is See, oh yeah, that's fucked up. Like some I'd people wouldn't even also say, please update your drivers as we do see a few cases where this can take you straight to the latest version. I'd like to now explain some people a bit more cannot even support Vulkan. It's crazy. How this works hand in hand with the Vulkan API in order to improve our usage of Vulkan. So a render graph can be seen as a collection of stages that depend on each other. This then determines the ordering, the scheduling, and the flow of the actual frame. This allows us also to then achieve any synchronization that we need to during that frame. It also helps us from a design point of view, as we can look at the render graph and see where there may be issues or potential optimizations. The render graph also allows us to keep track of any state of resources and we can also validate against those resources as well now i would like to man imagine all the trial and error they have to do man for with this God an overview of how it works between the gpu and also how it works in terms of our frame so a frame is made up of a collection of passes and sometimes we require a texture to switch states perhaps between read and write. The graphics driver used to do this for us, but now with modern APIs such as Vulkan, we need to carry out this work ourselves. What the render graph will then do is insert a pipeline barrier into the render graph and pass this work along to the GPU and switch the state. We can also cache the render graph and use really? the data we had from a previous frame or perhaps Hold on, I should be able resources. to. I should be able to run it, right? I'd now like to talk a bit about the synchronization that happens within the render graph and how resources change like state. So the idea is that we want to switch the state of a resource as early as possible. We need to then also validate that this resource is in the correct state. Yes. So from the diagram, we okay, can see good. that the depth prepass writes to image A. But then later on, we require to read from image A in the G buffer. Wait. So to this end, we insert a pipeline barrier for this transition between the two passes. These barriers are scheduled as GPU work, following a strict ordering dependent on other work that may have happened previously. All the work for a single stage within the frame. The 1070 is not supported? In a single pipeline barrier.
I'd now like to talk about some of the more nuanced areas of our Vulcan implementation and how this affects us as developers and you as players. We use the DirectX compiler for our shaders and this can compile our HLSL code into Spear V. DXC is a more modern compiler and has features that yeah, it does. Pascal GPU architecture. Set of APIs and Vulkan. HLSL is a shader programming language that we as developers can utilize yeah, yeah, yeah. and read in order to make work happen on your GPU. I was like, this no HLSL way, dude, that I, I, I don't support it. Spear v. No shot. Spear V itself is not as readable as it is seen as an intermediate language between HLSL and shader microcode. Spear V gives us less driver overhead at compile time. We can use this then to create our shader modules in Vulkan and optimize any dead code away. DXC also gives us Shader Model 6. Shader models have progressed over time in HLSL, with Shader Model 6 now giving language support for GPU parallelism as well as variable rate shading amongst many other features. I was about to say like no so shot when the 10 series is not supported our, our or 10, 10 series and older are not are not supported and they get 98 percent support this is where one of our no shot will write a shader using hlsl code with some markup integrated into that hlsl this hlsl is then passed to the preprocessor the preprocessor it then removes any That's actually pretty smart. additional code that we don't need and is dealt with accordingly, whilst then outputting just HLSL code. The HLSL code is then passed to DXC. 780 and in DXC 2021, by the way. God damn. Spear v. It's at this stage that we can carry out any additional compiler optimizations and improve compile time performance even more. Spear V is then passed to the driver, and the driver will then change this into microcode, which will run specifically on your GPU hardware. As I've previously mentioned, there have been several Vulkan core versions over time. Each one has added new features and extensions for us to reach into and develop with. Two of these I'd like to explain a bit more in detail now that we would like to look into and develop for in the future. These are both bindless resourcing. Apparently not in Star Citizen. Because that rate. mean they would be in fragment the rate in a two percent. As the same as variable rate shading, as you may have already seen. What this does is works on groups of pixels instead of a singular pixel at a time within the shader. This allows less overhead in the frame whilst at the same time allowing variable amounts of these groups, including variable sizes, in order to have less fidelity where may not be as important to look at. Finalist resourcing. See, this is why I like seeing developers on, on screen a lot more than Chris Roberts. For example, these dudes actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> one of these inside the group. This gets rid of the overhead of specifically binding two slots within the shader. This also extends to other resources, including buffers. I'd now like to talk a bit about the video RAM. Yeah, I knew it was a 10 in your graphics card. VRAM used to be managed by your graphics driver. Yep. But with Vulkan and other modern- DirectX used to uh, direct your VRAM. Managed by the developers. There are existing solutions towards this. However, Which is we good. Decided to use our own it's good that Vulcan this is because we know gives exactly developers what resources a are used up front and how much memory these resources use. Using this, we can potentially beat what the graphics driver used to be capable of. As we know all of our resource life cycles, we can take advantage of that. Dude, on this is so huge. Like direct X would be able would be, be using VRAM that would driver. never even be used on the by code. Side, we can see and here, developers can be like, oh, uh, we don't use this, well, bin this off. We don't use this, bin this off. We don't use this, bin this off. This is huge, dude. 
the memory paging of years past could potentially result in a performance loss because this was seen as a more one-size-fits-all. We, of course, want to avoid any of that performance loss and the memory cost involved by offsetting into these larger buttons. Dude, I'm excited for Vulcan, man. This then leaves us with all of the bring uh, usage and reusage. This is crazy. Resources. I'd now like to pass you back to Alistair Brown, the director of graphics engineering. Following on from what Dowell explained there with the explicit memory management in Vulcan, we intended to expose some of this memory management to the player through the advanced graphics options. We're going to let you tweak the memory assigned to each system so you can balance the preferred visuals and performance for your experience. For example, you may want to balance the output resolution of your game to a higher resolution, but then sacrifice some shadow quality. Or maybe you want to use a lower internal resolution and rely on upsampling to achieve a higher texture quality. These options Bro. will be available to you and obviously only capped by the hardware that you possess. <laughs> oh, God so damn, bro. For Gen 12 renderer, we're hoping to achieve something that is more efficient, modular, flexible, and minimal abstraction to the hardware, and uses modern graphics APIs like Vulkan. So now you know a bit more about what Gen 12 is, I'll try and let you know where we're up to. <laughs> bro, this is crazy, dude. So we've done a huge amount of work already. The architecture is all in place, and we're using this hybrid rendering approach where we're combining elements of the old and new render at the same time to allow us to move piecemeal to the new system. Is this old? All of the post effects, fog, and lighting have been converted over, and they're all enabled by default in 3.15. And the fundamentals of scene and geometry rendering are all in place, but they're still <laughs> being worked on. So our main focus is finishing that off at the moment, and once that's done, our folks will shift to the remaining major systems, which are gas clouds, the render to texture system, and a few special cases for transparency. So 315 is already going to bring like uh, less than half After of this, Gen that's 12. That's where we'll start seeing the public milestones, and the first of that will be 100% uh, usage of Gen 12 and none of the hybrid approach. This will still be at DirectX 11, our current graphics API at this point. And then our second milestone will be the Vulkan API release. That will be optional at first and then mandatory after we've removed all the bugs. And then a final milestone will be when we have performed the optimizations for multi-threaded. So that will only happen once the Vulkan is in place and we can finally look at the performance on the final graphics API and optimize all of the remaining code. Dude, Im imagine working on this, dude. It's such a huge so undertaking. Gen 12, I just briefly wanted to touch on what comes next for the graphics team. So a lot of Gen all of all of your unemployed CPU performance. So after Gen 12, we really want to start looking at the GPU performance. The first few things we'd look at after Gen 12 is in, they're all unemployed. The visuals, just <laughs> they're all fired. Rate, things like DLSS, FSR, async compute, and variable rate shading. After we've tapped Deal, on, wow. improved this okay. GPU performance, we want to start looking at some of the more exciting visual features. So then there is also mesh shaders and primitive shaders, which is technology we can use to generate procedural geometry. And this type of thing could be really exciting for things like the planets or asteroid fields where procedural geometry is critical. And then there's the big one, ray tracing. We're very excited to get onto ray tracing, especially to use it for lighting, such as global illumination, but also reflections and shadow quality. There's a lot of exciting areas for us to look into, and we can't wait to get into it. Yeah, finish this one first, Bucko. Big thanks to everyone who's been involved in this technology. It's involved the graphics oh. team, engine team, but VFX, and Planet Tech all working together on a huge piece of code. And we can't wait to get into your hands as soon as possible. No, no, no time? No time frame? No time frame, okay. So some of it in 3.15 already. It is ready when it's ready, true.
That's not the in-game minigun minigun audio. Mandalorians, basically. Uh, Paladonians. <laughs> Mandalorians. <laughs> Are you traveling the stars? Exploring the galaxy? That's lonely, lonely, hungry work. Always remember, though, Big Benny's with you. Big Benny always has your back. Big Benny, eat his food. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what the hell? The dude really said, update your drivers. These are my favorite kind of panels because they're precisely the kind of thing no other game studio would ever dream of sharing with folks. And as CitizenCon 2951 rolls along, there was a lot to take in there, wasn't there? I know server meshing and the like are the big buzzwords, but there are a lot of imp uh, performance improvements to be gained throughout the teams on Star Citizen. And for graphics, they're not only moving to Gen 12 and the faster and more flexible renderer that it brings. Is it just me or is this uh, audio also focused like, on crackling. engineering for multi-core systems to provide improved CPU performance and remove some of our worst bottlenecks mm -hmm. and that all this work starts with DirectX 11 but will transition into Vulkan once things are ready. Now the work of these folks, the meshing folks, the database folks, the optimization <laughs> folks, and countless other folks, I've used that word a lot, uh, from teams across every studio is how we're going to get Star Citizen to that performance promised land. And it takes all these teams to make that dream a reality. And speaking of dreams made reality, hey, Sleepless and Stanton folks, don't think I forgot about you. Don't think because you're a community effort, I can't expect and demand a full-length feature. I await my screener. And in other community news, uh, one of the best things to come out of the Star Citizen community over the years has been the creation of an app called Game Glass. It's an app that turns your tablet or phone into a control surface for the game. So let's take a closer look at that now. Paid ad, by the way. <laughs> I have actually seen this before. I have actually seen this. It's actually pretty darn cool if you have a tablet. Up next, we've got Anise, Mark, Morgan, Will, and Marco taking a look at some of the new tools currently in development, including Rastar, which you may have seen a little bit of in the Pyro presentation. Crafting worlds, planetary tech and tools starts now. Yeah, but you need a place to put that tablet as well. Wait, which panel is this? Crafting worlds, planetary tools, and tech. Okay. 
Hello, I am Marco Corbetta, VP of Technology, and we're going to talk about now, this is in Italian features today. First, Anis is going to give us an introduction about Gen 12 and what that means for planets. Then Will is going to talk about dynamic foliage, shaders, plants and seasons, and he's going to yeah, this dude is Italian <laughs> as well. Then Mark and Morgan are going to talk about Rasta, our new base building tool. So let's get started with Anis. Base building tool, let's go. Hi, my name is Anis and I'm a senior engine programmer here in Cloud Imperial Games. My main responsibility is the development of Star Citizen planetary technology with a focus on planetary elements rendering. Gen 12 planetary. While there is another okay. talk dedicated to Gen 12, I wanted to touch a little bit on how it applies specifically to planet tech. It's our rendering abstraction layer API. It aims to provide next generation features for our 3D engine by reducing some CPU latency and rendering common submission over it, which is a significant bottleneck for our game. Part of our recent efforts have been put to modernize our old school renderer to shape it in a conformant modern API rendering style to be suitable for the newest low overhead API, such as Vulkan. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about Gen 12 benefits for planetary rendering features. As I said, Gen 12 key aspect is performance. The way this is achieved is to make common submission easier for multi-core CPUs. All Gen's rendering APIs rely on a single thread in which you have the view of a single timeline where GPU commands are guaranteed to be executed in order. The driver does the rest and is responsible to handle memory and synchronization. Gen 12 can scale much better thanks to the ability to dispatch in parallel commands that are submitted from different execution units. The memory is directly handled by the renderer and synchronization primitives are used to make sure commands dispatched in the right order by considering cross-dependencies between resources. Since the rendering driver is thinner and more responsibility is given to game developers, this opens a new opportunity to forge a new renderer for specific needs a game like Star Citizen might have. Our planetary technology introduced a new set of engineering challenges, so we need to be very creative due to the fact that, that most game industry standards techniques are not working very well for Star Citizen. Thanks to Gen 12 optimizations, we can push our planetary rendering computational budgets to perform more GPU operations. This translates to better visuals, more details, and less compromises. As a member of the Planet Tech team, I will show you some improvements we've recently made for our planetary terrain rendering pipeline. Okay. We made two important terrain improvements. The first is at ground scale level, and the second is for large scale purpose. Both techniques use dynamic tessellation. Dynamic tessellation is a GPU feature, which allows to increase the triangle count on the fly before a sterilization stage occurs. The new triangles are then manipulated to shape the terrain high frequency details and improve surface visuals. This new technique is replacing our parallax relief mapping, which is a per pixel technique. And instead of creating geometric details like tessellation does, it works by simulating details after the rasterization stage with a cheaper approach by tracing rays from camera to surface. The second improvement targets planet visuals at long distance. This technique is also tessellation driven and it aims to improve terrain ocean intersection where CPU geometric representation lacks for enough control points in the geometry. We reached the conclusion. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of CitizenCon. Thanks, Anise. I'm Will Hay and I work on the Planet Tech team. Okay. Over the past few months, I've been working on a number of improvements to our ecosystem spawning system, which is the system. Oh, look at that lag during this shot. Planets. We've been doing this <laughs> like 15, 20 FPS. Flexibility as well as improved performance for everyone playing the game. The first thing that I did was a complete overhaul of how we spawn the objects. We used to spawn them on each terrain patch. Yeah, after not a good look. Was created, but this meant that we were limited in our control in that we could only spawn new objects when we were creating new terrain patches. The new system has an entirely separate grid division of the planet, and this means that we have a lot more control over the resolution of our objects when they're spawned, 
and how we spread it across multiple frames, which means that we get better performance in the client. This also means that we add, we're able to add a setting for the clients to control how far away each object reset will spawn. The next improvement we've started to look at is making the ecosystems react to their situation and surroundings more. For example, we can now introduce scaling biases for temperature and humidity so that certain objects, when in higher humidity, can be bigger or smaller and the same for the temperature. The a new system has been designed for animal and entity spawning using tokens, which means that we can specialize our object presets better for different planets. For example, we have something similar for rocks that means if yeah, you put it on a snowy planet, it goes snowy. And if you put it on a sandy planet, it looks sandy. When a new space now, whales are coming to Star Citizen, animals, it should be Orison V2. Herbivore, for example, and in the snow, this might spawn some sort of... They haven't seen rabbit. anything in-game about in jungle, or, uh, this might spawn something completely space different. whales yet. We've also begun to experiment with a new foliage shader that takes into account the health of the plant based on its surroundings again and the current season of the planet though what you're seeing on the screen is far from final. In the same vein as that, we've been working towards having more dynamically placed biomes around natural areas. We've created dressing object presets that are automatically placed around coasts, and of course my favorite thing to work on, rivers. In the most recent couple months, I've been doing more work on the rivers to prepare them to be closer to what we would consider shippable so that we can get them out to the players. This has included finer control of both the shape of our rivers as they flow from springs to larger rivers, but also the objects that spawn around our rivers. So we have control over what spawns in the water, what is spawning <laughs> on the banks There's of the river. There's a couple trees in the water there. Further away and blending it into the biome that it flows through. The other thing that we've added as well is a wet edge around. Dude, the it's the same audio the clip, like the, the same rivers, music. Which reflects the fact that they. Same spawn, music the thing every si every so single video clip. Shiny. We've also been working on introducing basins to the river system so that we can have more natural pauses in our river systems and other bodies of water than just the ocean. Another major change was to stop using the planet's ocean mesh and just displacing it up to the river and instead building specific river mesh sections around the river. This means that we can have far more control over the shape of the water and we can use our own specific river material and shader, meaning that we can specify colors, flow, and other properties of the river water separately to the <laughs> Red River. Planet. River Rivers of aren't blood. Done yet, but they're closer to being used in production than ever before. The next steps include a planet populating tool, so one click to create an entire river system across a planet, and maybe working on a little bit of lava flow, but we'll have to see when that comes. Next is uh, Mark and Morgan. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm a tools programmer from the Planet Tech team, and now I'm going to talk about Rasta. Base building tool. Okay. What is Rasta? Rasta is our work in progress tool for planetary locations creation and addition. The name stands for a mix uh, of RTS, the game draw, which takes the inspiration from its map editor system, and Star, as well, you know. Its goals are to replace our previous placement system based on prefabs to a better object container oriented solution. As our previous system was based on prefabs, any changes to location was source of issue, as it needs to re-enable the whole set of data to have things like missions or shops to work again. With this new system, any change will be easily manageable and won't require us to redo work when a change is made. Plus, as it's now object container oriented, it can be used for outposts, caves, or even derelicts, and more. It works as a modular system where locations will in fact be made of small elements that will be placed just like you do in City Builder RTS Editor. In a matter of minutes, we now have a new location where we can now create a bunch of cool gameplay. I've been trying to get something like this working it's in my own RTS game and I just couldn't. System. It's so hard, it's so Morgan. difficult. So, I'm Mark. I'm also a tools developer for the Planet Tech team. Do you know what's better than placing everything by hand? Not placing everything by hand. In order to do that, we use what we call connectors. Basically, artists create small parts of homesteads that we can then snap together. Every part is modular, so we can uh, interchange 
multiple ones. This is huge. To have uh, procedural homesteads. This is so change is very simple. So good for change, development. Like the whole inside of a homestead, or only a building that is a part of the homestead. In that way, it's very easy to make a lot of different buildings. This is so is huge. This is, is going to speed up things so much. So it moves as one. It can be deleted and changed, and it's basically all for connectors. So uh, back to you, Morgan. And last but not least, some of you may have noticed that the UI is not looking quite like an engine UI. And that's normal, as it's based on our in-game UI tech building blocks, and that for a reason. Well, today it's being used by our developers. One day, when it's ready and been properly tested internally, we'll make a version available to you, the player. Let's go! And Rasta, it's what will make you a pioneer. That's so cool, dude, that they're going to make this available for players. Thank you for watching. We are very excited about the tech we've shown you today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of Digital Citizen Con. So that was a small sample of what our team is working on. I hope you have enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of CitizenCon and thanks for watching. Wrestler is going to be big if, if players get their hands on it. As, no, or like a mod, mod it's team. <laughs> no, it's not me. It's time for the commercials. <laughs> Battle Royale, just what Star Citizen needed. Get out of here, man. <laughs> I really like Team Edmo. Moving, moving. I got you covered. Pushing. Got visual on the bridge door. Go what again. you missed? You missed the entire keynote of Planet Tech. Basically, um, they're developing a tool that can procedurally generate buildings. So you, you, you could just, you grab building or part of a building A, and then because everything can connect together, you, you, just, you just click any of the other builds, you just slap it on it, and then another one, you can build it as big as you want. And based on that, you can also click uh, like a drop down menu, like, okay, you know what? This is gonna be a storage building. So on top of that building, I want assets for um, for like a solar panel or like a lot of rubble on the roof because you know it's storage so you're going to be able to have a lot of storage boxes and all that and you, you can just you can just select that and that's all gonna do it for you and here's the best part that tool they are finishing it up currently or tr trying to finishing it up and then they're gonna put it in our hands for mothers so mothers can create all kinds of stuff for Star Citizen. We're recruiting across our industrial, security, exploration, and merchant divisions. They also showed off their new tool to create uh, rivers and uh, basins. Well, Kyle, to be honest, they already said from the beginning that they would have uh, mod support. So this is a great way to get started. To get started with mod support. Nobody knows what happened. He just dropped dead. But um, now it's yeah, they also showed off the loud guns who made that. <laughs> but they're also going to they're also make working on uh, rivers, basins, all that kind of stuff. We followed an elite team of researchers and And then of course they also want to retool that for uh, lava flows for the pyro system. Professor, there's a new case nearby. We need to check it out. Can they stop it in time? Yeah, I know, dude. I know.
I'm just terrible at video editing like this. I just cannot do this kind of stuff. Hey, Denny, it's you. <laughs> it's you and that Titan. Are you struggling with your career out in the verse? We are too, but we're here to help. The garden interstate. Get out of here. Get out of here, you meant to do that. The garden interstate does not guarantee fruits and vegetables will be available for all and cannot be held accountable for the lack thereof. Oh, space tomato. I feel a little called out by both Project Care Bear or and Garden Interstellar. And hey, at least we all know what my surprised voice sounds like now. But yeah, Kyle, that. true, man. We should that have done an ad. That was the Planet Tech panel, and the big news watching the chat was clearly Rastar, the beginnings of which will one day let players build their own outposts like the ones we've seen and others still yet to come. But up next, the cosplay contest returned this year, and it's been open for a couple months now. So the community oh team narrowed it down to a couple finalists, and then their panel of judges have selected the winners. If you're on Twitch and yet, or for I was not the Star Citizen the stream themselves... Yet. Why was I not asked to judge this year? You should you should close the Twitch chat for Star Citizen their own live stream it because might this be is because gonna. They figured out I was buzzed on British cough syrup during the 2019. Event. They're gonna shit all. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. They're gonna shit so on the, on all over the, some of the cosplayers. They're gonna be shitting all over these cosplayers for whatever reason. This one's fucking sick. <laughs> joking dude <laughs> fucking replace me ball <laughs> this one's fucking cool that grey cat one man <laughs> But yeah, Kyle, you're you're correct there. <laughs> I said you with your son. <laughs> All right, and the winners. Let's see what we have here. In third place, Calamity who's worked to prove that it's not all about armors and weapons. Sometimes you just have to look good on the dance floor at Wally's bar. In second place, Diabolus. Yeah. Back again and always a force to be reckoned with. This time the first one, legacy, number one, should be that great cat armor, man. And the laser sword. You can't just add a laser Number one sword. has to be that great cat armor, right? And finally, in first place, it's OG yeah, Star well deserved. Ken Shadow, who returns with a gray cat arrow armor. Complete yeah. with backpack created through a combination of EVA foam, 3D printed PLA, and poured resin for the clear pieces. Now, true story. Yeah, you're I right. I once spent the day pushing Ken Shadow around Disneyland in a wheelchair. But yeah, that number one is well deserved. That's so... That quality is fucking it's possible out of this world. Of. Crazy. Now, congratulations to all the winners, but there's still a fan favorite award. You can head over to the website now and cast your vote. Um... I Even a fan favorite the should be the was, great so I have one. no idea what any of these people won, but I'm going to assume it's a 15-minute call with Tyler Wicken to ask all the when questions you could ever want. Congratulations, everyone. Up next, it's one folks have been waiting for. Paul Rendell and Benoit Beausager take us through the programming and engineering looking glass with server meshing in the state of persistence. Starting meow. I, I'm really excited for this part, as well as uh, the part from uh, Tony Z. The concept of server, which has been ingrained since the beginning, has changed to become a mesh of servers. So how do we solve this? The answer should be simple. He did say meow. He did say meow. Jared Hi, Huckabee is such a troll. My name is Paul Reinder, and I'm the director of online technology here at CAG. I wanted to take this year's CitizenCon as an opportunity to give you some insight into our exciting persistent streaming and server meshing technology. 
In this talk, I will cover a quick overview of the current streaming and server architecture and how we plan to transform the existing tech into what we call persistent streaming and server meshing. I also have Benoit Beausejour with me, who later in the talk will give you more insight into the graph database that is powering persistent streaming. <laughs> hey Ben, how's it going? Hi Paul, hi everybody. I'm super excited to share some of the details about what the game services team at Turbulent has been working on to support Turbulent, let's go. the efforts to build this technology and make it a reality for you guys. Cool, uh, let's get started. Before we look into persistent streaming and server meshing and how this new technology will work, let's have a brief look at entity streaming and how our solar system. I think this guy is also reading from a, a, a teleprompter. Can be seen as one giant <laughs> He's smiling eventually. <laughs> from the sun to the wind, you're a rock, standing as one large map. Since this is a lot of data, the setup is split up into a hierarchy of nested object containers, which can be streamed in and out individually. If you look at an abstract view of Stanton, it all starts with one solar system root object container. This object container contains the sun, the planets, and the moons around each planet. Each of those locations <laughs> has its own object yeah. container, and if you take a closer look at the moon, you we will couldn't find get him here, man. I'm just gonna CGI him in. For example, a space station orbiting the moon. This setup keeps repeating, and the space station could be set up via multiple rooms, each defined by its own object container. Additionally, to the static hierarchy of object containers. There are also all the dynamic entities which bring the universe to life, NPCs, an interactive vending machine, and of course, players and spaceships. Most of these entities are made of a hierarchy as well. For example, a player has his body, an undersuit, and armor attached to it, and they're all mm -hmm. child entities of the player. The streaming this is gonna be another star these mini hierarchies as streaming groups to make sure that an object like a spaceship is. is always streamed in as one unit. Every time Loading one of their panel finishes, I get an, an email so notification. Every entity would be very expensive, especially on the client, but also on a single server. That's why we developed entity bind culling and object container streaming, which allows us to stream object containers and streaming groups individually. When the game server starts, all entities and object containers within the solar system are loaded into local memory of that game server. These entities are not streamed in, we just store the initial state in server memory. When a player connects, we create a so-called streaming bubble around that player, and object containers as well as streaming groups that are visible from the player's point of view are considered inside this bubble. Any object container that is inside the bubble will stream its content, and any streaming group within the bubble will also be streamed in on the server and then replicated to the client. Entities are considered inside the streaming bubble if their projected screen size on a virtual 1080p plane is larger than 5 pixel based on the distance of the player. So while a large object like a moon will be considered inside the bubble from far away, a small object like a ship will only be considered inside when it's much closer to the player. When the player starts moving across the universe, entities that leave the streaming bubble will become unbound and the replication layer will remove these entities from the client. Entities that enter the streaming bubble will get bound to the client, which cause the network layer to replicate these entities to the client, effectively streaming them in. We call this technique entity bind culling because streaming on the client is driven by the network layer, binding and unbinding entities. If entities are not in any client streaming bubble, so no players in their vicinity, these entities are also streamed out on the server. They go back into a dormant state where they are not simulated. Okay. This is already known now. This model works quite well on the client. However, it doesn't scale well on the server. While we do stream entities oh, on the server, boy. no players close to them, the poor distribution of players will cause the DGS to load more. Yo, these entities. clients are false, dude. The none of, the, none of us are getting 60 FPS. The these are fake clients. The player being at every single location increases. And that basically nullifies the benefit of server side streaming. So how do we solve this? The answer should be simple. Allow multiple instances of the game server to work together so they can split up the work. Well, it's not quite that simple. Let's have a look at the current architecture. As of today, we have a traditional client server architecture. One instance of a dedicated game server serves up to 50 clients. This is called instance as the dedicated game server has its own instance view of the persistent universe. 
Once a server is full, you start a new server instance, which then serves additional 50 players. As we've seen before, when a DGS instance is created, it loads a unique version of the standard system into its local server's memory. Therefore, each dedicated game server instance has a unique copy of every single object. Yeah, you're going to need a master server to direct these, these game servers, like what, the of the game which server what and instance has to load. Down, these entities are deleted. The goal of server meshing is to allow multiple DGS instances to work together and divide simulation costs between each server and the mesh. In the best case, we can scale this to infinity by adding more nodes to the mesh. As we saw earlier, each server node stores the state of entities locally. If we want to mesh these servers together, we need to find an efficient way to synchronize state between each server. With our current architecture, depending on the vision of the simulation and the overlap, this would require a lot of synchronization points between each node. It's an exponential problem, as in the worst case, each node would need to talk to each other node in the mesh, severely limiting our ability to scale it. To solve this issue, we are separating need a mass server. applications. Instead of just meshing multiple dedicated game servers together and have them synchronize state between each other, we are introducing a new layer called replication layer. The replication layer has two major functions. It holds the state of every entity in memory, and replicates the state to clients, but also to server nodes. I set server nodes because in this setup, the traditional dedicated game server becomes a game server node. This server node connects to the replication layer, very similar to a client, and only a subset of entities are replicated to that server node. Replication to server nodes is controlled by the network bind culling algorithm that we saw earlier, and is driven by streaming bubbles. And it works very similar to how it works on clients. The server node has certain streaming bubbles assigned to it, which will cause the replication layer to replicate entities from these streaming bubbles to the server node. Contrary to a player's client, the server node has the additional responsibility to execute server-side authoritative code for those entities, controlling AI, doing damage calculations, etc., etc. The result of the simulation is then written back from the server node to the yeah. replication layer, and from there it is replicated to all connected clients and other server so nodes. So server node is 30 FPS. Since streaming bubbles mm. can overlap, entities may be replicated to multiple okay. server nodes, exactly the same way how they are currently replicated to multiple clients if players are at the same location. Then again, you, you wouldn't, two for Star Citizen, you wouldn't need the same entity, only like 128 tick rate servers. Over any given entity. And only that server is allowed to wouldn't need that for Star Citizen. to the replication layer. This is usually the first server node who replicated the entity, and other server nodes will only run client code on those entities. Basically, you can see a game server node as a client with authority to write the result of its local simulation back to the replication layer. Authority can transform True, between server yeah. nodes. For example, 60 if tick would be the streaming would be bubble great. of the current authoritative server, it is then transferred Star to the Marine has to be at least 60 tick, right? You know that arcade game? Authority can Star Marine and the Arena Commander sh should be 60 tick rate at all times, honestly. Maybe not Arena Commander, but Star Since Marine we for now sure. Mesh multiple server instances together to simulate a shared state of the universe. We no longer call this instance, but instead we call it shard. A shard is still a unique version of the universe, and we still have multiple shards running in parallel. Eh, who knows? However, the server mesh will lift our current hard limit of 50 players, and it will enable us to steadily increase the number of players we can support within one shard. It will take some time, and in our first version of server meshing, we will still have a very similar situation as we have today, with quite a few shards yep. running in parallel. However, this technology is going to enable us to start scaling the universe to become a true MMO experience. There are some fundamental differences between a shard and an instance. And for this, we need to take a closer look at the replication layer and talk a little bit about persistent streaming. Previously, the entity state was held entirely in memory on the dedicated game server. And besides some selected persistent player items, all that state would be lost when the server is shut down or crashed. The replication layer is fundamentally different as the entire state of the universe is stored within a graph database. We call this entity graph and it's an evolution of the original iCache. When we create a new shard, the initial entity state of the universe is seeded into this database. This happens offline before we let player join the shard. When the shard comes online, the replication mesh caches the state from the entity graph. 
As player connect with the shard and as we start to spin up new server nodes, simulation begins and alter the state of the universe. The replication layer does not only replicate these state changes to connect players and server nodes, it also replicates the state into the entity graph. Since the entity graph is a persistent database, the state of the shard is never lost, and even if the shard is shut down, the state persists and can be resumed at a later time. Benoit is going to show you some more technical details about the entity graph. Thank you, Paul. Get ready for a deep dive into the entity graph persistence database. Oh, I'm ready for this deep dive. <laughs> The entity graph is our approach to persisting the game world. This is fundamentally different to what is happening today in the game where only items you own are actually stored. Our objective is to be able to save the state of the replication layer, which includes all entities in a given universe shard in order to provide a truly persistent world where actions you take as a player can influence environments in the game world permanently. The entity graph, as the name implies, stores game data as a graph. This representation is native for the game engine because it is how internally those data structures the game uses are addressed and manipulated. Correct. Correct. Using a graph also has several advantages. We're basically storing and retrieving from a gigantic index but list. But this would also mean that edges. if a server crashes, those edges you those wouldn't notice it because another node but in order to properly explain would spool up and take over the game world as the game engine so say if the replication the layer or the, the master server starts seeing that your server health is decreasing structure. it would spool up a, tree, a new a server dynamically later on first it's going to be static but later on it's going to be dynamic and it's going to spool up a world, new server also how prior to your server crashing so you'll be migrated to a new For server example, prior to that server having a 30k. Entities that make up different parts of the if that makes sense. Vehicle. Each part is parented to another entity until the root of the ship is reached. Each of these entity nodes holds properties with regard to what the entity represents in the game. The class of object it is, the item type, its legal owner, orientation, and of course its very precise physical location within the game world. Each edge in our graph qualifies the relationship to the parent. In the case of a vehicle, our edges store properties that tell the system which port is being used to attach the entity into the parent and what kind of attachment. Correct, Carl. Correct. An item port attachment, a zone attachment, many others. In a constellation, for example, the different major sections of the hull are entity nodes with edges to the ship root. We Basically, uh, what you also see in in uh, uh, in the game Foxhall, you have two shards clearly because there are so many players. It's called the aggregate root because it sits at the top of the shard. One is the main one, and a shard two is where all the other people go. An aggregate, with the aggregate when uh, the when the first server is being overloaded. For example, a first-person weapon. But those are separate; they don't communicate with each other. Is a small hierarchy of entities. We distinguish the aggregate roots from other nodes by giving it a label. Labels allow us to distinguish and rapidly look up and find nodes of a specific type, either when we retrieve parts of the graph or when we look up specific nodes. Those labels exist to allow correct reversal of the, of the graph data when we query for specific things in the game world. Other labels include streaming groups. And the most hilarious part about this all is that everyone, there's so many people really that think server meshing is basically like, but the true just buy more AWS servers, kick W. Additional information is required for a fully functional ship. The insides of each of those structural entities have to be fleshed out. That's what a lot Object of people think. Just buy more servers. Just buy more servers. Get W. Aggregates and what part of the hierarchy they're in. In fact, most major areas of ships are represented as they are the dumb OC people, entities yeah. attached to the ship root or another OC. The shape of this data actually takes in reality. But it's something you see a lot there. because they work with Amazon Lumberyard. Course, They're like, each of those oh, you're part of AWS, man. Just, just buy more servers, Cat W. To have the common static and dynamic entities you're used to playing with, like elevators, beds, guns, seats, gimbals, and others. In addition to object containers that make up the structure of the ship, other aggregates can nah. also be attached with nah, the entire Nah, it, it's not going to be like that. Rover parked in the cargo bay of our They're going to go like a sub uh, to from 50 to like 100 and then 150 and then 200, you know, like they're going to scale it up with the more um, for each of those entities, the more working implementations they can do. This document contains all the runtime values the game components attached to those entities. 
This data is the dynamic part of the model where game developers can persist variables on any entity in the game world according to the rules of a game component. For example, damage state and health data are stored within the snapshot uh, document of those ship entities. Storing and retrieving data in graph form really have some awesome properties. Yeah, and Carl, and, and it's going to be even more servers because the first implementation will be static server meshing. So without a overhead edges, server spooling up new servers and shutting down servers as people are, are in like one area in or leaving another area. And the data set can be sharded across multiple database instances reliably. One key element here and one big advantage... So say the first implementation would be Stanton as a rights. So, server uh, and... Pyro as a server, that, all the hierarchical changes that they would both be on at the same time, even though example, if there, even if there's no one in Pyro, everyone's in Stanton, Pyro would still be on. In this case, a in dynamic, that would mean like they're shutting down Pyro because, well, there's nobody there. Nice as soon as somebody goes there, also that Pyro is the up again. Where they were detaching a single entity or an entire, if you know what I mean. In both cases, the single edge must be erased in order to perform the detach. Rolling away in your stowed rover, detaching a gun from a replacement or uh, for a replacement, or selling a turret becomes really a cheap operation to persist. That is good because that happens very frequently. Compared to a columnar approach where index columns must be maintained for every write, linking all objects to the aggregate root, this is a really a great performance improvement. The same properties apply with the attach command, which will only have to create a single edge when rejoining items to the hierarchy be it via attachment or parking another vehicle on a docking. Ship to ship docking, boys. The attach and detach commands are two of the many semantic commands that the entity graph API proposes, allowing to express a mutation to the graph. Other examples of the different commands are create, possess, transfer, stack, unstack, change location, yeah, dude, it's crazy. Snapshot, bury, stow, and unstow. One important change in addition, that comes about with the entity graph is also how mutations are applied to the database. Each mutation is composed of multiple commands which are executed in sequence but committed transactionally to the database. Dude, I would they not succeed together. I would not want to be part of their network back. engineering team. This is this this just sounds like headache day in, day no out. Lost rights or errors can cause data corruption. This is so incredibly example, complicated. A mutation consisting of detach, transfer, and then attach commands would succeed only if all three commands are applied successfully. The system retrieves a constant ordered streams of mutation from the replicant scribes that are part of the replication layer and are enqueued. Yeah, I wouldn't know about that. I don't ensure that know no anything about EVE. Lost, even if the service is unavailable or paused. It's important to understand that the graph does not only cover your ships and items, but the entire game world is made up this way. Your ship is actually attached to the zone host location you travel in. Your playing character is attached to your ship seat when you are piloting it, just like planets are attached to their star system routes. The game world, though, must exist in persistence before it can be replicated and mutated. This is part of a process called Eve was indeed ahead, but it's not, near, uh, not nearly as complicated as this because you also have like that millions of all the first person stuff to talk about. Bang. At this stage, every object container, every minor or major entity from planets to doorknobs are inserted into the entity graph in their default state. That is the state that the Single designers thread. decided Ugh. was the initial state of the world. This process goes down from the universe route to the star system route and into the different areas and planets, into their landing zone, their buildings, their rooms, down to the smallest possible entity. There are multiple types of entities that are created during this process. Yeah, I bet. First are unstreamable entities, which make up the skeleton of the universe. Those are entities you do not get to see, but are part of and always present on every worker node in the mesh. It is by looking up unstreamable entities that the game world is able to stream in the other types of entities into your client and into the server mesh. It is from those all from those entities that others entities bloom. Static entities make up the game world that you cannot interact with. Most map objects that make up buildings like the Hurston Tower, rooms and walls of hospitals, or the bar at G-Lock are all made up of static entities. And the last type 
is dynamic entities. These are entities that you, as a player, can manipulate. A bottle on a bar, a door in a level, a ship component. Everything you interact with when you're playing the game. Of course, during seeding, all object containers are also seeded as part of this hierarchy and inform the shape of the loadable subgraphs. God, this the seeding process takes a couple this of minutes to complete. Crazy. Once created, this newly seeded database represents a full dimension of the universe and will now persist as it is modified by players. As you play the game and go about with your ship, your playing character entity moves from location to location, getting attached to new zones as you travel. Your player aggregate is itself part of the Jang graph, and your location and state are persisted by the replication layer scribes to the entity graph of your given territory. When you interact with dynamic objects and their properties change, the state, the state of that entity will not persist until it is it's, this instance of the database is undeployed. There are, in fact, multiple copies dude, of the universe is that crazy, are seeded at dude. a given time. We call those shards. Each shard is a unique copy of the game world, complete with all of its entities and unique states. Think of it as an alternate universe. Dynamic entities that have been modified in each dimension will have different states. The bottle on the bar was moved, or the door was destroyed, might not be in the same state between shards. This technique is a way to gain scalability as our player base grows. A single shard can grow to host multiple millions of entities. Even if each shard database is itself clustered and can grow substantially past a single machine, there is a point where multiple clusters are needed. As you join the persistent universe, the matchmaking system is getting retooled in order to select the correct universe shard for you to play on. Using multiple data points like your friend's location, your active party, your last game session, and or which shards still have items on it that you own. This is to ensure as much as possible that you end up on the same shard you expect to be as a player. So it's gonna be matchmaking, so it's not like you get a In list of like worlds that you can select. Experience. It would be terrible if you lost items you used when you were in a given shard versus another, or if your character was bound to a shard forever. When this gets this, implemented, the system includes the there's going to be another game wipe. Unstowed entities. There's going to be another game wipe when this is, is implemented, because all these shards will be active in a shard database spread and out, actively simulated on by the worker nodes of the replication layer. Stowed entities are player-owned entities that are stowed in inventory containers. Unless they can, inventories. they can keep the entity graph and replicate it across all shards. Called the global database, a large cluster database that spans all shards. Aggregate roots in that shard are stored and linked with edges. To yeah, possibly. Nodes. That could also be a Any thing. Any entity in a shard can have an inventory node in global for stowing things in it. For example, a box entity that is unstowed in a shard would have an inventory node in the global database to store its content. This allows to keep unsimulated entities in a non-shard specific database while keeping the live aggregate within the shard. As you transition between shards, your playing character gets unstowed into the selected shard. This process effectively moves your player aggregate data from the global database to the shard database. Your player entity now gets simulated. I the think they're going to go for a fresh slide with that. It is being updated at a regular rate as you play and move around the game world. Accessing That'd be items that the are most like a ship from the ASOP terminal. Like it, it's basically it's an alpha. You expect you expect wipes, right? Same goes for personal inventories. You, you expect or wipes cargo inventories. with when you an alpha. A ship to be spawned, the system so why would they not the use that instead of a shard you know having everything put onto the replication layer the first and then replicate it all across all shards? Pad. The ship gets stowed back into the global database, making it available for unstow. In it be, shard. I think the a lot of initial computing power that you would need for that. Might as well want to Hero start off with a fresh slate. Be available for in any At shard least that, to me, sounds already in use. most the process of plausible one. Unstowing also helps to alleviate problems related to but entity authority. Who knows, man. Only game worker nodes in the right shard can update unstowed entities in that shard. I personally would start this off like a fresh. This nice property of the server meshing and persistent streaming architecture in that the state of the entities are being persisted transactionally during play, be it in a shard or global database through stowing, a single server crash, or 30k, should no longer result in item loss. This model also has a real scalability benefit that stems from the separation of the read-intensive work workloads that are isolated to the global DB from the write-intensive workloads that are handled by the individual shard database. 
The global graph exists to provide seamless access to your belongings <laughs> no in a shard loss. or alternate universe you're currently playing in. Okay, let's go back to Paul to learn about some of the benefits of the server meshing architecture. Yeah, the first benefit some is of the, the benefits huh? that we don't have this issue of synchronization between different server nodes. Each server node has one single connection to the replication layer, which is used to push and get updates for entities of interest. The second advantage is that the same streaming and replication logic yeah, that I guess. for clients can be applied to servers, and that server nodes will only stream in a small area, which will greatly increase performance. It also allows us to increase resilience down the but road. But Kyle, imagine so working on this as a network engineer. The client stays connected even if the server node crashes. In this case, the simulation for an entity may be stopped for a moment, but as soon as a new server comes online, the simulation will just continue. While the underlying tech is close to completion, there are some upcoming challenges that we need to solve before we can give that into your hands. The first version of this technology will contain a static server mesh. Instead of the fully dynamic mesh that we saw earlier, the static mesh assigns server nodes to predefined sections of the solar system. This I understand the quite a bit of what they that game code has to address in this first release. What they mean here. And there will also be but, a lot of challenges no, for the is... game services and uh, game feature teams. Or maybe I wouldn't even want to be part of this, more. honestly. Yeah, there are many parts of the game that are affected by this new server meshing uh, architecture. So any gameplay feature that uh, has to rely on the concept of a server, right? Currently, when you connect to a game server, we know what match you're in. So to send messages and update to that server, we simply locate your active match and then send those messages out there. That concept needs to change because we now have a mesh to deal with. And so there are multiple game servers that need to receive this information. They need to be able to subscribe dynamically to it or unsubscribe dynamically to players transitioning uh, through them. So you can imagine that this will affect things like missions that currently are spawned locally on the game server. These now need to be spawned globally within the shard and also persist their state. So all services that are attached to missions, uh, where whether it's the quantum system in the back in the back end or the quasar. Tools, oh yeah, that's know, also a thing. God damn. The shard. That's also going to be another goes panel deep into with like Tony things Z. that are mechanical, like you know, getting global chat to work on a server. That concept now needs to be extended to the shard, where this will probably push us to implement this as a location-based chat, for example. And so many teams in the company now need to change their feature to take into account the meshing technology that's behind it because the concept of server which has been ingrained since the beginning has changed to become a mesh of servers yeah exactly um so i also want to shout out to the network team who's working on the replication layer and the bind culling as well as the persistent tech team who's working on the entity and object container streaming and as benoit <laughs> said also all the other teams that work on gameplay features or gameplay services that are affected by this new technology um, there are a lot of devs working on this, and we are very I wouldn't excited mind to a global chat, technology. but at least make it time. like that you can toggle it. Like, I don't want to see global chat and only see local chat. Like, just turn it off. Incoming transmission. Is this working? Good. Hey, look, I don't have much time. They call me Chris the Menace, and I have been framed for homicide. I am here at the Clesher Rehabilitation Center. I have a bounty on my head for 500,000 credits because I am offering 1 million credits for somebody to come and rescue me. I can't leave. I am being watched. I need help. I don't have much time. Please come and help me. Nah, man, I wouldn't be part of any of this, honestly. Just mind-blowing all of this. I wouldn't want to be part of any of this. Databases? Fuck, man. Yeah. I don't like working with databases. 
SQL can fuck right off. Miners are of a unique breed. It's not about doing the job. It's about doing the job right. No matter how small or big. It's your boy Argo. <laughs> Doing the job right. Dude, I actually regret from not our starfarers not making an advertisement for our own org for this. Offices and facilities, and in communities around the verse, we're continuously innovating to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. <laughs> God, this is nightmare fuel, dude. Ultima Energy. <laughs> this fucking nightmare fuel. Who said he could use my set? All right, fine. So we're gonna redo the whole thing now with no graphics and uh, orange lights. Ready? Is that a new 3D model? So we introduced the replication layer, a new and improved architecture for meshing servers. Uh, it solves our problems observed in the naive meshing approach, namely multiple connections and authority. Uh, the entity graph is, is new the persistence of the replication layer and uses pizza. graph data to persist the entire oh, yeah. game universe. Why and the, the main focus of pizza? all this is on making all game systems and features work in a no server concept. Where multiple servers who told who the fuck t told also, Jared he could ever break will likely be a static server mesh and it will come as all things do I see you asking in the chat when we feel it's ready he really comes in here and uses my lights now moving along earlier in the day we saw the first look at the anvil liberator revealed earlier today during the ship talk panel so check out the website to learn more, and you can submit your questions for the Q&A on oh, man. that'll be released in the coming days. Also, don't forget about the I really like, uh, SC Watch um, Party on Twitter and Instagram contest. I can't help but notice that uh, Morphologists and Burks have one going, and I wasn't invited. I mean, I wasn't invited to any of them. Now I really day. like how they say, like, it's ready when it's ready with I server meshing. I could just... But space and respond there in the when you've been waiting for so long, like, is there like no indication you could give like one to two board. years or two plus like years at least? But up next, my vote for sleeper hit of the day, Addy and Graham take us. I mean, not that it changes anything office. if they were to the say it like two years later. CIG audio in the sounds of space, starting now. But I didn't even address anything like where some devs on spectrum said that um they sort of expected like q2 2022 like the first implementation hi didn't my even name address that Lipson, and i'm lead audio programmer here at cloud imperium games hello i'm eddie kelch and i'm one of the sound designers working at cloud imperium games and we're here to talk about some of the big developments we've got going on in audio tech specifically sig audio and claudius which is a new audio engine layer and associated tool that we hope will greatly improve the development experience of our sound design team. Getting started on this project can be quite challenging due to the amount of tools that we have involved in implementing audio into the engine. And with the Claudius tool, we aim to streamline that process as much as possible. This talk will be very much focused on workflow and tech, and as such, there won't be too many sort of exciting explosion sounds going off and things like that. But you know, this is all about how we improve the workflow for our sound design team, and we know these guys can make amazing sounds anyway. Thanks, Graham. So before we get into Did the, news, fucking let's feet take touch, a little huh? look at the history and where we are now and what inspired us to go down this development path. Up until this point, so much of the data that we use has been owned and stored in the data of other tools that are not owned by the audio team or by the audio code team. 
tools such as Mannequin, the character tool, Track View, the UI code, Data Forge. All of these tools are designed for other teams to work with, and audio can sometimes feel like a bit of an afterthought within those tools. Additionally to this, because the data is stored within the files for those tools, we end up with a lot of data that's scattered around different areas. It can be difficult to dig in and find what we want. Also, when we're loading these tools, we have to load up all the data. So for example, if it's an animation tool, we have to load lots of animation data when really we're not actually working with that. There can be huge learning curves involved and lots of time spent switching between tools that impacts our development by swallowing up time. A lot of our ways of working haven't changed in a very long time, and we thought it was time to take a step back. Man, it's already like a quarter past ten. God damn. See if we can come up with solutions for all of them by coming up with a completely new design that addresses all the issues that we face day to day and tries to overcome them in an elegant way that makes the sound designers' lives much easier and makes their job. That's still like almost three hours okay. left. <laughs> So with Claudius, what we did was we put workflow... Oh no, not cool Visual design. Studio. From day one when we started oh working on the design of the SIG Audio and Claudius systems, we wanted to make sure that workflow was always the focus of how things were working. We never wanted the tools to be in the way Visual or needed them to. And Visual Studio, sure that Studio brings me... Tools could be as smooth and as fun nightmares. as possible. Yeah, it, it's going on until 1am, uh, our time. Workflow is quite important and it's going to become an integral aspect on this project. Currently we have quite a bit of focus shifting and that tends to break momentum. Um, not only that, uh, audio seems to be treated a lot as a production aspect of the game at the moment and this tool is going to help shift that to post-production where it should be. Yeah, Let me see, what really do we point. have left? One of the main things we wanted to do with the tool was to make sure that it could be used as a post-production tool so that you could take, you could effectively take... We're at the sound of space of currently, no audio guy could see which is a 45-minute panel. Quickly, and then the sound design could be implemented on top of that really quickly, and this could all be done completely downstream of all the stuff and before it. And after that, that practice, we have systemic gameplay, stream of thoughts, we never work in the, in the which is sort of post-production way that... An like hour a, and you know, forty-five minutes, film post -house would and after that, but you have to clo the closing with uh, Chris Roberts. We've we think we've made a really good tool, and part of how we've achieved that is by sort of completely oh, abstracting the audio data away from the code that calls it. The calling code knows nothing of what the result of what it will, what it is saying will do, so it will trigger some parameters and some events, but it doesn't know what the audio system. Is. Oh. And there's a very clear. I'm very sorry. Between yeah. the audio system no, and no the idea what that was. It. And likewise, so in the audio system, we uh, we don't care where the events and parameters came from. All we care about is what we do with them and how it makes things sound good. And now, with all this data in one place, uh, it's going to make it extremely swift and also a lot more inclusive uh, to fix bugs. By inclusive, what I mean is audio QA is going to... Why do websites always need to have, like, their volume of videos at, like, 100% blasting through your, uh, blasting yeah, through your fucking... Really point, like, Speakers. Because we've got all this data in one place, and we've also got the game's behaviors in one Let place. Let me mute this tab. What we've done is we've integrated all the the bugging side. tools into the exact same tool that the sound designers are using. So an audio there, QA person is working in exactly the same place, but they've got an interest in some different data. So what they care more about is like, why is something not sounding as it should, or is the system behaving as it should? We want to offer up all the information that they need, and what that means is that then they can yeah the systemic gameplay stream of thought are. and in some cases they can probably that's going to be a big one become so obvious Couple also really important because uh sound designers to be able to tony zurovec is going to be so part of that implement something in which is the director of persistent universe game and fundamentally there's there should be no difference between you so that's going to be the and playing it out and the biggest panel game in a real game scenario and doing the same thing so what we it's a little bit shorter than life in the verse anything doesn't work but that's it's still book, that's on us guys we need to fix it and you guys can completely trust the tool and that means that you don't need to spend lots of time it's still testing. big i think uh trust is a good word i think that trust is also going to be uh coupled with the just a whole new improvement in uh in our daily lives when it comes to implementing audio into the into the game yeah sorry dude i didn't mean to have that audio so blasting, but it's the fucking itself. Star Citizen website. We've done is we've introduced, uh, and there was no mute button either. Allows you guys to implement whatever you want Not a C-related, but I noticed Ewok and a friend of ours playing Foxhole. Connor bought as well, I'm getting it next week.
But the design of Claudia's I can't afford it, dude. Is interesting I can't afford getting it. The tool itself doesn't hold any data of its own. All it does is Need export save up for stuff. that exists within the game engine. What this means for us so is that I won't be buying update, it anytime soon. When you make a change in Claudia's tool, it live updates in the game and it immediately responds and the change that you made is immediately apparent in the game. That means it comes as standard because we're actually operating on the data that the game is running with. And actually, because of the design, it's not possible to implement an audio feature without implementing live update. And that was at the very core of this design because, again, we were completely thinking about workflow, about ease of use, and about limiting the amount of time you guys spend sort of, you know, rebooting the game or you know, trying mm. to get your actions to be reflected in the game. You already uh, mentioned it, but I think that you know, little to no code support aspect of Claudius is really going to be groundbreaking for us. I think that life is going to become iteratively a lot easier uh, as we're able to just quickly, you know, just not again, focus shifting, right? That's not going to really be a thing anymore. Uh, and that's going to be great. Not only that, uh, all these parameters that we want to get access to based on the data, uh, we're going to get access to that by just going into the game. I wish I could use guns. Something like a weapon. And by picking up that weapon now, and it not gonna, actually you know, sticking onto my hands the, forever. The character, so it means that we're going to be able to that attach been great. all these different sounds to that gun, based on what the player is doing. And I don't know, it, it's going to make so many of these things uh, possible, and it, it just wasn't before. Yeah, what we're trying to do is make so much data available to you where you need it and in an intuitive way. And what that means is that you know, when you, as you say, if you spawn a weapon in the game, it immediately becomes visible in the Claudius tool. And if you perform an action on that weapon, such as firing it or reloading it, those actions immediately become available and visible in the Claudius tool and available for you to implement. And what that means is that we're putting the implementation right alongside it happening in the game. Claudius uses a, a reactive programming model. And what that means is that as the data comes in, the visual side of what you see updates live and it updates immediately. And it also has some sense of what's relevant because if you're running an actor around, then the most recent events received by the game or sent by the game would be the movements of his limbs, the footsteps, that kind of thing. And you get to see those things immediately in the tool. Mm -hmm. And you can even filter by time. So you can look at things, you, you can like clear out what the, the view, fuck? perform an action. And now that's the only thing you can see. So you get really <laughs> quick, easy access. Bro. to the data you need. And Why? tech, I think, just puts us in a great position to continue to support the ever-increasing demands of CIG's games. Why, dude? I also think that the designers... I mean, thank you. ...be quite empowered... By God damn, the thank you very much, but why? ...creative aspects because of this tool. Yeah, that's the whole philosophy of this design, is to empower the sound designers to be sound designers. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to install it after... Uh, oh, God. I'm going to install it after uh, CitizenCon. God damn. So thanks, man. A Th thanks a lot. Example. I'm actually, as we've mentioned, all the it's a game that I kind of do want to stream, in the but also not because in the it's game. The game is just Stream Snipe Central, about what the audio system and I know I don't have a lot of viewers, but it. Stream Snipers so happen with example, every channel. The weapon fired, it now has five rounds in the magazine. I even got Stream Snipe on Day Z back in the day, Arma 2 and Day Z. That 12 viewers. And there was this much atmospheric pressure around it. Or uh, man, this, uh, thanks, man. Thank, so thank no you. Pressure. You know, all these sort of contextual things. Much appreciate available. it. Thank you. And the decisions about what that data actually means to you guys all completely come down to you. So all we do is we, as programmers, is we provide as much data as we possibly can in a place where you can use it. What amazes me about this tool is it's, it's going to just be as simple as, you know, hooking up a couple mm -hmm. nodes and seeing the results in the editor. Uh, not only that, all this... Com Can I do this too in game? We have, uh, we're going to have access to all these parameters. So <laughs> I easily. give item KLWE so pistol the, energy the zero of, one. Say, having a different reload sound. Based Test on infinite ammo. ammo. Can I give myself that? Mag, is, it's going to be, you know, rather simple to, to implement. Yeah, absolutely. What we've, what we've done here is we've gathered all the data that may or may not be relevant to you, and we don't mind whether it is or not. We deal with all that code side, the efficiencies of that, 
and you guys get access to any data that you may or may not be interested in. So you could do like crazy things if you wanted. You know, yeah. you could make it so that the reload sound sounds different if there are, like you say, if there are d different number of rounds in the mic. But you might want to make the reload sound sound different if the if the character's wearing armor or not. Yeah. I mean, that makes no sense. But the, but you know all this data becomes available to you and it's totally up to you guys what you do with it. So we're opening up lots of po you know, possibilities. I think that comes back to empowering the sound designers again. I think all this freedom creatively, is, it's, it's, it's going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that sort of giving you that creative freedom, I think is going to be amazing to see what comes out of that. Because, you know, for example, we can have, uh, we can have something like a, a parameter that says whether it's nighttime or not. And if you wanted, you could change the whole aesthetic of the game, change all the sounds based on it being nighttime. Yeah. And, and that would require no input from the code team because we've given you the data that you need. Yeah. Pew, 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 pew. So let's dig down a little into some specific features of Claudius and look at budgeting and aggregation. In this video, we have a set of audio trigger spots that are all playing the same sound. We haven't applied any sort of budgeting to them, so they all play, they're all taking up resources, and we can hear them all, so you know the mix can be a little bit sort of muddied by just how many of them are playing. I want to show here just how simple it is to deal with that and to reduce the budget for the sounds that they're playing. So here we go to the audio source settings, and we, we're going to add um, we're going to add a new category, which is how we budget, and we're going to reduce the number of sounds in that category that can play at any one time. As I said before, this all updates live, so um, every change we make now is going to be reflected in the game. And when we spin back to the, the game view now in the editor, you'll see that because we set the, the budget to five, only five of those sounds are now playing, represented by a sort of lighter green. We can go back and we can change the budget, and again, that will you know, drop it a little bit more. And you can see now only the closest three to the camera are currently playing. And then we'll just whiz the, the budget back up so you can see they all come back again when, uh, when you do that. Now, that's the budgeting feature, and that's one tool to sort of reduce the amount of resources we use. This, so actually, we also do this is actually is like a small uh, optimization, but also really important. ...are not allowed to play because of the budget are prevented from playing. So what we do is uh, we have a system called an aggregation. Like system. on a large scale, and this could have a lot of impact. Of sounds that hasn't been Especially if you, if you have like an 890 jump and there's like 30 people on your 890 all like running around making footsteps. That's a bunch of resources it's taken. So here we're going to do a really simple example. We're going to... This is actually uh, a sort of quite useful too. ...tone to this, uh, to this aggregate. And what this aggregate will do is it will represent all of those sounds that aren't playing. Now, we offer lots of parameters to this aggregation system, but the aggregate is aware of how many sounds it represents, it's aware of the position, it's aware of the spread of them. So lots of information is made available to the sound designers so that they can represent this mass of sounds with just a single audio source. Okay, so 100. Now you can see that there's a further green, light green blob in amongst all the dark green. And what that is, is that's the aggregated sound. So that will move to the center of wherever the crowd of non-playing sounds is. And as you can see, it kind of skips around in this video, but we, we have smoothing options so that it doesn't sort of jump around and become jarring. Um, it just moves around as quickly or slowly as you want it to with the crowd of sounds that it's attempting to represent. And what this means for us is that it makes it a lot easier to sort of clean up the mix if you've got a lot of things that have been added to a level. They've been added by a non-audio person and with maybe not so much understanding of the consequence of that. It gives us really easy ways of dealing with that. You can see here, if we increase the budget, the, uh, the aggregated sound moves further away. And then if we completely reduce the budget... This is actually quite, quite useful, just fixed especially for the normal right, developers uh, that just place sounds audio sounds sources sorry, everywhere. Sounds are not playing. Now, this is a really simple example. None of these sounds are moving, but if they were moving, then that blob would move appropriately to the position where all those sounds are moving. I think what this tech has showed us is um, for ambience work specifically, the designers are going to have quite a lot of uh, uh, creative freedom uh, to. This is going to be go wild incredibly important when they do something to, like. To help us clean up. Uh, what's it called again? Mix, but, uh, um, you know, the, the voice count and the channel counts. What we had in it's May. It's also a, a good way for us to create accurate uh, background dialogue or. As we With call the it, javelin and all that. For bespoke locations. What's that event called and, uh, again? I think it's going to bring a lot more life to, to locations. Absolutely. 
but also aggregate logic doesn't have to be used for those purposes and with the bingo or abstract purposes as well so we can use the logic system within the audio system to understand but how many that event if you have like a big so crowd of people if like say, all applauding for something tells the audio system that it exists this could really be useful for that to play a sound on all if you want screens, every ai to actually, different actually different have a sound source we want. but we can track counts and we can track you know how many of a certain object type there are and we can use that information to inform something like the mix so you can have a mix that's maybe specific to forests you want something to sound like a forest you want to bring in some ambience that makes it sound like a forest and that can all be driven by this set of data that we're not actually playing sounds directly on but we're just using it to inform the mix another feature that we have in Claude yeah in a forest it could be useful too like say what every tree is to implement has like an audio, audio source attached to it for like forest then, ambient or like ambience on child nodes of that node. if you have like a bunch of trees you would hear like 300 of those do the same thing as the parent audio sources now that's quite and now you'll just have one central that. source that but, moves uh, around as you move around use a single set of events and parameters to express audio across multiple nodes in the game I think this comes back to the example that we used before about you know a weapon reloading um, and so by overriding that logic we're going to be able to place audio events on specific parts of the weapon uh, and make them form based on what the character is doing. Um, yeah, it just seems like a really powerful tool to have. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's all about putting all the power in your hands. Yeah. You know, for example, you might have something like a, a, a character who jumps and lands, mm. and th that jump event can be expressed on any bone of his body. So if he's wearing a watch, you can make it jingle. Yeah. You know, if, if he's if he's got a cracky knee you can make it crack when he lands or something and you know all these different things can be done and they're all available to you by default and quite easy to implement as well as we're yeah. seeing another thing we have in claudius is a set of systemic parameters and what they are is a set of parameters that are available by default who is he explaining this to is he explaining this to the other audio guy or to us the audience because he just keeps looking at the other guy and not the audience so for example you can do so who is he explaining this to pressure and the acceleration of an object and you can use that to express some wind noise and uh, that's something that previously would have allowed would have required code support but you guys can just dive in and do it on literally anything you can add an audio a sig audio component to something that the audio system's never seen before and you can start expressing the audio on these things in this way claudius i think rationalizes the whole process of uh, being a sound designer on this project all that relevant information is going to be in one place and it, it's going to be quite digestible especially for people just getting started yeah absolutely we want the sound design process to be as organic as possible and we want you guys to have the freedom to just express yourselves and that's the point of getting all this data to you by default mm. so let's take a look at an example of something you can do using sig audio and claudius without any code support here we're adding a sig audio component to uh, an entity type that's never had one on it before it's a really simple thing to do we just drop the component in in data forge and then uh, we, we can jump over to the editor and we can spawn one of these things and i'm going to use the example of a, a plushie here and what we're going to do is we're going to use some of these systemic parameters and events that are come for free without any extra code support and we're going to use them to express was that a mini wheel? Example, like on those wheel plushies? The contents of this plushie. So uh, what it looks like yeah. a cuddly toy right now is going to turn into some sort of water container. So we're going to put a kind of water sloshing loop on this thing. So we need to respond to its spawn event and uh, also its despawn event. So the sound stops if it ever gets despawned. And we can add an audio source that is the water sloshing sound. And then if we hook that up, it's going to start playing that sound. But the way these uh, sounds are set up is that they don't play anything unless certain parameters are set on them so they're muted until for example uh, they have some sort of rotational or directional movement on them because you don't want a, uh, an object to just sit there playing a sloshing sound when it's not moving so we're going to hook up some parameters as well we're going to hook up the uh, systemic acceleration and velocity parameters and we're going to just demonstrate a little bit of you know, we're not going to go into sort of too complex logic here but we're just going to demonstrate a little bit of what you can do so we're going to multiply them by each other and then the result of that we're going to set it on a couple of uh, parameters on that object and then as i said before you know everything is live updated so we're going to see the result of what we do here we're going to hear the result of what we do here immediately once we've done it so just finish hooking this up 
and we'll pass over to uh, the editor view once that's done. Oh, one last thing we need to do before we can make that happen is because this entity's already spawned, we need to send its spawn event again. And in Claudius, you can send any events that are set up uh, for debugging reasons, which is really useful. So now we can see the green blob, which says the sound's playing, but we, ha we can't hear very much because there's no velocity or acceleration. But now as the character runs around carrying it, we can hear the sloshing sounds, we can hear them play when it's dropped, and all this is coming from this set of parameters in Claudius that have been multiplied together uh, just for a bit of fun. I couldn't even hear it. <laughs> so all that was done without any code support. The, the code system had never seen that entity before. It could have been literally any entity in the game. And what we've done there is we've been able to express the contents of that entity without any additional... Now I could hear it a little bit. So that's a really sort of freeing thing for the, uh, the sound designers to have. I think it's the sound of the water bottle. As we've seen with how easy it is to implement something like this, uh, we have a lot of control over the physics and it gives us no reason not to add sounds to literally everything in the game that's interactable and that can move. It's going to bring a lot more life. Uh, the speed that we can get this done with, it's going to make iteration a lot more plausible. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's going to be have quite some interesting outcomes. So yeah, it opens up a line of creativity. It opens up a line of uh, experimentation. And that goes you know hand in hand with how quickly this was uh, achieved. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the example there was quite a silly one. It was, it was you know, putting a water yeah. sloshy sound where it doesn't really belong. But um, as I said, you know, the, it doesn't matter what that entity is. It could be a little cuddly uh, plushy thing, or it could be like a 400-foot a tower that's falling and hitting the ground. And those same parameters can be used to express the sounds of that thing, to express the weight and the size of that thing. 100-foot uh, taller. This tech is sort of limited to props. 100-foot tall tower range, falling anything over. Anything that can move. You can express frostbite using hello these parameters Levolution? i think you touched on a really important <laughs> point there which is a cause and effect um i think that's one thing that it's quite a tricky phenomenon to implement into games uh but with claudius it's it it's going to be you know almost a breeze uh we're going to be able to hold values uh based on a parameter, for example. So let's say if you shoot this plushie, it'll, you know, trigger a very high value for, for that movement. And uh, based on that, we'll be able to change the sound that, you know, happens after. So let's say if you shoot the plushie, pick it up again, instead of a cute cuddly noise, it can make like a really angry, like, why did you shoot me, <laughs> sort of grumble. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's going to add a whole new level of depth. Uh, to to these interactable objects and other things in the game as well. Yeah, and those examples are just, again, it's all about unleashing creativity. Exactly. It's about sort of offering all the data that you need to be able to do whatever you want. And, and there may be things that we never even thought of, but by abstracting these systems in such a way that, and by making all this data available to you, it no longer becomes a coder's problem what you guys want. We just give you everything. Yeah. The SIG Audio and Claudio systems are designed with collaborative working in mind too. So the way that communication and uh, the way that actions are performed in, in Claudius is that the Claudius app sends a request to the game engine to make some sort of change to the audio logic. I feel like Only this dude is just explaining is this tool to the, change actually reflect to the audio the engine, UI. to the audio boys, instead of to the, the, the people watching Citizen Con. Owned by the engine and we change it live. So it's like the other dude is like its first time hearing all of this. To do, is allow multiple connections of multiple Claudius clients. And because they're all connected via WebSockets, they could be on separate PCs. What this means is that if a sound designer needs some Ooh. assistance or just wants to collaborate with another sound designer on some sort of logic setup in this Claudius, is pretty damn cool. they can do that incredibly easily. They can uh, connect their Claudius client to somebody else's game client wow, simultaneously while that person has crazy. a copy of Claudius connected. And then as they make changes to the logic, they're reflected on both users Claudius screens simultaneously i think that's uh, quite a cool feature to have uh, a lot of the time when we're working I mean i guess you know, i'll need to call up either technical but every other person has done it as well um, and share my work and that'll just be through sharing the screen and there's a lot of but this is you know no go there this is go pretty there cool and finger pointing um and it, it, it you know it can be quite time consuming and make it difficult to, to especially get especially now points. that they can um, connect together with this tool i'll be able to like you said connect and just mark up, you know, a gun, for example, or one of these uh, physics prop on the go, 
um, with them. And uh, that can also spark quite a few ideas, just that, that very easy back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and every connected Claudius co- uh, client has full control. Mm. So you anyone can make any changes. Even the undo system works across all clients. So you could make a lot of changes uh, to demonstrate something and then disconnect. And then the other person can just hit the undo button to get rid of all that stuff and then start you know, doing something else that's maybe inspired by what you showed them or something like that. And I think it all just really sort of uh, lends itself to having a lot of collaboration. I mean, as a tool, this is... I mean, this is a very powerful tool, honestly. Situation. A tool like this is really going to be invaluable. It's it's going to allow the sound designers to connect a lot more QA to work with sound designers a lot easier. This is a very, use, very useful dialogue. tool. It's, it's really just going to you know, bring us all closer together and uh, hopefully spark some very interesting ideas. So let's take a little look at some of the code that underpins these systems. Because when we went away and wanted to start designing this thing we we obviously had workflow in mind and we wanted that to be uh, to, to create a, a situation that was as, as smooth and as easy as possible for sound designers but as a code team we serve two masters and what we don't want to do is to um, implement those things for the sound designers at a cost that's too great for the engine team so we need to avoid uh, high cpu usage we need to avoid blocking the main you know the critical paths of the game and we do that by moving all of our audio processing onto audio threads and onto audio jobs and all the commands that cause that audio processing to happen are all transmitted through uh, lockless queues and what that means is that the game can tell us what we need to know and we get out of the way as quickly as possible and that allows the game to run as freely as it can without audio sort of contributing to frame rate drop or contributing to um, high cpu usage because we've moved all that stuff into the audio system another something for uh, something like a uh, a feature that we would have multi-threading optimization in ship code like something that's very specific to thrusters would now become a systemic feature in the audio system and what that means is again it frees up your creativity because we might have created something as an idea that assists with making thrusters sound good but instead of it being kind of hidden away in the thruster code and only able to be used by those it's now available to you wherever you want and you can kind of use some of these tools in a whatever sort of uh, you know creative ways you can think of whereas you know before they were hidden away now they're completely available to you and this also frees up audio coders time because we spend a lot less time sort of you know working to make features that exist in one place exist somewhere else Literally, every feature exists everywhere for every system. So that, again, helps um, the audio code team to uh, spend a lot more of their time being creative too, which is a really good position to be in. We also have some features that even bring audio code into the realm of post-production, much like the, uh, the sound design is. So we can live rebuild the code while the game is running. And that's something we've been able to do for a long, long time. But what Claudius does, because it uses this reactive programming model and it, and it can react to the game's sort of transmission of events and parameters immediately and present them to you immediately, we can actually boot oh up the game boy, C++. and start up a feature we've never seen before and start playing around with it and find the bits where the audio needs to be. And then we can live add the code, rebuild it on the fly, and then it's already available to you guys. So we're making it so that collaboration between sound designers and, and audio coders becomes something that is just... It's almost as good as a collaboration between sound designers. It's like something we can we can uh, go from nothing to a fully working feature without stopping the game. And then because of all the design that this is all built on, and you know all the way that we want to make sure that everything persists, you don't need to like go back into the game and test it. What that means is that we can effectively implement both the code and the audio setup, save it, and we're literally done. And that's just saving so much time compared to sort of. Um, all the iteration time that they spent. I honestly really feel like a tool like this would also be very, very valuable so, yeah, to this, this Cloud Imperium uh, games as something you know, they could, you know, in this sell licenses for to other game developers yeah. and, and basically set up another revenue income for Cloud Imperium games so because they can sell this tool for Claudius, but we have lots of plans to other developers. Too. Um, the design I think this is actually Claudius very valuable. Solve future problems before we know what they are, and where it can't solve them completely, it's going to make it easier to solve them. As new game features come along, and we don't know what they're going to be yet necessarily, um, we want to be able to support them as quickly as possible. But also, 
we want to be able to reuse everything we create. And the Sig Audio and Claudius design is central to that. It's all about reuse and it's all about having systemic features that are available to sound designers. I think what's so great about this uh, technology is that we're going to be able to take all this information from the game, uh, bring the audio engine into the game engine, um, and just you know make it all so easy to access. I think one key aspect of, uh, of Claudius that the audio team is really looking forward to is sympathetic audio. So this is the cause and effect that we were talking about before. I think it, having this uh, like one event trigger another, for example, it's going to make the, the game a lot more cinematic. Um, everything's going to be real time. We're not going to have to pre-render all these events. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's basically going to become procedural, which means that every, you know, a lot of these scenarios that you get into, a lot of these different contexts uh, that, that you can get into while you're playing the game, um, we're going to accommodate them. Um, and you're going to get, you know, really uh, just vastly different experiences every time you do something. And this is because we can infer so much from the game data um, and create those links to create a beautiful experience. Um, a lot of the time we think about like how can we sonify this nonlinear spectacle of a game. And I, I truly believe that that is through cause and effect. It's, it's having things done in real time and conveying all this information to the player uh, that you know can be critical. So if, if, for example, you're flying and you start to enter a debris field or an asteroid field, that all those things can start having an effect on the you know environment around you. You can start hearing creaks. Uh, if you're entering the atmosphere, you can tell like that your ship's going through some strain. And uh, instead of pre-rendering it, it can happen in real time. It can take values uh, from like atmospheric pressure, temperature, and you're, it's 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 going to be you know quite a amazing experience for the players. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know at the core of uh, sympathetic audio is this idea of resonance, and, and with the sympathetic audio design that we have, we'll be able to give objects resonant frequencies, and we'll be able to make it so that you know if something sort of uh, broadband in its frequency uh, spectrum goes off, like a, a huge explosion or something like that, then you're going to expect a lot of uh, metal panels and, and glass windows mm -hmm. and things to to rattle and resonate in 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 sympathy. Sympathetic yeah. audio in sympathy with uh, with the explosion. And no, and all we really have to do is just set up the logic for that to happen, and it'll happen. Um, and yeah, it, really eager and interested to see what um, players are gonna have happen to them yeah. through their placements. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know all the all the features that we're looking to develop. Uh, are, are all about bringing this game to life more yeah. and, and, and making it more cinema cinematic and, and making it, you know, just feel more immersive. Yeah, super high fidelity. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're looking at sort of improving the mixing support so we can gather some of this. You know, we've got a huge amount of data coming in now that can be used in lots of ways to uh, decide which sounds play and what, para you know, how those parameters affect those sounds. But we can take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, you know, we've, we've got all this data that's telling us what's going on in the game. Can we then use that? to sort of decide how the game should be mixed. So, for example, if, uh, if you're exploring a moon or something like that, you're going to want to hear a lot of the ambiences and maybe some distant mining going off and things like this. But then if you sort of end up engaged in battle with someone, that's something that the audio system is aware of through the data that's coming in, and maybe it can change the mix so that those ambient things don't really get so much of a look in anymore, and it's all about the battle focus and things like mm. that. And then, again, as, as the battle ends and that kind of scenario falls away, we could automatically you know, analyze the data and say, okay, we're now back into an ambient situation, so you know, let's raise the, the level of some of these ambient sources again. Yeah, I think the you know, importance to what the, uh, what the player needs to hear at that moment, I think that's... For especially on the FPS side, that's going to really be valuable. So that concludes our look at some of the features and tech that we have in development in the SIG Audio team right now. Um, hopefully, it's going to make the lives of the sound design team uh, much easier and hopefully some improvements to the way the game sounds too. Yeah, I think um, the sonic aesthetic of uh, this, this game is going to change for the better because of these tools and because of these workflow uh, improvements. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Citizen Con, and I really hope next year we can all be back together in person and we can see each other in person then. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. So, next up, I think, is uh, Tony Z. Is the premier online magazine for Star Citizen. 
packed full of ship reviews, outfitting guides, upcoming events, org interviews, current affairs, history and more. Cosmonaut is your comprehensive guide to all aspects of life among the stars. Our talented team of writers, editors, designers, photographers and artists are all passionate pilots and aim to bring you stellar images, incisive articles and incredible design. Season 1 of Cosmonaut is available for download now. Head to www.cosmonautmagazine.com to get all 12 issues completely free. I've heard them say, with every goal comes a sacrifice. With every dream comes a letdown. You've got to give up something get that big thing you're chasing. I couldn't disagree more. See, everything is achievable, and you don't have to give up anything along the way. You want to know what I think? Sacrifice is what happens when you give up halfway. The Origin 300i. Sacrifice nothing. Achieve anything pretty cool ad i guess this is jack jack is a successful trader unfortunately for jack he encounters local pirates they want <laughs> what the fuck? just a fraction of his profits jack refuses the proposal jack gets blown up moment, he is a hero now he gets blown up. Now, Jack is dead. And all of his belongings go to the pirates anyway. Don't be like Jack. Be smart. Pay ransom. Sponsor for the season, don't pay to pay ransom company. Be smart, pay ransom. So, Marcus, you work for Addison's campaign, right? Uh, yeah. Did you guys get some sort of a winner's bonus? Well, yeah, we got a bonus. Oh, you did? How much? I did get Is that for, Phoenix for tokens only, only or a Ethereum a constellation itself? Phoenix? But hang on, why are we traveling on this rental tourist, Marcus? How was I supposed to know you'd prefer the Phoenix? Jesus oh, Christ. Oh, God, Marcus. You know what? I'm just going to go have a shower. Route has been plotted. Welcome in 10. Uh, guys, there are no towels. You know, I think I had some towels in the Phoenix. Oh, no, just stop. <laughs> Sorry. 61 guai, god damn it. Jesus Christ, dude. So this is like Alien, but a cheap knockoff. <laughs> Do not underestimate the talented and dedicated folks at CIG Audio. Fucking pizza a box, dude. emphasis on video here, but none of it would ever hit the way that it's supposed to without that A to that V. And as we near the end of our show, we also saw the last of our community videos during the break. And I hope they stick around as a tradition for Citizen Cons going forward. Same. For those of you who know my origin story, you might understand why I have a particularly soft Jesus spot. Christ. But that's enough chat. This is it. We're at the end of our day. It's time for one more panel and one more panel alone. It's time for Tony, Rob, Ben, and Tony Z, to dude. Take you deep into the machinery. Kyle, this is universe, this is a very systematic gameplay. Stream of very what important one. This is probably going to be all about quantum quasar, and all that stuff. Tony Z is like the big mastermind of uh, 
Yeah, Anthony Z's brother. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tony Zervek, Director of Persistent Universe for Star Citizen. Yeah, this guy. Today I'm going to tell you about some of the new technology, features, and content that we're aiming to deliver over the next several quarters, and how these things are going to impact your gameplay experience. To assist in that endeavor, I brought along a few others to give you some additional perspective, including SGS Assistant Director Rob Reininger, Senior Systems Designer Ben Dorsey, and over in the UK, Ben Dorsey. Luke Presley. Is that the brother of Ben Dover? Selling. Rob, we've been able to buy and sell Let's commodities go. for years, but we're now looking to try and close out the entire loop by the end of the year by allowing players to sell weapons, armor, clothing, and eventually ships back to the shops. One of your favorite aspects of this has always been what it means to treasure. Can you elaborate a bit on that? I think it's huge because now it gives me a purpose to go out and collect the stuff because players are very meticulous. They'll go out and pick up every single gun, weapon, armor off of other players. Like loot generation yeah. is something that yeah, the basically. team is working on. Uh, it means a lot for you know investigating lockers or just stripping down something. We talked about salvage. You know, dude, these are all things that are working towards the ability to buy and sell items. Yeah, I but really want to be able to get rid of ships, inventory, sell ships right? that I don't it's, want it's anymore. Getting rid of this stuff, it's another form of reward. So I, I think it's a huge addition to the game. Sure, and it also plays a big role in character advancement, right? Yeah. Because you can realize the equity from items that you've purchased in the past. In other words, I, I buy a particular laser rifle. Now I decide that I want the better one. I don't have to buy that one starting from scratch. I can actually sell my original one, assuming it's in pretty good shape, and I basically pick the optimal shop at which to sell it, you know, that's a, you know, a shop that deals in that specific item, then I can actually get a pretty good price for that used item. I can then take that money and apply it and, you know, the differential towards moving up the ladder and basically getting It's better, funny better you say that, Carl, so because like that is world, actually like don't usually start from, you know, what's going to happen. Buy, you know, buy a house and then basically, you know, uh, have to, you know, buy it's actually going to be what happens because your, uh, you know, the entire world Original, will be connected and the other one and you just from like difference. mining yeah, and that's something that we don't have to refining right to manufacturing and if you blow up like ai ships, ships carrying sometimes come with default uh, on them, like a sniper rifle or uh, engines or uh, like carrying ships, engines for say like a valkyrie right comes with the default load out of, and so they cannot manufacture valkyries cetera, anymore so the Valkyries that do exist in stores things, will go up in price. We get an itemized price for every single because there is no supply at possibly a lot of demand. Laser scopes, magazines, uh, so that is actually how it's going to be in the end. Right, things like that. So now that these have their own individual price, it's much easier for us to one tune it. But that's way so down the road. This thing is more expensive or less expensive. As stats change, we can we can keep up with the the statistical improvement of the item on a per item basis. Sure, you have the macro item; it consists of the child items. We change the price of the child item, and the you know the macro item, the bigger the large item that includes you know various quantities of this, its price is automatically adjusted, which is not something that happens now and causes us countless problems. Dude, yeah, and, Tony and it, it talks so fucking quick we, sometimes; it's hilarious. Parts to to worry about on a, on a global basis, and. From a what does the world uh, have for sale in it? You know, you talked about you know taking something to a shop that deals. With Honestly, that. Danny, that That's, is actually a thing you, of, you well, could do. Deals in it and they refurbish it. They have an in invested uh, value in procuring those things back from people in the universe. So we want to encourage players yeah with the whole ai stuff ai shipments for, much like this also links in with that server meshing because they can buy it for the where an price, ai is because they can sell it for the like, most money say uh, an ai is all alone items, right? near so hearst and for whatever reason right you should be able to go there and get more money. the ai sure, should we, not be streaming more, everything he sees you know, sophisticated method because that's a bunch of resources that doesn't make any sense so ai need to switch from being existing what it means to selling to words, running I, when I go to sell my, in a in know, a my, simulation my pistol, until a player a can see that ai and then it gets spawned in have a specific so it's virtually moving our, from you know, a to b without list, ever being on the server says, unless a player should, sees it if it were new cost this much this winds up becoming something to where well, sure we've got the it's basic incredibly the hard pistol, and we've got the base price, you know, of you know of the scope, but we don't have any sense of what the combination is. As of right now, we don't have a means of solving that. And so this this is why we you know we are going to be pursuing changing even how the shops specify their default you know inventory. Like right now, we actually have shops 
Got the Specify individual every entries, individual yeah. item that they can sell, as opposed to where we're going is it'll be classes of items. This you know yeah. this particular shop deals in you know in in small handheld weapons uh, you know from this particular manufacturer. Now because they actually deal in small handheld weapons, they will in fact purchase you know small handheld weapons from a different manufacturer. Right. You just won't get you know quite as good a price because they're not as adept at repairing them and they don't have a clientele that's you know that's geared towards purchasing those items, etc. You if you wanted to realize you know the best possible price then you would wind up taking your you know your your specific you know items to a shop that dealt in those specific things that's right. and that's where assuming the condition was perfect and assuming that the shop had a lot of cash on hand with which to procure these deals and so was willing to be a little bit more liberal that's where you could potentially recoup you know 70 80 you know 85 percent of your original value whereas if you go to someone that simply you know sure they you know they deal in a small arm but not necessarily that you know that particular manufacturer, not you know that particular caliber weapon or whatever the case may be. Then maybe only get forty or fifty cents on the dollar. Exactly. It's like when you're dealing with a car dealership. Like if you bring them their their brand of car, they're going to pay you more for that than if you brought it's, them. Something it's easier for them to service. Their exactly. mechanics are already familiar with it. They can do the They've work the at parts. cost. They can sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. possibly. Uh, it's it's big. And it, I don't it's know how the player pirate right. part of it really will exist, but AI piracy will also be a thing. Three point fifteen is a huge update to the game because of the localized inventory that's going to totally change the game. There are several aspects to this, and that starts with, I'd say, the personal inventory manager that Rich Tire and the Actor Feature team have put so much work into. They're going to cover that in a separate discussion, so we'll leave that out of you know uh, out of here. Um, on, over on our side, we've got the vehicle loadout manager, which has been adapted to al only allow you to modify vehicles that are in your immediate vicinity. And then we've also added a new Moby Glass app called Knickknacks. Um, Reiniger, so you've spent the last couple of quarters heavily focused on this. Go ahead and walk us through what's changed, starting with the front end menu. Yeah, so the front end, we've historically allowed players to kind of go wherever they want, right? But as we move forward with the game and the new player experience, we want players to be invested in their home location. So it's, it's more of selecting a home base because the inventory that you have at the start of your account that's entitled, you know, through all your web purchases, through whatever, you know, subscriber flares, et cetera, all of this stuff is going to go to that location as it's physicalized in the world. So now, you have a home base of operations. That's your place. As we explore out throughout the universe, you may move some of that stuff to a new place as you get persistent halves here, a new hab over there. Persistent oh, persistent halves, right? dude. Oh, uh, I'm so excited for that, too. Tangibly going up to interacting with their, their weapon rack, interacting with the stuff in their ship. And so localized inventory is a massive change to how they've dealt with the game in, up till now. Uh, gone are kind of the days of this global inventory that you can go and, and interact with anywhere in the universe. If your stuff is at Microtech, you need to go to Microtech to do it. If it's in this hangar over here, you got to go to that hangar. So we want players to feel the, the pressure of prepping for a trip, right? It's, it's as you go out, this is the mission I'm going to do. This is what I need to go and do that mission. So I want to go here, get this, get this, or maybe go to a shop here and buy that. Uh, and so the front end is going to be the, the first step in kind of planting your seed uh, wherever it is in the universe from the very start. So what about the Knickknacks app? So this, this allows you to basically, in its first incarnation, to see where you've placed all of your sure. loot throughout the entire solar system. It works on a hierarchical basis, so you can drill down into right. a particular planet, see you know the city. At the city, you can basically see what ships you have stored there. You can look within your ship and you right. know eventually see you know what cargo grids and you know what what you know storage closets you have within there and what items you have placed within there. You've also got a number of filters that allow you Oops. to quickly drill down through your entire right. inventory and find you know all the you know the laser rifles or whatever else it is that you're you know specific specifically searching for. Can you just you know, walk through that in a little bit more detail? As we kind of go into the localized inventory, the, the VMA can only act on the ships that are at that location. Uh, the, you kind of lose perspective of the global view because the personal inventory manager that the Active Feature team has done has removed the PMA, which was also your kind of uh, global view into your personal items. So the Knickknacks app allows you to kind of see where your stuff is distributed around the world uh, at 
the individual location level. So whether it's in a ship or in a hab or in a hangar, uh, right now the locations are, are basically cities or stations. I don't think they're gonna any place that show has, you uh, where that sells items. That can be some place where you can store stuff. So where your the body ships is. Also have their local inventories associated with them, so you can store things in the ship and. The, the knickknacks app is, too, is good too, because now you, if you want to find laser rifles, you've got you can search by type or or subtypes. Uh, basically, the the same things that you see in the shop, so the categories that you see in the in the shop UIs. Uh, that's the same level of, of interaction and, and filtering that you'll have in knickknacks. We've spoken a bit about how it's going to evolve in the future and what new capabilities we would wind up adding to it. You know, trading you know with other players is one of the things that's at the top of the list. Yeah, right, right clicking on something, being able to say, hey, open a trade window with, with Ben here. Uh, I want to be able to show me on the star map where this is. So yeah, we, we, something that we want to do in the mobile glass as a whole is context ability to bounce to different apps that are, are you know, contextually relevant to True. whatever you're currently using. So like saying this is in this location when that's just a string. Dude, like, that it would be Ozark. so good if you that's could like open up a trade window with a another map. player. That tells me something. That tells me I need to go from here to That'd here. That'd be I need so, to this so good. I'm going to go through this dangerous area to get there in order to access my stuff. Or, and, and, or a hyperlink on that. Yeah, and, and, right? and, and like, you can also very easily discern you know, distance and stuff, which is, yes. oh, well, this one's not here, but is it relatively close yeah. or is it really, really far away? And I need to be able to obviously you know, put that into my planning. Yeah, or set a route to see how much fuel I'm going to use. Exactly. Right? There's a lot of different different reasons why these things are, are kind of relevant. We want to try and preserve all those elements that CR really wants to push towards, but still give you the context switching that you're going to need. Physicalized cargo, boys. Let's go. Another area that's currently under heavy development is physicalized cargo. It consists of multiple facets and will be released in stages, with the first one relating exactly. to shop purchases injecting physical entities rather than what I would call render proxies into your ship. This is going to convey all sorts of benefits and advantages you know, to the gameplay experience. The first and one of the most obvious is simply the fact that now that you've got a ship that has physical entities placed within it, then when another player winds up disabling, boarding your ship, they can actually extract you know, that cargo from you. There's value there that they can actually take. Whereas right now, the only way to get that value is you have to, you know, blow up the ship, and then we basically, yeah. you know, create the, you know, these these well, these cargo yada, facsimiles that together. basically <laughs> get blasted out into space, and you have to go collect those, you know, yeah. et cetera. And so this starts to hint at things like, you know, uh, the fact that we're going to want to bring NPCs into defending these ships. All of a sudden, yep. you get this gr fantastic gameplay transition what i would say where you have <laughs> ships doing this momentum based combat mm -hmm. and now i can disable a ship board it and i actually have to overcome oh, hey, this is from crew, and then physically grab the cargo haul it back to my ship at the same time you're concerned that while you're basically on the In ship and lugging red, this even. stuff around that security or you know allies of the ship that you've disabled might show up and start blasting you and so all of a sudden the considerations uh, you know just explode you know for doing something so right now relatively basic and it's it's one of the aspects that i really love of, about this game which is how we can add this low level gameplay mechanic and it, you know in one shot it's going to totally transform so many different you know elements of the yeah. game and we get stuff like the whole sea which you know is an, another hurdle beyond the physicalization of cargo uh, I think one of the things that, that just physicalizing the cargo really does is it allows for the gameplay that CR wants where you're not blowing up ships, right? You're destroying an engine, which is not a critical failure, right? D critical failures are the things that lead to no, 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 no. larger scale destructions. But physicalized cargo is not 350. You're a ship out of commission. You're able to board. You're able to acquire the stuff you're not killing everybody i think physicalized it, cargo it is got taken down to zero health right um, q1 so the, these are all q1 2022 just physicalizing the cargo allows us to do either q1 or q2 c. so the whole c has some unique challenges related to attaching physicalized cargo to it when you're actually you know docked so 317 or when you're, I think. You know, parked in a hangar and its wings are compressed can you talk about that a little bit yeah uh so the whole C, because it, it does have these two different states, uh, now we have ATC considerations. Nah, if 317. It's not going to be Q4 this ship, year. My wings are exposed. Now I can only go to a docking collar. 
I can't go to the hangar. So the ACC needs to know to route you to these different locations. Uh, showing all this cargo on the outside of a ship beyond, you know, think of adding additional ships to an area and, and the kind of, you know, uh, slowdown that you might see on, on a server, right? You're adding more physical objects that, that, that can be blown up, can be interacted with. So there's a technical challenge that we need to overcome as well. Uh, how they get on there, these, these are shipping container sized objects that have a, a real world weight to them. They need a tractor beam that, that is large enough, probably on an Argo ship, right? Uh, so you, you'll get these little transport ships going from the stations, docking, you know, a cargo bay, flying it out to the whole sea. And, st you know, think of it as a person walking in and out, but it's it's on a, you know, spaceship scale. Another really? thing that's really bothered me for quite a while is oh. what I'd call the lack of transactional friction. And what I mean when I say that is that it takes the exact same amount of time to load or unload one unit of cargo onto your ship as it does a thousand or ten thousand. There, there's no friction, you know, uh, in this process. Right. And that's completely different from the real world where mom and pop retailers and major port facilities, you know, designed to rapidly load or unload, you know, cargo onto, you know, some big, you know, uh, you know f uh, freight ship are able to move, you know, much, much larger quantities in a much, much shorter period of time. And you no, that's only persistent hangers, that, I think. You, know, you can actually hire that are trained to basically deal with special that's not the physical and all that sort of stuff. There's no physical where we're cargo, eventually I going think. with this is that shop purchases are going to inject physical cargo into a storage space, and it's then up to you, the player, to basically move the stuff from that storage space onto your actual ship. And there are going to be, I would assume that at this you know, point in time, half of the people watching gotcha, this are gotcha, saying that right. sounds you know, incredibly rough, awesome, right, yeah. and the other half are saying this sounds incredibly <laughs> so tedious, and it sounds like a lot of you know, force like somebody labor. Is the whole sea also slated for you know, Q4? Uh, you know, uh, completely right. lacking in fun. There, there is a method to the madness. I mean, where we're going with no, this the is eight. we're going to make the concept of moving freight onto and off of ships not just a logistical challenge, but we're actually. But that's also sure external that, cargo. You know, it's, no, it's a fun, you know, a fun experience, yeah. and this would include everything from eventually adding a service beacon so that you could we'll recruit for the your friends, your org mates, you know, people you don't know to basically. Come yeah, but help it, move it's cargo. not put in the. We'll eventually add the ability for NPCs to be to be hired at that location. Yeah. Bro, I've been looking at the wrong thing the entire time. Players are requesting similar services, um, and. You can use those, you know, types of you know, cap you know, capabilities if you simply want to. Pay yeah, the whole C for loaded or unloaded, and you're going to go fly around and do something, you know, completely unrelated. So, for uh, C, by the way, I'm looking at the release view. Going to so, whole C is indeed slated for Q4 ways, for 316. The whole concept of, but of uh, persistent hangers is slated for 3.17, so that's Q1 to, 2021. So, uh, like that ship, March. We've actually run into a lot of problems where March, when, April. You go across, when you come across a derelict, for instance, um, we have all these crates on there that you can offload in, in a lot of the events that we've done. And um, that amount of time that it takes to do that makes it so that when you then go to sell those crates, they can't. They aren't worth the time, frankly, um, yeah, it's because it's over time. exactly yeah. it is so much faster to just park your ship and and click the button and have it instantly get filled, and then drive over to another place and have it instantly be unloaded. Um, that we can't make those that that process pay well enough to also be balanced when you're getting sixteen to twenty crates off of a ship and it's taking you half an hour to do that. But once you make it so that there is a much more similar timeline between those two. Um, you can make it so that there's a much bigger reward on a crate by crate basis, and that allows us to make it so that derelicts become a lot more common and offloading stuff becomes a lot com more common. There's also just some really great benefits in that we can make missions reward you by putting cargo yeah, out there. That's right. Doesn't have to be that the UEC reward of a mission is is the only reward this mission gives you five thousand every single time no there's a ship that gets blown up or you blow up or disable a ship and um, especially disable a ship and then you can board it and take that cargo off for pirates that becomes then the goal like blowing up a ship now becomes almost a failure you don't want to you want to disable it you want to be able to get on this it, is gold and you dude want to take that this is important off. of course the crew 100 you the entire way there they're gonna um have their 
There are people to try and fight off your boarding parties. You suddenly transition to, into an FPS map by doing so, which is this really great transition that just doesn't really happen in a lot of games, and that's amazing. And even just from a, a, a pure like gameplay uh, system standpoint of, of carrying that crate, that is a, a very powerful state for the player to be in, in that they are vulnerable. You can't be shooting a gun and carrying a crate at the same time. That, that's actually the, my, one of my favorite, you know, a, a things about this entire process is the fact that we're finally going to reward the player and basically provide this differential in the challenges, yes. you know, to where we've long had, you know, blow the ship up, the ship basically ejects some cargo, you, right. you know, you tractor beam it up, and now you basically got your reward. But what it's missing is that 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 transition from FPS mo or uh, from ship yep. based momentum based you know combat to where you know you're shooting your big guns but as a pirate cetera, you, you wouldn't want corners and you may or may not you try don't to want to blow up the cargo ship because then your the cargo out money is lost the profit is lost the security areas for the most part and patrolling you want to disable them take their shit know, and just you know, know leave them to it protect each other too while the other people are trying to move stuff right and tractor beams are based on weight so it may take multiple people to exactly. actually move a heavier box. And CR wants the, the gameplay experience to be less ships blowing up, more this ship got disabled, the engines go out, and unless there's a critical failure, the ship doesn't explode. So the opportunity to board a ship will be more common as we move forward. There's one other big, thing I wanted to talk about big in this area, that. and that's, you've, you've heard me you know, talk about this you know, often, which is eventually I want the whole transport occupation. Dude, our assignment is going to be so like cool. Model, right. to where our assignment is you know, big Anvil Hawk, that are um, specifically designed to provide one of the, the wardens, the quantity of inventory, and or one of the, the, the vanguards, you know, and, and, and all of the infrastructure even the fucking titan stuff on and off certain not ships, the not the avenger um, titan as opposed to small the warlock retailers that with the emp are really just intended to deal in a very small number of items those and are going to be so good like anything the rs i meant combined with have in the game because an emp we don't yet have, equipped you know, ship of realism is related to it's going to be a, so good we've got a small you know we've got a small mom and pop retailer and we need to have a decent amount of inventory so that it can satisfy demand across potentially a hundred different players, all grabbing theoretically you know, one or two or three items. But what happens in the real game right now, because there are none of these limitations, there's none of this transactional friction is, is one big ship comes up and it purchases all 300 of them because, because it takes yeah, yeah, exactly. absolutely the Mantis, no time the Mantis to do traps that. It then flies to the destination. The EMP shuts down all their systems. It immediately sells a Valkyrie it, flies in with you know, the boarding the party. slimmest of profit margins, but because there was no, t no loading time, there was no unloading time, they could still turn around and make a fairly you know, uh, good return on the amount of invested time you know they put into it and turning all of this cargo into physicalized entities and basically adding these logistical challenges to where you have to move stuff on move it off you know you know you have to be more careful with volatile cargo bigger you know crates will require you know argos to move them or cranes or forklifts or whatever the case may be all of this is ultimately going to push players into being more selective about where for whatever they're trying to do what types of shops and stuff they're going to visit and what you're going to these get these kind of like cargo containers are the ones that will be on the uh oil the whole the sea and all that and basically parking it at some sort of port facility for offloading and that will then be transported by you know whether it's pipelines by rail you know by those types of things to uh to distribution outlets and from there it'll be picked up by trucks and transported to the local gas station and from the gas station that's where you the end consumer can expect to buy six or 12 gallons of gas but in the real world you can't you know drive your truck up to you know a port refinery you know, on the coast and basically you know request you know five or ten gallons of fuel it's like they they only deal in minimum quantities of 10 or 100,000 or 500,000 you know barrels of fuel and this will be the same thing that we're going to eventually you know support on our side to where if you've got one of these big you know whole sea ships and stuff there will be specific locations where you know we're we're trying we're, we're, we're really basically pushing you to do your business it doesn't mean that you can't go and park at a small place yeah. it's like i can have a super tanker and i can go i can go we're park on the side of though right because you do have the docking collar restriction on on the whole c type ship right and but i think this is what the going to the per box model will actually do for us because we can just make those small mom and pop shops only have the smaller 
volumes of, of like commodities, right? You, you talked about how if, if you can only upload, up, unload and offload one box at a time, I'm not going to do a Caterpillar there. Yeah, like, there's nothing right, right. stopping you, but there's something That's just stopping if, if you. I, if, I, if, if my, if, if my ship no. holds 10,000 units of inventory and I don't have any of the automated stuff and this, you don't have enough dock workers, I can't hire. At this place, there literally aren't 100 NPCs or 500 NPCs that I can hire for any amount of money, they're, they're literally just not there, then you're gonna have to do it yourself or you're gonna have to request some friends to help you. And it's simply too tedious. It, it's not that you, it's not that we literally prevent you from basically going there and extracting the material, it's that it's simply not going to be worth your time. You're gonna have to invest so much time and effort into doing that, that all of a sudden you would need an astronomically high profit margin. And long before the profit margins on that particular you know, commodity or material get that high, someone else with a smaller, more efficient ship that can more you know, effectively you know, uh, be loaded with a smaller quantity of stuff and then navigate to someone you know, to another small uh, location to basically uh, sell it, they'll wind up, you know, taking, you know, taking that material from that location. Which well, means I, for a cat, like a, a, one of those bigger ships, like one of the hull series or something, you're going to want to, by just that nature, go to a place that has a, a, a cargo elevator that can give you 20 giant crates at the same time. Right. Yeah, that's 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 because what I mean. Like with where you'll make that profit with the infrastructure. In it's like some places yeah. you'll have an elevator that basically gives you easy access to. 10 crates at a time, and, yep. a, and a bigger facility will have 50, and a bigger one still will have 200, and this one will allow you to basically hire Dude, up to Tony NPCs, Z. and one NPC can move, you know, 10 crates per hour. Exactly. But you're going to be in competition with, you know, w with that smaller of NPCs. Tony Z else, is so passionate high. about this and game, like you can just this hear this it in his voice. will have up to 500 or 1,000 workers that you can hire, so it may still take, you know, it may take hours, but you have, you know, but that's only because you're, you know, loading 10, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 the SEU of cargo you know, in, into your hold. Another very interesting aspect of this is going to be that you're going to have relatively clearly delineated... You can just hear it in his voice. He's so passionate about this game. Within the system. And this provides us an awesome opportunity to more precisely tailor what types of challenges you should run into when you're basically moving a big freighter ship from point A to point B as opposed to this other location. In other words, if you think about you know, pirates are trying to, you know, uh, abscond, you know, they're basically trying to disable your ship and, you know, and, and plunder it, take, you know, whatever valuable materials, you know, you have on board. But the types of ships that would be required to extract, you know, all of Very the fuel yeah. off, off of a big massive freighter are clearly dramatically different than the ships that would be needed to effectively and efficiently, you know, plunder a far smaller ship that deals in a totally different, you know, type of item or a totally different yeah, man. Imagine, quantity of items. Like, and so we'll be able imagine to... Imagine raiding a caterpillar, right? More, more You'd be busy for like an hour to move all so that, that shit off the caterpillar. You would expect. Well, and I think by nature, it just if you tried to pirate a to caterpillar, separate right? You, because it's not worth it over here, and we can we can make those inventory volumes smaller to match the the type of people that we want frequenting those stores. Plus, you'd also need a caterpillar to act to completely so empty that caterpillar. Shipper, I'm gonna go to the bigger places that can handle it, that can get me in and out faster. At that point, you might as well just kill the captain and steal the caterpillar for yourself, right? Potentially higher, like the service beacon. It doesn't matter if I'm out in the middle of nowhere because nobody's there to come That have the specialists. It's, it's, yeah. it's only at these select ports right. where they actually have trained dock workers skilled in you know, in, in moving volatile cargo. And if you go to a place where you don't have it and you have, you know, Joe, you know, you know, Joe average, you know, NPC try to do it, then you may wind up, you know, suffering the consequences of, oh, you lost your cargo. It was blown up. Your ship was destroyed. You have to go to insurance, you know, reclaim, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all because you basically tried be to, fucked up. um, yep. Yeah, uh, sir, I'm sorry your ship blew up because average Joe blew up your, types of actions you were your quantanium. <laughs> I think it'll be a good change. I'm so game. sorry for that your Argo mole is, blew up because average Joe as couldn't possible, we don't unload make it the quantity. Right? Right. Which is, it's not that you literally, as the owner of a whole sea, you're Imagine. not able to buy fuel here. It's more that you can buy it there, but it's going to, you know, if you're buying more than 10 or 20 units of it, it's going to be, you know, you're going to basically have to deal with the repercussions of trying to get yeah, all dude, of that 100%. stuff onto here. And it's going to take a tremendous amount of time and you're going to wind up 
having to pay an exorbitant premium because you're basically going to be depleting them of their entire you know, inventory supply, et cetera. And so it's really just you know, the, the, the logistical challenges that you would face trying to exploit you know, non-optimal locations for the, unloading or un, you know, uh, for the loading or unloading of your cargo would simply not be worth it. Well, Bring your cargo cargo, you need like as you, as 200 you of them. Inventory to his limits, your bid ask spread is going to actually be going down as you, you know, price per unit of the cargo is is gonna do need like 200 of them closer and closer to the inventory to empty a so caterpillar it's gonna encourage you to go to places with those larger scale inventories so that you can keep your your profit margin as high as possible We completed the basic foundation for Reputation late last year, and that followed that up in the first quarter with the release of the Delphi MobiGlass app that allowed you to see exactly how different NPCs and organizations feel about you. This is a critical system within the game because it's the key mechanism by which you'll unlock more challenging and lucrative opportunities and gain access to organizations and areas that will bestow various benefits. We're still missing a few key pieces of the puzzle, though, and can't yet fully exploit this system. So, over on the mission side, only the bounty hunting services give you a nice gradation of challenges at the moment, offering you more interesting missions as you gain reputation with them. Can you go into a little bit of detail about why this is? It, essentially, whenever we want to make a new mission, or even just a very small variant on a mission, it, it requires an entirely new uh, record, a new, new chunk of data that we have to put into the system, and that takes time. Um, to build out any kind of, of ladder is, is a, a, an awful amount of time, honestly. Some things that we want to do is just kind of make it so that some of that is more systemic and a little bit faster, and by doing that we will be able to kind of um, explode wide, making it so that um, we make one mission, one template, and then just give it some variables that have some ranges. Um, and, and by doing so, we can, we can then allow it to almost generate its own chains of missions with difficulties that are driven by how much reputation you have, and those can give you different amounts of rewards and spawn different amounts of enemies and um, put things at different distances, et cetera. Um, just kind of dynamicizing that, that mission variation. Yeah, and th there's, there's actually a lot to this, a lot of additional complication besides the mission itself, because when you think about it, you may have a mission giver, and the mission giver looks at your reputation and decides that he's only going to give you the junior starter missions. And so he calls up the, you know, go kill bad guys in this particular section, and he basically says, you know what, given your reputation, I'm going to assume that you can only take, you know, a difficulty value of one. And passing a difficulty value of one into that mission will only create one or two guys, and your reward will be be, you know, of a considerably lower rate than it would, you know, than what it might otherwise be. As you do that mission, you build up reputation with him. All of a sudden, he's passing, you know higher difficulty levels into that mission template. And one, one of the complicating factors that we face is we need to be able to take this template and before we've actually instantiated it, before you've yes. actually accepted it, we need to be able to extract information out of it and process that. And what I mean by that is we need to know before we've created the mission how much money you should reasonably be paid in order to do this. And we need to know, we need to have a sense of where this mission might actually <laughs> yeah, be. Yeah, I don't know, dude. And what the current status of that area is. Or is he sending you into an area rife with pirates or is he sending you into an area that's you know got tons wow, of you're really good at killing people here's an entire criminal gang nest that you need to clear out there's like 200 of them good luck with them dude why we've actually made some significant progress on this particular problem but there are multiple facets to dealing with it and i'd actually say that at this point we're in a relatively good you know place on the you know, on the on the underlying the dynamic mission side, and we've still got a considerable amount of work to do over on the actual UI side to take a mission template, look at your reputation, create some proxy references to that mission template with different metadata associated, and then assuming that you actually select option number three, which has metadata this, then we'll instantiate the mission, pass in the metadata so that it actually customizes it as appropriate for the selection that you were just, you know, shown and you can then go off and execute that mission and you'll be paid the correct amount and you'll encounter the appropriate amount of difficulty for you know for what you were promised and for what he thought you were capable of doing given your reputational level because we already do have in game something that players can kind of play with right now the bounty hunter chain which is 
effectively what this will look like to players. It's just a matter of that took a lot of setup. And Who's now it Blackjack? should be something that we can pretty We've much never like seen that one before. buttons and we're good to go. That's exactly it. Like in, in the end, it's all about allowing you to as quickly and easily express a solution to the problem of I've got a mission giver. This mission giver is going to dispatch you to deal with, you know, with bad guys the variables wind up becoming well, how many bad guys and how quickly are they going to reinforce themselves and are they going to be you know are they going to be flying capital ships or you know little small hornets and what kind of stuff will they have on board black jack security what areas of the solar system you know will this conflict be never had a black jack so before. these are all things that we can bend as appropriate depending upon what you know what we gotcha. think you're capable gotcha. of or what that npc i've never know, seen that or or a group of. before well, and, and we talked game. a little bit about the procedural character generation uh, in the last USP sync that we did on for Star Citizen Live, but that's going to be taken into account. The, the back end is going to be generating more and more difficult NPCs based on the gear, based on the quality of the stuff that they can do, their behaviors. So all that needs to get fed into the mission and become part of how we reward the players and, and enhance that experience. But these are all things that are going to be fed into the mission instead of just the static data that we yeah. kind of have right now. Like, you, you literally have to place nodes in the mission uh, script Ah, gotcha. Logic. Yeah, I never do those like missions, this so. kind of thing right. if we roll this Because then this they, kind of they pay fuck all, so it's just, it's I never do them. It's just time, and, and the, this is all data that, that we, as long as we can get it up front, we can pass that into the mission ahead of time. And, and actually show that in the mission right up. You know, it's like, here's, here's a mission that's going to take you here. It was offered by this guy. Here's... General Expect rewards. a medium level of resistance, yeah. or this many hazards, or yeah. Fundamentally, that's why reputation still not much. Is it's it's your. It, I, I would it say it, how yeah, possibly. It's, 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 the it's basically one of those missions where you have to go into a uh, really underground base, you know, find you like a bunch of pallets filled with drugs, and just smash them at the back of your gun. Weapons, you know, for your character, but in terms of granting you, you know, membership within an organization or access to areas, you know, um, with, you know, with with more or less hostility, depending upon which organization you're a member of and you know what or your organization is within there, and how this character responds to you, and whether yes. they give you the you know, the super challenging and lucrative missions or the super easy things that basically just have you, you know, doing, you know, piddly little stuff that, that, that anyone can accomplish because they don't yet know you and don't yet trust you. Um, that's what the reputation system is MT all about. protection We've services. Never seen those either. You know, as I said earlier, the basic system. But I, I guess those are for year, missions on Microtech itself. The reputational logic into, the, you know, into the subsumption, you know, mission and AI language. Um, we got the Delphi app so that you can actually see what your standing is with all these different NPCs and organizations the one piece the you know the key piece of the puzzle that we're still missing is the ability of the mission system to basically one have the mission templates you know created that actually take these inputs and then be able to feed them in and have it customize itself as appropriate and uh, related to that is you know and it, it's no small talent it is a fair is, is going to be a fair bit of work to adapt the the UI to actually allow for this and that's you know just just on a brief aside one of the big Tasks remaining on the you know, on the USPU group for next year is going to be refactoring the entire mission interface and converting it from the old flash tech to the building blocks you know tech, and that's one of the reasons huge, why yeah. we made some forward progress on this and then we kind of like waited because anything that we would have done over on the flash side would have been throwaway work and so we made the decision to basically wait to complete the last 25% of this particular puzzle until we had the correct you know, UI foundation in place, which ultimately, A, it'll make it much easier to implement these changes that I'm talking about, and B, you know, we're not going to have to you know, design it, throw it away, and then design it again. And, and it doesn't mean smart, that the player smart. will be able Can't to experience him. those changes in the game. Can't blame him on, the, on that UI, decision. Right? That'll, that'll still be there, but we'll be able to present that and, and give Why make a, something a if, you, if you're just going to throw it away anyway? out or what you're going to get as a result of the mission with the, the new UI. And, and also to show you this is wasted effort that you don't have the reputation yeah, for. Right, exactly. Like, it's weird that, that how important that is, but it actually is, is vital that you be able to see like, hey, I'm not actually with these people. They don't know that I'm that good of a cargo hauler, so they're not going to give me this super difficult cargo hauling mission. Um, well, you got to know what you're striving towards too, exactly. as well, right? It's like I, I, I want to get better at this. I want to do missions with these yes. guys because that's going to push me to go and get that one right there. That offers this much extra reward or this, this membership here. Yeah, and, I, I, and I don't want, I, I don't want to go into this. This is a, this uh, is like, a, no, I just mean this, this is a topic, topic for another day. Sure. But yeah. I was just going to briefly mention, you know, orgs, perks, benefits. So we're talking about reputation, and you can see your standing with, you know, with different organizations, with players, and we will, you know, at some point, you know, next year, you know, start to move forward with. 
you know, w with, with, when I say orgs, perks, benefits, you guys know what I'm talking about, which is basically all of the benefits that may, you know, uh, that may be conveyed upon you just as a result of being within this organization or having a certain level of stature within this organization. This may be anything from, you know, expedited, you know, ship deliveries. You know, after your ship gets blown up, you, yeah. you, you don't have to basically, you know, pay a fee to basically, you know, get it as quickly as possible. That's automatically covered. You may get, you know, discounted prices at certain shops. Um, you may, you know, simply not get a hostile response from pirates in this area if you're a member of, you know, of the Pirates Guild and things of that yeah, sort. Yeah, I don't know. So th this plays into what we're talking about here because you're able no to look at an organization. You're able to understand what. Nah, that'd be stupid. Because that would be actual to, you know, pay to win. Exalted members, and then nah, you that can shouldn't decide be a thing. whether or not you want to basically try to increase, you know, increase your ranks, you know, within there. And you know, in in terms of doing that, the challenge is simply having enough mission variety. And well, yeah, in real life, to real life is paid to win. Feel, hey, I I started out. He didn't trust me. He gave me, you know, the real simple, not particularly lucrative mission. And I've been working on this for days and days and days, and I've been moving up in terms of the difficulty that I face. Why would you do tiny box missions if you can just, you know, buy SCU and just fly and SCU from A to B? You know, have Pays a lot more too. And now I can basically go to grim hex and have no concern that you know the local you know pirate organization is basically going to well, that, that's why you basically do bounty so, hunting at first like that is something that or i personally would do bounty hunting in first it's, it's in very important era. that you bring something to the table that other members of your your friend group might not have frankly or your organization you have to come in and say hey i actually have access to this really cool mission or this really cool thing and and by doing that i can can make things cooler for my group, and we encourage that community play that is so vital. Yeah, that, that actually brings to mind, right now we have, we've historically had this faction system that we use to determine hostility. It's, it's, it's always been, it's, it's, it's always been one of these systems that we know we're going to change it. We know that it's not sufficient, you know, for where we're eventually going. Um, it's, it's very just rigid. Never, yeah, it's just, yeah. it's, it's just never, it's never been a high enough priority. We're getting to the point where we're going to have to resolve this because the rest of the game is getting complex enough to where it's 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 really starting to fray at the seams. So earlier this year we released the Xenothreat mission and that was still entirely based upon the faction system of hostility and that imposed a serious limitation in that while players could join up and basically fight on the side of the UE and try to repel the Xenothreat invaders, there was no real officially sanctioned you know means of you joining the side of the bad guys the yeah. xeno threat you could go shoot you know the players that were su su you know supporting the ue sure. you could shoot the ue itself you could get a crime stat but the xeno threat would still view you as hostile they yeah, would still exactly. engage you still try to kill you etc this was something yeah, that we got right up mean. to the very end with nine tails and it was driving you and I crazy. Yes. And we wanted to. Fix but then it. you and could ask other people. It to, I'd say, that you meet for like a loan to, to get started, like a Kickstarter loan. If you know what I mean. Is allow a faction to override like someone that does normal, bounty hunting you know, for as a main thing someone in another faction you could go up to him like hey if you have so much money can i have a particular mission can i can i get a loan from you and then well, as a kickstarter i'll pay you back with my time. profit and all that stuff um and and that is honestly not how we want to do this a hundred percent so so in this particular case if you accept the support nine tails you know mission Suddenly everyone then flips. they would normally view you as hostile but because you're holding that you know that token that mission reference yeah. they'll go ahead and grant you an exemption but this is you know it is clumsy it was viewed as a, a very temporary solution the long-term solution that we've always discussed is going to a more reputational yeah. you know based uh, you know hostility system can you go into a little bit of detail about why that's so important and what kind of additional things uh, we'll be able to support in the future when we have such a, a more flexible system. Sure. I mean, the, yeah, unless the, the what you said is, is going to happen. Like if you have a big have ship, you'll start sure out with missions mission to use to that big that ship. I can't say, for instance, At that point, impacts, then sorry, you're on the side you of the kind police, of get an like, edge. They will shoot you. That is a problem. No, right now, like they are actually just civilians so that they don't they don't. So like you get a mission like um, go to this station, persists, pick matter, up like 200 SCU worth of this, and you get like what 200k or something. And what you do, unless that changes, 
they are going to attack you or not attack you, and you can kind of count on that. Well, your actions have an impact they do. Uh, on how the world perceives you, right? Yep. And it's especially important, like, as, as we go into Pyro, as out. there's multiple factions that are that are kind of at war with each other out there, we, we want the players to be able to get in, go to one or, one or the other. Exactly. So I, I, it, it's a change that we know we need to make, and I think it's really going to take shape and form I as we go into Pyro, because UE in Stanton is a pretty you know, binary thing. There's little pockets of pirates, but it's not sure. its not like Pyro, where it's going to have like these very distinct groups that are kind of warring with each other. And we, the reputation system is perfect for that. It will allow us to open up also just like an entire branch of content. Like we don't really have missions where you work with criminals for the criminals. There's, there's nothing that really makes you a long-term criminal player. Y your crime stat can be wiped. You can kind of, you know, get rid yeah. of that source. It's, it's not something that I am a criminal player and I, I, I log in and I'm going to do these kinds of things. I'm going to be on this side of things. These people hate me. These people love me. Um, that <laughs> allows you to define your character. That allows you to define your play style. That allows you to, to define where you're going to do and what you're going to do in the game. The entire depends game on, on the truck driver, I guess. Yeah, if you're I like an international, like, world like on your own yeah, truck driver and you hostility purchased it your own truck, equates to then I think you're going to make you way more I than you know, someone that's like between, contracted there's, there's as in a company as just a truck driver without his own equipment. This organization hates that one, this one likes this one, you know, this one doesn't like, this one's neutral towards that one, etc. And you wind up having inevitably some sort of unique mixture of all of these different things and so in the end you know you'll you'll you know we will prioritize these things and determine it's like oh well you're you know you're a member of you know the you know the walk old ladies across the street well i i like that oh but you're also a member of the pirate guild i i really hate that so even though i like that one i'm still going to attack you and so it's just it's much more flexible in terms of you know in terms of determining all these you know complex relationships that players are eventually going to instill upon their characters like it's not going to be either I'm left faction or right faction it's like there's going to be lots and lots of different organizations lots of different NPCs and you're standing with those will be all over the map some players will be in really good standing with this some players you know will be really low on this other one and you know the, the, the level of variability that we'll be able to support with you know with the reputation system is just going to be you know far far superior to what we have now. Nine Tails and Jump Down V2. Jump Down V2, I'm excited, dude. Dorsey, you implemented the Nine Tails mission, which allowed players to fight on either side of the conflict. How does the gameplay experience differ depending upon which side you choose to support? And can you explain how this actually, in the end, wound up being a many, sort of optimization of sorts? Not many people I mean, actually you, played you as. Hit the nail on the head. What happens differently with is the if you Nine are Tails on, on the, uh, the lawful side, you are working for Crusader Security. Uh, they are sending out scanning ships to try and locate the Nine Tails fleet. Every um, time I play Nine Tails, I haven't seen and then once a single that player that go and destroy that fleet joined in ships until on the Nine Tails side voluntarily. So retreat from the area. On the Nine Tails side of that, you are of course going and hunting those scanning ships. You are uh, given their locations and you're told, "Hey, go destroy these." And then once the fleet portion of it gets found, you go and try to defend that fleet. And if you can hold them off for long enough, then Ninetales will actually uh, win and, and uh, Crusader will be unable to drive them away before they achieve their their objective, essentially, which is a, a hidden objective that, that we aren't revealing. Yeah, I bet. But the thing is, like, um, no, almost never is there anyone <laughs> that joins on Ninetales. So it's, the, uh, the, most the of the time of it's this, still... Though, Nine Tails was not uh, originally actually supposed to be a PvP event at PvE. all. It was yeah. much like Xenthrit, supposed to be just pure PvE. That had performance problems, frankly. Uh, spawning enough ships in a, a pure giant fleet battle to challenge 30 to 50 players made the server just tank. Um, it, was, it was incredibly painful, and it just didn't play very well. Um, it also, to be honest, was the same thing as, as what Xenothreat yeah, already exactly. had done. And I wanted to do something a little different. Um, and that, that kind of combined into to this, this push to get um, the aforementioned kind of duct tape solution for hostility in so that you can align on, on both sides. And, and by doing that, I make it so that I don't need to spawn ships to challenge 30 to 50 people. If things are running smoothly, I have 25 versus 25, and I don't need to spawn really just about anything. Right. 
Um, you bring the NPCs in just to flesh to, out, to, 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 to fill, even the odds, yeah. to, to get the challenge you know, to the level you need. Um, but when you actually have players that will legitimately fulfill a particular role, you, you take off. advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, it was a creative way to load balance the mission and yeah. the population. In the I, area. I, I would nice. say, though, that in general, this is 100% <laughs> exactly what we do want to do, which is we want to give the players yeah the total freedom to basically do whatever they want and right. then as i always say it's like you know they live with the consequences they live with the repercussions mm -hmm. of their actions if you go and support nine tails if you support xenothreat it's like that will have you know an impact on okay. how people view you you know the yeah. aforementioned reputation system and you're standing with you know with key npcs within the game and how you the ue views you and you know whether or not certain organizations want to allow you within their ranks and some of these things you do will have long-standing impact yeah. where if you ally yourself with a group you know uh, you know like the nine tails you may be prohibited from joining some organization that yep. you've been aspiring to for a very long time unless so, you do something to work that back like yeah, you got to well, and it's a balance trust. right yeah. and and we want we want those scales to go one way or the other it's not that we want you to be able to be perfect with everybody all the time like that it comes at a cost. It depends upon the severity, right? Which is Fully if agreed. you do jaywalking, well yeah. then sure, someone is not gonna find it that difficult to basically assume that from now on, you'll stay on the right side of the law, so we'll go ahead and you let you into our transport guild. If on their hand you're you know, committing acts of piracy and murder and everything else, it's like, oh, well now I'm not sure that I actually want you in our organization which adheres to all the laws of the nearby area and everything of that sort. That element of being able to pick your side and, and do what you want to do in the game is something that, you know, because of that we want to allow in pretty much every piece of our content going yeah, forward. It, it needs is, to be as much as possible. Ingrained in the game with yeah. everything else. Yeah. The only reason we haven't, you know, traditionally supported it is is it's the tech. It's it, it's well, and, and to a large degree, you can call out a few specific pieces of the tech, right? Yeah. Which is the reputation system certainly plays a role. Um, the, you know, the lack of a reputation-based hostility system. We're still using the old faction system. For Xenothreat, that was literally the number one reason why early in the development process we nixed it. On Ninetales, we were literally within weeks of release, and it... it, it so it, it, would, it, it was going to bother me <laughs> to yes. put out a second one yeah. that had the exact same yep. limitation as the first. And so despite the fact that it was going to be you know, an un unattractive hack to fix it, yep. I wanted to fix it. Dude, it imagine it when these technical the hurdles experience. are finally gone. So it, it is, what they can you know, do what with this. What I always this. refer to is it's duct tape. We'll get some value out of it as soon and as quickly as we can. You know, convert the hostility system over to the you know the proper reputational version. We'll do that. When these uh, tech hurdles general, are gone, man, for the short run, going to be a game we can changer. Continue to use this hack for some other missions that we have in offer. And once we have that reputation version in, like we will update Nine Tails to handle that and it will play better as a result yeah that, that's actually another uh, point that i want to like touch on a little bit which is so we did xeno threat and we released it and then we basically brought it back and you know did some relatively mild alterations we changed how the two middle phases basically transitioned automatically between them as opposed to being distinct so that we could have the whole salvage process and then you had you know the climactic battle and then it kind of like rolled around but there was still salvaging you know during the later part on nine tails we basically released it and you've already identified a number of shortcomings with yeah. it that you want to address, not just for 315, but even beyond that. And yes. this is this is something, so I wanna, I wanna get to that in a second, but this is something that we're gonna continue to do with a lot of these dynamic events. They're intended not as one-shot missions, you play them for you know, a month, a quarter, you know, six months, and then we lose interest and we move to other stuff. The, the basic idea for these things is these events represent some sort of, you know, archetype almost yeah well I, i'd say they they represent it's almost like a customized chunk of gameplay it's yeah. pirates have locked down an area or xenothreat has decided to invade the solar system or pirates have basically run amok you know over in this area or you know drug runners have completely you know seized control of these you know manufacturing facility you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and the idea is that we'll have all of this information over within quantum and then we'll look within our yes. extensive library of these events and we'll decide which one 
most closely you know, matches that, we'll customize it as appropriate and then trigger it. And so the idea is that we're, we're layering all of this, this custom handcrafted designer content onto this systemic background. Yes. And so we really get the best of both worlds. We get you know, a nice, logical, systemic universe that ebbs and flows, it evolves, it basically changes logically in response to player actions. But at the same time, we get all of the you know, incredible stories and the explicit dialogue and the intricately designed challenges that a designer has put a lot of you know, time and thought and effort into doing. Um, and so you really get both of these blended together. But back to nine tails. So on 315, we're going to tweak a couple of the problems that you've identified. So you want to start with that? They're relatively small things, honestly, just due to the schedule. It's probably the most impactful one and the one that I've seen the most people talking about. There is a portion of um, Ninetales on the lawful side where you can deliver medical supplies to the blockaded station for a bit of an extra reward. They will pay you a little bit more if you have a certain mission. Um, and also their inventory is just very rapidly depleting, so you can pretty I've never even tried sell this, honestly. And, and they, you will be selling at the best price that they can offer. The problem that occurs there is that yep, everybody no buys all of the medical supplies out there. And while that's really cool on a realism statement, with, with the game in the state it is and with trading in the state it is, that means that a lot of people can't yep. participate in that part of the mission. And that's True. problematic, um, particularly at this Fair. point where we want to be testing how those play. We really want people engaging in that part of things. I, get, I totally get what he means. Those of were part of the, the first wave of Ivacati when we first tested this way back might actually remember that we originally had shop modifiers on the places that were selling medical supplies to make it so that they had a higher inventory that refreshed fairly frequently so that everyone could kind of engage in that. We were asked to remove those so that we could emphasize the derelicts, which are around the station that um, you can take medical supplies off of, because basically the derelicts made it so that there was another way to get those medical supplies, but they didn't. It, it took there so were much more derelicts time around the station. Really no I've never seen derelicts around the station. Well, exactly, that's what you were talking yes. about earlier, which is I can buy them instantaneously from the shop, and there's no loading right. time, and then I can move them over here, and I can instantly unload them. If I had to physically pull them off, you could more easily balance these things. Whereas right now, I really do have to go manually pull each individual one off of the derelict ship, and so I'm incurring all of the you know, the physicalized cargo expense on one side and not on the other. And so in the end, sure, you know, just due to the sheer amount of time, it's like it takes me 30 minutes to get 12 yep. boxes this way or I can go buy 50 boxes, you know, in a split second. Which one are you going to do? Some people might still do the derelict because they're fun, frankly. It's a fun little FPS raid, but yeah, a lot of people are going to look at the, the, the dollar signs and just go, okay, this is obviously the Yeah, it's just option. not worth it. That being said, we're probably going to put back in. It's actually a pretty easy, I left them in there because I had a feeling we might want them back. Uh, we're just going to flip a switch and probably put those shop modifiers back in. We, we've seen how people play the derelicts. There's plenty of them in Xena Threat. Um, we want to see the trading, frankly, and, and so that will allow that to come back online. Another relatively small change um, that, that, that is probably going to be coming in. We are seeing that many people are not engaging with the criminal side of things. Exactly what I was talking about. Very much. Like, uh, the whole thing that we were doing with making it into a PvP mission for, for uh, the purposes of, of exactly. helping performance We're going to have to gets, better gets entice them to basically so, fight on exactly. know, the side of the nine we, we need to entice them. So that means, I mean, they already are being paid more than the other side. I'm probably going to up that even more. Frankly. Yeah, they, they should. They're going to become they should. very lucrative, hopefully. And that is the short-term solution. And, 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 and this is where, like, ideally, you you know, helping out the Nine Tails building reputation. Becomes, Ideally, we yeah, would be able to yeah, offer other benefits of yes. being in that organization. Other things that some percentage like of the taking more missions from Nine Tails and one. You know, other rewards that you get for building, you know, for building up your standing with them. Which won't be for three fifteen. You know, but but that is definitely where that is intended to go. The other thing that we might want there is a system to dynamically modify jurisdiction because one of the big punish points that happens to a criminal True. when they True. are. Uh, helping on that side in that area, despite the fact that Ninetales has supposedly taken over this area, when they get killed, they go to jail, which right. is a bit weird, frankly. We, we originally did want to make it so that you wouldn't get brought to jail, but there just wasn't enough time to fit the tech into the schedule. There still won't be for 315, but that is a longer term thing that we want to have, is the ability to kind of dynamically modify these. Yeah, yeah. that's just yeah. light on a problem, right? Yeah. Like it, exactly. Yeah. It was one we kind of saw coming, but, but frankly, yeah, the jailing stuff is, is an issue. Yeah. We can hopefully put some pressure on that, that happening. 
Yeah, we, we, we have a lot of those. Like we added yeah. this, we had the shop modifiers, we had the probability volume modifiers, we added the ability to do, you know, the quantum lockdowns, you know, through the dynamic events and stuff. We haven't yet added the ability to add the, the dynamic population modifiers. And so this one was, as you said, we, we knew this was going to be an issue. You can't necessarily get everything you'd like into every release. And so the point is, we got nine tails out. You had some other longer term yes. things that you wanted to address as well. Can you talk about those? It's, it, well, some of them, frankly, are just things that are going to be uh, things that will naturally happen, to be honest. Um, performance is uh, still a big problem. I do want to like talk to the performance thing for you know for a second, which it's is some progress. Uh, it's been we we basically generated something on the order of 120, 130 yeah. different individual gyras um, that people were addressing in the run up to Xeno threat. Because what what inevitably winds up happening is is we get performance to a certain level, and then we're at, you know, we're basically adding Tweaking. more locations. We're basically enhancing the AI logic. Yeah. We're adding you know new functionality, and so it's 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 always a running battle to where you're adding more you know you're adding more stuff as you're making other stuff run faster, and so yeah. you tend to get a net wash. And it's we actually pull. found ourselves with Xeno Threat. One of the reasons we held it for a couple of extra weeks was we wound up finding ourselves in a very bad spot to where there are inevitably there are, there are problems now. We're very familiar with them. Um, they were much worse, you know just a few, you know, uh, you Before, know, when we were originally yeah. supposed to release it. We fixed just, it was it so was many. an endless litany of these things where it's like, you know, on profiles, you know, it's things showing up, yeah. you know, stalling the main thread, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Those are getting Ooh. cut down to a millisecond here, two milliseconds, but there's just such a quantity. And so the what I want to touch on a little bit is, is as we finalize some bits of tech, like part of the reason we were able to devote as much time to getting things back into at least you know uh, what i'd call like you know an acceptable state not a great state we've got a lot you know we've got a lot more work to do to get this thing to the level of performance we want there's a lot of problems you know the rubber banding that you know we're yeah, intimately that's, familiar that's with we absolutely positively want to deal with it it drives us we you know we all hate it you know we want to fix it um, but as some of these people roll off of things like their server meshing you know tasks and stuff we're now getting to the point to where we can keep people focused on this particular yeah. problem for, you know, certainly a longer period of time than they've been able to do in the past. It's, it's just I, a matter I, of that being the focus. I, that, that's exactly it. Yeah. It's, it's just a matter of it being the focus. A lot of the engineers that are working on server meshing are the people that would be fixing these optimization problems, right? So your your game's going to run as fast as your biggest bottleneck, and that's about it, right? And you're going to hit the next one and the next one, and you're going to keep fixing them until yep. Yep. your yep. game True. runs a yeah, it was It was almost True. an endless litany of spawn stalls, the entity, you know, deletion stalls. And it was impressive to see how quickly those guys were eradicating, you know, some of these really, really Big egregious, ones, like, you know, performance, you know, impactors. Like three, four hundred millisecond spikes going down. Go, going down to one, like, or yeah, one or two milliseconds. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's enormous. We, we spend three, a lot of time crafting to make sure that, like, this, the, these waves are coming at the appropriate amount of, of, of um, difficulty crazy. for the number of players that are there and, and all this stuff. And if the spawn queue starts to slow down, that kind of snarls. It doesn't, it just doesn't work. You can't design a great experience you can design an okay experience but not a great yeah, one as, as yeah, you know on, on nine tails i know we we played with this quite a bit yes. we definitely did on xeno threat to where it's like well we want to bring in 10 guys at once to present right. a certain amount of challenge but then yeah. you got to like spawn them all simultaneously and so we wind up bringing them in one at a time so we're basically distributing yes. you know the spawn load over time and while it's true that you know, on that's average, basically what the, we were seeing you know, the with Xeno uh, Threat, like uh, phase you know, two, challenge you're going to but face the, will be the, the salvaging, a big difference like people were salvaging, and it's always like one dude one. coming in with and an arrow, you kill him, with the and then another arrow comes in, you kill him, and another arrow down. comes in. So as the There's never a wave like 10, improves, 10 ships coming in at once. we'll basically start to expand our ambitions in terms of you know, what we're, you know, what, what, what kind of experiences we're actually putting out there for players. And the existing ones will just improve, frankly. Those missions will almost become new beasts just by the very nature of that happening. And that's, that's what, when, when you say, like, what is the long-term thing, that to me is, is the biggest thing, because a lot of these events will just be better. You're currently working on a sequel of sorts called Jumptown V2. Can you go into some more detail about what players can Jump expect Jumptown V2, from that let's go. Release? Yeah, it's it's actually, let's go. I'm trying to keep it very, very simple. Uh, Jumptown was originally this this community event. Uh, hey, Kyle, it's and, us. And I want to keep that, that vibe as much as possible. I, I'm, it's I us. have a very light hand. So <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm basically taking a location, 
um, I'm going to make it so that it starts to spawn physically um, a bunch of boxes of, of a very lucrative uh, uh, material, in this case, maize, commodity. Um, maize. And, and that will then... Never heard of It'll maize. start to spit that out at a certain rate, which will... will <laughs> entice people to go there and, and, and collect it, put it on their ships, fly it away, whatever. Um, but but, but the, the, the point there is that that is an area that will be very, very lucrative for a, sh a short period. I know, it will right? entice a lot of people <laughs> to conflict over it. Um, when, I wouldn't when even be upset if I got killed by that. I would be like, wow, freedom, what a show of force, every dude. 30 seconds or so. Like, that is that is dollar signs, and and people will kill for that. I wouldn't Not be mad. Not only because it's I'd fun, be... but also because it's it's worth it. Right? I'd be like, wow. So so essentially, there is a location, there is a, a thing that spawns these boxes, and I'm going to turn it on, and that's about it. W one one of the things I didn't like about the original Jump Town was it was at a fixed location, and it was always on, and it basically spit these things out at a certain frequency. Outside of the fact that it was a bug. Same. I, I just yeah. can't understand it. I would have been <laughs> like, wow, it, it GG, was, dude, it, it, it bring it such a yeah, force. That, that's exactly it. And in general, I, I just like, I hate gee, static gee, things gee. because you know it, it's 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 always the same. So ha let's talk a little bit about Jump Town V2 is being designed as a dynamic event, yes. and it's also extremely configurable. So yeah. we're going to start with support for any of the drug labs, the although that's really just a function of whether or not we could get environmental art team support Correct. for the other areas. Longer term, we will be able to activate this yep. at you know at a wide variety of different locations. We yeah, I don't get it, dude. It's pretty simple. It can be worked at all these different places. Yeah. Um, True. Sure, but but True. there there's a lot of things like uh, we put a lot of thought into recording additional lines of we dialogue did. to support different types of you know you know drugs or different types of commodities. Yep. You know, we have some generic lines so it can apply to you know all the stuff you know that's anything. You know, we don't want to be stuff. hampered by that because the the the, the lead-in time for for getting that dialogue can can be a little bit. Um, uh, damaging to doing just quick ads, frankly. Like, we want to be able to just say uh, during a quarter, hey, you know what would be really cool? If there was an underground facility that was pumping out data or um, metal or, or at a refinery, and we want people to fight over that, and we can just add that because we, we so, planned ahead. So we've got dynamism for Jump Town B2 with respect to location. location. We've got dynamism with respect to what exactly it's going to be pumping yep. out. Another one that I wanted to support was the quantity. In other words, yeah, how long how will this thing be spitting it out? Is it going to spit out a hundred, you know, you know, a hundred SEU of cargo or a thousand, you know, a hundred units of drugs, you know, you know, or, or ten thousand? And this was something again. So it's been configured as a dynamic event to where it can have this this information passed into it and then configure itself as appropriate at runtime. Like that means whoever yeah. or whatever. If That's it, the critical it, part. It, 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 it currently is, is launched by a person who is literally like pressing a button on a, on a page. Um, and when they do, they can enter in a bunch of variables, and, and those will determine where it's happening, what it's spitting out, how long it's going to last, sure. how fast. Yeah, I, I, I'll actually talk about that a little bit sure. later to where right right now, you know, all of the events that we've launched so far are triggered, you know, via Quasar, and a person goes in, specifies the event, and, specifies the inputs. You know, and so you'll so talk so. about it being 100%. So Jumptown B2, an another one of the specific design objectives was to use it as the first test case for these systemic triggers to where we can actually have quantum inject this information dynamically. Yes. And so like right now we're running nine tails and one of the complaints that I've seen is, you know, hey, it doesn't fire you know, often enough. It's like I missed it and then it's gone. And so one of the you know, one of the directions in which we want to go is having some of these events, like Jump Town, which can be triggered by player by, actions, by player and actions and or quanta, or player yes. and quanta, basically doing whatever we determine. Maybe it is a certain amount of drugs are being bought, sold, inter, you know, yes. lots of you know, drug runners are basically you know, traversing this shipping lane. Whatever kind of you know, conditions we want to put, and then we can measure you know, both on the quantum side, you know, eventually, and then you, even in the short term, you know, on the players, it's like how many players are basically moving drugs back and forth here? Yeah. How many players are basically, you know, dropping commodities off at this location? And if we have a dynamic event compatible with whatever these, you know, with whatever these, you know, uh, whatever these conditions are, then we can go ahead and automatically trigger it and inject, you know, inject those customized parameters into it so that it, so that it basically more accurately represents what's actually going on in that area. Right now we're just shortchanging that, but, but eventually, yeah. 
Yeah, Th private. that's that's actually you know I, I I like the whole you know jump town concept, but I, you know my my favorite aspect by far is the fact that it's being designed as a test case for some of this you know up and coming you know systemic yeah. technology on the back end, so that we can start to go oh at 3 a.m. conditions you know were met and we're gonna go ahead and trigger jump town you know on you know on on Lyria and we're basically going to put this particular drug into it and it's going to be 679 you know, units of drugs and you know however quickly you know players are there to basically you know pull those things out that will be how long it lasts and so all of a sudden you have you know it's it's a transient event which is sometimes we may inject, you know, we, we, we can scale this however we want, sure. such that, the, you know, when these conditions are met, do we take the total number of, you know, you know delivered drug, you know, drugs or whatever and multiply times 10? So we can basically turn it into something that's going to range for an hour or a day or 10 days or whatever else, but we can, we days, can add dude. that variable factor to where it's not always a constant. It's not always, you know, on for the entire, you know, for, you know, for the entire lifetime of the release. It's not always seven days. There's actually going to be, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's going to depend upon what is really happening within the world, and that's going yeah. to cause it to be customized. It's just something that's happening in the game. I mean, it's yeah. it's you, it's uh, natural events triggering in the world. You mentioned people on. saying like Nine Tails wasn't happening enough, and they would log on and they would wait for it to happen. That is not the goal. The goal is I log on and I see something is happening. There should always be an event of some kind that you could go and do. Maybe you log on and you want to do this particular thing, but also, oh man, that's happening right now? Cool, kind of thing. So yeah, there will be there will be, there will be some of both. You know, Xenothreat is the obviously big, yeah. you know, the big ones, and then you've yeah. got what I'd call like you know the the, the mid range you know things like the Nine Tails and stuff, sure. where you're locking down an entire area, and all of a sudden we've basically we've cordoned off you know. A region, and we're not allowing you to easily transport you know, uh, you know, quo. cargo, you know, back and forth to there, which basically starts knocking the prices up. Which is why we added all the, you know, the price alerts and things like that, so that you can actually be enticed by the fact that oh, this area that's been choked off. They really, really need copper. They're willing to pay this. Don't you want to try to break through the blockade? That actually does kind of get to uh, what you were saying earlier. You kind of need like a um, some of the player ships a stealth or some of the NPCs cargo hauler for that. To actually be more effective at it yes. as we start to expand yeah. those quantum interdiction zones you know, it, to a larger size. It all interconnects. Yeah. And it could be influenced by players or the back end yes. simulation. Unless you can turn it's, a Mercury Star Runner into a uh, stealth build. More analytics from the back end. It's, it's measurable and it, it'll That'd be, be cool. something we can tune over time. An another one on, on uh, another point we're talking about on Jump Town for future directions forward is, and you and I have had this conversation a couple of times, is I would like to eventually be able to have NPCs basically fill in the other side. Like oh, right yeah. now, sure. one of the inherent flaws in it is it's purely PvP, right? Which is, I go there, I basically you know, control that area, I get the loot for as long as it's pumping it out, and unless other players come and try to basically kick you out of that area, it's, it's a cakewalk. And what we would want to be able to simulate, obviously, is we're go, you know, if, if players are not going there, you know, would would Quanta, you know, over on the simulation side, would they be attracted to, you know, this value generator? Of course they would. Great. At at what rate? Yeah, and that what rate's gonna depend upon what it's spitting out, what the street, you know, value of that stuff is, how far it is from civilization and they therefore have to travel, et cetera. And so the point would be that we want to be able to, just as we were talking about earlier, we want to be, you know, with nine tails to where we were aligning, you know, players on either side saying we'll use NPCs to basically you know, to balance it however we want. In this case, if there are zero players on you know the you know on the attacking side trying to like take it over, well we're gonna have to fill those ranks with NPCs. That being said, one of the things that is called out very often as being an exciting portion of Jump Town, the original, was going there and not knowing if you were going to find resistance. That could kind of keep you on the edge of your seat a little bit. There's that it's too quiet. So it won't always a be a hundred a hundred percent, but but you don't need th that that Uncertainty doesn't necessarily need to only come as a result of whether or whether or not players are willing to do it. We can have uncertainty on the NPC side and say, maybe we will, maybe we won't basically you know, have them assault. Maybe they'll come in a straggler, one guy at a time. Maybe they'll come in a big coordinated group of 12 NPCs, Our all in heavy right. armor, armed to the tooth, and, you know, and, and you'll basically be Nova's. doing your absolute best you know, to, you know, to hold that, calling your friends, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the point is, like right now, unless we have the ability to basically 
set those scenarios up, then you know, th some players on some servers will never Spend get on. that cool experience yeah. of a whole burst of guys you know, arriving at one shot or the stragglers. Now, if players are basically going in there, like, well, sure, I've already got 20 yeah. players on this side. Maybe I don't need to throw any other NPCs out to, you know, to... Or maybe I want to add fuel to the fire, frankly. Or, like or it, maybe you want to throw, it, yeah. Players were very creative in the first one. Yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> and, and that's honestly what I'm really looking forward to is, is what is the, the tools that have been added to the sandbox at this point, it's such a simple event. I really am looking forward to seeing how they, they handle it. Like, you can come in in a, a land vehicle, and you can, you can set up a tank or a ballista and just, like, pick people out of the sky, defend that area, turn it into a fortress. You can have dogfights in the air over it. You can, um, if you're stupid and you leave your ship turned off with its shields off, like, someone's going to blow that I, up. You and I talked in the early, early stages of Nine Tails about the fact that it's a drug lab. Why is it basically spitting, you know, spitting these things out? And the idea would be, well, they produced a lot of them at that location. And so who would be one of the most logical people to come and try to take back control? It would be the guys that, you know, that basically, you know, Originally had control of that drug lab. It'd be you know whatever you know uh, criminal organization Happened we to want to basically yeah. have that thing or and a competition. One hundred percent. And so you could see you know players are in there basically. That's you know, not a bad idea. To be another honest. you know player team assaults them, and now the much much larger threat comes, and the players you know it could be a three way. The could players can team up yeah. you know with each other to basically hold them off and then split the goods you know et cetera et cetera. So the, the the real point to my mind is it just comes back to is configurability, which it is will be I want to I want to be able to vary the location, vary the you know the type of material, vary the quantity of that material and the frequency with which it's produced. I want to be able to vary the challenges you'll face trying to basically hold it, and all of a sudden that starts to become representative of what we're trying to do with all these different uh, dynamic awesome. events, which is. Yeah. We have a, we want to make templates that we can. You know, I always call it object-oriented content creation. You know, it, it's such a common concept over on the coding side. You don't really see much focus over on the content creation to basically put all of these rules and procedures and processes in place so that you can basically build nice modular chunks of content and easily link them to other pieces so that you're not reinventing the wheel every time you're doing this. Uh, like a good, you know, uh, you know, a good example is the spawn clauses that we're doing, you know, over for some of the infiltrator missions that we'll be talking about. It's like, that's absolutely going to play a factor in some of these, you know, future iterations of things like, you know, whether it's nine tails, you could see nine tails eventually, you know, supporting nav mesh, planetary and nav mesh is also going to be nine tails members on them that we can huge basically create for these missions two or 20 you know we can create them over time we can basically you know change you know the like an ai who fell asleep landing like there's with so a bunch of marines on there that, so yeah pyro like a dragonfly in there flying out the strife that is yeah. supposed to be going on out there so looking forward to it all right let's bring luke into the conversation now we started working on the Xenothread event around March of 2020, and it took about a year to get it out the door. We knew that it was going to be extremely difficult because we were missing so much of what we needed, including everything from the dynamic mission service that would drive the back-end logic to the capital ship AI, target prioritization for turrets, functional countermeasures, tons of dialogue, and countless other things. Part of the allure, though, was that in one shot, we'd have a great test case for a litany of important features, like battles far larger than anything we'd previously done, and a test bed for creating missions that supported a variety of different play styles, like ship-to-ship -ship combat and salvaging. So, Luke, from your perspective, what were some of the big lessons we learned from Xenothreat? Well, Xenothreat was our first attempt at a large-scale fleet battle, so we learned a lot. The biggest takeaway was that we needed to develop our overly simplistic friendly fire system which was leading to players receiving unfair crime stats and being kicked from the mission. So in the recent re-release of the event, we made major improvements to our friendly fire detection and tolerances, which drastically cut down on unfair crime stats according to True. the feedback True. and analytics we received. What's great is this kind of change improves the whole game, not just the event, and paves the way for more large-scale space battles in the future. I think it's also important to add but another thing that became clear was that players wanted a counter mission involving PvP. So we've started planning this in mind for subsequent releases. Luke, as the performance gradually improves over the next few quarters, what sort of things would you most like to change about Xenothreat? I think most people would expect my answer to be throw more AI at the player. But it might be that when the performance improves, our AI becomes much deadlier, which could actually lead to us reducing their numbers. Uh, this balancing is always the most difficult part of mission creation. 
the AI's performance can be wildly different on our local servers versus what it might be like on an overtax live server. And if an emission is too yeah, easy, like it's AI not, not actually responding at all. AI at it, as this will only compound the performance issues. We were happy with the balancing we achieved, but it wasn't quite what we hoped for. Once performance has improved, we hope to rebalance and deliver the experience we intended. Luke, we've invested a lot of engineering effort into our spawn closet tech, yeah, dude, which allows us AI to is actually and incredibly good when it actually works. Out of an area. The first major test of this tech will be the infiltrator class of missions, which I wanted to provide much more varied and challenging FPS situations than anything we've previously seen. To that end, we can now determine at runtime the type and number of NPCs we want to insert at a location, often at the behest of quantum. We can also apply a litany of rules to the spawning, like how many can be active at once, how the spawn rate changes when an alarm has gone off, and whether a boss might be found wandering the area with his guards or only after they've all been dispatched. The mission template supports a wide variety of objectives, ranging from killing everyone at that location to only killing select individuals, to protecting NPCs from any harm, to hacking computers, to extracting designated materials. Can you go over some of these mission variations in more detail? Of course, Tony. The underground facilities were the locations we chose for our first implementation of spawn closets, so this is where players will find new missions, as well as some existing missions that have been vastly improved by the addition of spawn closets and non-combatants. One of the new missions sends players to kill a heavily armoured target who only shows himself once his crew has been wiped out. Another involves the player searching a friendly facility for a number of boxes, identified using information provided on their mobiglass. At any point during the mission, small Dude, looting, looting that here. boss is going to be so cool. This one is that players can choose to avoid the fight and gamble on the facility's defenders being able to repel them. And the last one I'd like to mention is, thanks to spawn closets, we now have our first FPS defend mission, where players join friendly AI in defending a facility from multiple waves of enemies. And the nice thing when the AI actually responds. In addition to the basic mission reward, players also receive bonuses for the AI who survive to the end. Some of the benefits from this mission template are coming from smarter use of existing tech, like more modular subsumption logic, and some of it stems from new features like the spawn closets. Luke, how has the design setup of the infiltrator scenario varied from what you've done in the past? Well, spawn closets have had a dramatic effect on the types of missions we can build. Without them, we were unable to spawn AI mid-mission, as we couldn't risk them spawning out of thin air without warning, as that's really unfair on players. Thanks to spawn closets, we can now spawn reinforcement waves and spring ambushes anytime we want, with players able to recognize where AI what is. What a shit shot this player is. <laughs> Not only does this allow us to build brand new mission types, it allows us to spawn manageable amounts of AI and only reinforce when some of those are dead to better balance the difficulty of the encounter. And you mentioned we're building our logic in a modular fashion. <laughs> And the Eliminate Boss mission is a great example of that, because we've essentially taken the Eliminate, 14, and eliminate specific objectives and combined them to create a new experience For 10 enemies? where players must draw their target out of hiding by first killing all of his crew. Luke, another mission template we're currently working on is called Rescue Transport, and it revolves around getting NPCs to a specified location. One of the variations allows the NPC to request personal transport via a service beacon, just like a player, to a designated location. Other variations involve adding assorted complications to getting the NPCs on board your ship, like having to first outsmart or outfight their captors, unlocking their prison door to release them, yeah, safely I don't know. escorting them back to your ship for transport to the desired drop site. Longer term, we're going to add support in this mission template for a lot of other combinations, like having to drag unconscious characters onto your ship and back to a hospital and trying to lead NPCs through a burning ship. Luke, where do we stand with the current implementation of this and what remains to be done before we can push it out the door? Well, Tony, we're at the point where we have a working prototype in which AI can be asked to follow, wait, and take a seat aboard your ship. And even with this rudimentary setup, we've been able to flesh out the mission flow to a very... This dude's taking his sweet time, doesn't he? ...and have made a lot of headway into planning the dialogue requirements. We've got some effort to make sure that the mission is more than a delivery mission where the box has legs, so the client has patience. <laughs> He's floating in the air. With your tip and rating being calculated based on your performance. We'll also be developing AI behaviors to deal with what happens should the player decide to kidnap them. The rescue mission module has been designed in such a way that it can work in conjunction with others like Infiltrator, meaning that we can easily inject some obstacles in your way, like a base full of captors. These missions will drive the development of AI following, so once complete, we'll be able to leverage that throughout the rest of the game. Quantum update. I'm excited for this. I want to hear what they got.
I want to pivot now and give an update on some of the systemic functionality that I detailed last spring. I said that we were soon going to have quantum controlling a few select bits of the universe and that we were going to be very measured in the rollout. We remain on track to activate these changes with 3.16 at the end of the year, and this initial release will allow quantum to dictate three encounter frequencies, the prices of three commodities, and everything related to combat assist service beacons. As the simulation is refined and more of the linkage to the game is completed, we will expand the scope of these early tests and enable quantum to play an ever larger role in shaping the universe. So let's go over how the gameplay experience is set to change. This stuff is so cool to see. Probability volumes dictate how the likelihood of an encounter type varies within that region, and historically that information has always been static. Dynamic events, introduced in early 2021, allow that data to be changed by mission logic, but still don't support systemic modulation. You can see the frequency curve for pirate activity in red on the screen here, and the long and short of it is that no matter how many pirates you, your friends, or this the entire community so kill, cool to watch. the likelihood of encountering a pirate at this spot right here would always be about 5% per minute, and farther out, right about there, the odds would drop to 2%. Now, let's see what happens when we activate Quantum and it starts to provide real-time guidance to the probability volume service that controls this information and distributes it to the game servers. As is often the case with such demonstrations, the simulation is running at an exaggerated rate of speed so that I can easily illustrate some key points. The first thing you'll notice is that the fixed pirate curve just flatlined because Quantum says there aren't currently any pirates in this area. There are some valuable materials on the surface of Selen, though, and that's starting to attract some quantum miners represented in green. The distribution of the miners determines the shape of the green curve, and the quantity determines the amplitude. With the value of the ore available on cell and sky high and no threat in sight, the number of miners continues to increase, and you can see the encounter curve changing to reflect Dude, that. Dude, this stuff is so Pirates cool. are drawn to high concentrations of wealth with minimal security, though, and are starting to swarm into the area, and as they do, you can yep, see the red pirate are. curve adjusting. Quanta security, represented in blue, is drawn to conflict, and is thus often a lagging indicator of criminal activity. So, at this point, there are several distinct things happening. The number of miners in the area is still increasing, but the rate of increase has slowed dramatically as they start to weigh the increased risk of piracy. The number of pirates is still increasing because there's still sufficient value in the area to attract them and not yet sufficient security to dissuade them. The number of security forces continues to rise because the pirate problem is raging out of control and thus security pay in this area has gone through the roof. This trend continues for a while until finally the risk of piracy gets too high and the quantity of miners starts to drop. The pirates are doing their own independent mental calculus and still see sufficient value in the area, even once the miners start to fall off, to continue increasing their numbers, but that simply speeds up the rate of decline in the miners, while at the same time, the threat from security continues to grow. Dude, this is so cool. So, eventually, the number of pirates in the area begins to fall off as well. As the threat of piracy begins to subside, the impact gradually ripples through the economy, lowering the rate of pay and demand for security services. The quantity of security forces streaming into the area eventually peaks too then and begins to decline. If you watch the curves, you'll see a rhythmic action to it all with miners looking for high value ore in safe areas, pirates searching for unprotected wealth and security chasing conflict. Three different but very interdependent calculations. The system is always searching for equilibrium and just as in a real economy sometimes overshoots a bit in one direction or the other which ultimately equates to opportunity for the thinking player. This is crazy, huh? Quantum. It's so freaking cool. MPC Combat Assist Service Beacons have historically been generated via probability volume data and were thus every bit as static as the encounter frequencies that I just covered. The odds of a request for combat assistance at a given location didn't vary based upon what was happening in that area at that time, and no amount of concerted community effort to stamp out what was putting those NPCs in danger had any chance of succeeding. To illustrate what's changed, let's jump back to Quantum. The miners are back in force, but there aren't yet any pirates, and thus there aren't any requests for combat assistance. Just as previously <laughs> occurred, though, miners. the pirates are going to slowly sniff out this opportunity and begin gravitating to this location. As their numbers increase, so will the there odds of conflict with the miner, and thus the likelihood of it's combat assistance so service awesome being issued. See. You can see a few contracts now represented by the green icons. Quantum is dictating how many beacons should be present in this area in the exact details, such as how much Alpha UEC is being offered, but the data is actually maintained by the service beacon service that interfaces to the game servers and exposes these contracts to players. So, every contract that you're seeing pop up, which is a direct result of the amount of conflict happening within Quantum, can be seen and accepted by someone within the actual game. 
Security has started to show up, but isn't yet a major force, and the risk of piracy has gotten so great that some of the miners have decided to exit. The frequency of combat assist beacons is a function of both the quantity of miners and pirates, and clamped by the minimum of either. So, as the miners depart, the number of outstanding beacons drops. Security has now reached the point where it's really starting to deter the pirates, and the reduced number of miners is just adding fuel to the fire. So, now the number of pirates starts to fall off pretty dramatically, which also impacts the total number of active beacons and instantiation frequency. Player actions are fed back into Quantum, such that if a lot of beacons are accepted and the NPC is successfully defended in the game, the security risk as perceived by the pirates in Quantum will increase, thus affecting their sense of whether the risk justifies the reward. This means that not only will the system ebb and flow of its own accord, but your actions within the game will directly impact the simulation and thus the overall state of the universe. Dude, look at all those traders. There's one other important thing that I want to mention here, and that's the value of the additional context that Quantum is providing. We now know exactly who issued the request for combat assistance and even the likelihood that multiple ships might be involved. All of this information can be packaged up and associated with the beacon so that when and if a player accepts the contract, the instantiated mission can be customized to better reflect what Quantum says you should be seeing. This is what you were talking about, Danny. The shop service has always had the ability to modulate the price of commodities based upon things like the amount of inventory on hand and its rate of change, but we haven't really exploited that feature for some of the basics like fuel and HPMC, which is the material required to affect repairs on a ship. One of the reasons for this is that it's one thing to have tradable commodities fluctuate in value according to some algorithmic logic that doesn't consider anything beyond the confines of that particular shop, but it's quite another when those materials are critical to playing the game. Now that we can properly gauge demand based upon factors external to the shop, though, even if the simulation logic still needs a lot of work, we're going to flip the switch and let the prices of fuel and repair materials start to undulate. So let's bring Quantum up again. The Tram and Myers mining outpost on Selen has been selected so that we can see its real-time prices for plasma fuel, quantum fuel, and HPMC. Keep an eye on these prices as the Quanta arrive on scene. A few of the miners are from distant locales and will be looking to top off their quantum fuel tanks, and that increased consumption is causing prices to trickle up just a bit. Plasma fuel is jumping quite a bit more, though, because it's in constant demand due to the fact that the miners routinely have to traverse the surface of the moon looking for valuable deposits of ore to extract. The price of HPMC hasn't budged because there hasn't been any conflict in the area, but that's about to change. The pirates have started to arrive and attack the miners, and that means that there are going to be some damaged ships that require repairs, and the price will continue to rise as the amount of conflict grows. <laughs> pirates require fuel, too, and most of their need Look revolves around the miners. plasma they'll use to engage ships in close proximity, so it's starting to get fairly expensive. Security forces have now started arriving in force, which means even more conflict in the area, which is why the price of HPMC has finally started to take off. Security forces burn a lot of plasma fuel hunting for pirates, and this is proving to be more demand than the local stores of inventory can satisfy. This means temporary shortages and skyrocketing prices until either the demand debates or the economy rebalances to ensure a more regular supply of fuel to this area. It's so awesome to watch this stuff going on. Up until now, all of our dynamic events have been manually triggered by someone loading up Quasar, selecting an event, specifying the input variables, and activating it. This works fine for major events that are intended to run for a long period of time, but it's problematic when the event needs to run multiple times per day or only when specific conditions warrant or needs to be customized based upon the current state of the universe. The solution to this problem is systemic triggers, which are small analytical programs that let us specify what sort of conditions within quantum warrant the creation of a dynamic event and allow that event's inputs to be mapped to all sorts of simulation state. I'm going to bring quantum up one last time and highlight the location of the three drug labs within the Stanton system. Raven's Roost is on Microtech's moon Calliope. Jump Town is on Crusader's moon Yella. And Paradise Cove is on Arc Corp's moon Lyria. For this test, I've removed all commodities except for drugs, and thus any green quanta you see moving around are focused on moving these illicit narcotics. A systemic trigger has been set up that monitors the total drugs purchased at any of the drug labs, which you can see in the graphs below the star map. If the total amount of drugs purchased at one of these locations over a period of time exceeds the specified threshold, it will trigger the Jumptown B2 dynamic event. The location and quantity of drugs sold would be passed to the event as inputs, which the mission logic might use for any manner of things, such as temporarily overriding the shopping data at that site for the duration of the event. 
the shop service that communicates with the game servers is, is linked to quantum. And thus, all player transactions in the game are filtered back into the simulation. And their purchases are therefore just as relevant to the totals as those initiated by quantum. What is pyromania? All of the drug labs are seeing a bit of action. And Paradise Cove looked like it might be the first to breach the threshold. Some red pirates have started moving into that area now, though. Hmm. And the green freighters have started to flee. It looks like they've decided something to focus in 2022, on Raven Cruise, and though, you can tell so by the constant level of elevated probably purchases that they're Pyro. probably going to trip the trigger pretty soon. There, that's it. The conditions for the systemic trigger have been met. You can see that Jumptown V2 has now been added to Quasar's active dynamic events list at the top right, and below that you can see the input parameters that it was sent, which include the Raven's Roost location and a numeric value of 916 for the total purchase drugs variable, which the actual Jumptown V2 logic uses to configure how many free units of drugs the location will produce over the lifetime of the event. The ultimate purpose of systemic triggers, then, is to allow us to easily and programmatically dictate when and exactly how handcrafted custom content will be layered onto the background tapestry driven by quantum systemic logic. As our library of dynamic events grows and the sophistication of the simulation evolves, you'll eventually find that it's difficult to tell where one system ends and another begins, and the whole experience will just feel more engaging and unique than what either technology could deliver by itself. That's it for our show today. I hope that you now have a better sense of some of the things we're aiming to accomplish over the next year, and that you're as excited as we are about the potential of these new features and technologies to really I transform am. the gameplay experience. I really am. Until next time. Squad 42. So that's it. We're done. That's the whole show. Another Citizen Con in the bag. This one's a little different than others, but still our chance to come together safely and celebrate our shared interest and commitment to making Star Citizen I everything. I don't know. We still have like 45 minutes until the closing. So what have we learned this year? I was going to, you thought I was going to do it. But I got to bust those bingo cards, right? If I had to guess what we learned, we learned that I'm just the lucky one that gets to sit here in front of the work of dozens of others putting today together, themselves in front of the work of hundreds more who dedicate their efforts day in and day out to making the biggest and bestest damn space game ever. It's my honor that, and that of the team that here to represent their work every week, every month, and every year. For CitizenCon 2951, I'm Jared Huckabee. Until next year, have fun, be safe, tell those you love that you love them. I love you, John. And now oh, here's yeah. Chris Roberts to take us home. His uh, stepdad passed away well, a couple days ago. I hope ago. all you enjoyed everything you saw today. Saw um, it on Twitter. We're very proud of what we've achieved so far, what we're working on, what we're doing in the, in the future, and it was great to be able to get in depth and, and show and discuss a lot of that today with you guys. And I just wanted to tell each and every one of you how much we appreciate all of you, your support, dedication, there the has hours to be something about in quarter playing 42. the game, giving us feedback, putting up with crashes and server disconnections and all the frustrating things that you can get when it's an alpha as we're striving to make the best game, or well, I think the best universe simulation you possibly can make now is kind of where we're going. From myself and the team at CIG, we're incredibly lucky to be in this position because I think no one else in gaming has the luxury that we do to really sort of dream for the stars and build something of the ambition that Star Citizen is. It's been a longer journey than I imagined at the beginning, but the game we're building is far more complicated, uh, far bigger, uh, you know, far more possibilities um, than I conceived I would ever get to do, uh, but it's because of your guys' support, and you know everyone at CIG feels the same in terms of they get to work on a dream game, they get to do all these things. People don't say, "Oh, you can't do that. We've got to make it for this quarter. It's got to come out." And you know the investors need their profits this year. It's like, no, we want True. the best game True. possible. That's all 
we at CIG care about and that's all you guys care about. And so to be in that position is because of you guys. And He's got no shareholders or anything. So that's myself and everyone at CIG. It's also very, it. very Thank useful. All very much. And I'm really looking forward to doing this in person for you guys next year as opposed to uh, digitally and hopefully um, all things, you know, fingers crossed, we'll get on the other Still side of the uh, pandemic half an hour, so. and uh, we'll be able to do that. So uh, for me and everyone at CIG, thank you so much for watching. Nothing about Squadron 42? Is that really it? <laughs> that was actually it. <laughs> Alright, well, GG. Nothing about Squadron 42. They were done half an hour sooner than expected. But I, I can go to bed half an hour earlier. <laughs> Actually, no, I might. I might try out Foxhole for a little bit. Huh. Well, I guess I'm also going to call it there, unless you, any of you guys have anything to talk about. No, I'm not going to stream it. People are probably already in bed and waiting for me to stop talking so they can sleep. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stream it right now. I'm not home tomorrow either, so maybe somewhere during the week. But we'll see. Unless there is another topic you guys want to talk about, then I guess this is it then. Still very excited about Pyro. Pyro is really damn cool. What they've shown is mind blowing. Look like an entirely, entirely different game, man. The pyro stuff, it's crazy. Crazy, crazy. Now I just need to figure out what I'm going to do with all this content and if I'm going to make videos on every little topic or not. Again, thank you, Denny, for the gift for that. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. But uh, yeah, if anyone is watching that's not subscribed to YouTube, well, you can always catch me there uploading well, twice a week most of the time, about Star Citizen and possibly also different stuff in the future. So you can always find me there. Anyways, I'm out for the night. Catch you all later. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around, chatting. Bye-bye.